Through the Fairy Tree, a clean Scottish romance, Myths of Moreg, Trilogy Book 2, written by Casey Stockton, narrated by Diane Brooks. Chapter 1 Castle Moreg, Southwest Inverness Shire, Scotland, 1743. Marion McEwen had made a comprehensive study of eavesdropping and she considered herself something of a master. It had taken her years to finally tune the skill to step without noise and to find positions from which she could listen to important meetings her father, the chief of the McEwen clan, held in his study. But the art of eavesdropping was not limited to listening to whispered conversations in corridors. No, it reached beyond listening and extended to refraining. It had taken even greater finesse for Marion to artfully pretend she was unaware of things which she'd previously, unbeknownst to the speaker, overheard. Which was why it had taken a modicum of restraint for her to keep her mouth closed and nod softly when her dearest friend Isabel stopped her in the corridor to reveal a bit of information Marion already knew. Isabel's brown eyes widened, her soft voice steady. The Redcoats are here, in the castle. Kieran took their leader, Captain Hunt, into your father's study. She leaned closer, her hands tightening around Marion's in a desperate clutch. I canna think their presence will lead to anything good. Rest assured, Marion said patiently. Father will keep us safe, as he's always done. Isabel's worried gaze flicked behind her. She released a shuddering breath and looked ready to argue that point. You didn't meet the men outside, Mary. They are cunning, and I can't help but feel anxious that they deemed it worth their time to follow us back to Moreg. A cold snake of fear twisted in her stomach. Now this she did not already know. They followed you? Aye, Isabel whispered. We first saw them before we reached Bongari. The ill-advised journey Isabel had taken to seek healing at the Holy Well, healing for a broken heart, had begun over a fortnight before. Surely the Redcoats had not been following her for so long. What has Kieran to say of it? Kieran, Marion's cousin who'd led the party to chase after Isabel and return her to Castle Moreg, was in the study now with father and the English captain. Only that he believes trouble is coming. He didn't ken what they want from us any more than I do. Which meant whatever the Redcoats wanted from Father was likely being discussed in his study now. Marion needed to hear what they were saying. She eyed her friend. Your cheeks are paler than porridge. Have you eaten anything today? Nay, how could I? Isabel gave a soft, warm smile. I've been awake longer than the sun. I had to find Kieran and stop his wretched duel. Did you find success in that endeavour? Nay, but it did not matter. Ian and Miles were the seconds, and they agreed on first blood, not death. Her lips curved in a victorious smile. Kieran won. Marion's shoulders relaxed, and she pulled Isabel in for an embrace. Just that morning, her mother had spoken of aligning Isabel and Kieran in matrimony. Perhaps Isabel's heart could be salvaged. Kieran has agreed to marry me, Isabel said, grinning brightly enough to light the dim stone corridor. Marion could not cover her shock quickly enough, and it caused her friend to laugh softly. Marion lifted one sleek, dark eyebrow. You're telling me that you rode out to Glen Ellen to stop a duel and came home with a betrothal and all you thought to mention was that you brought some redcoats with you. Isabel shrugged, but her smile could not be dampened. Didn't he speak of it until Kieran has discussed it with your father? But I am confident in the union. I spoke to the chief this morning before I rode out to Glen Ellen and he permitted the marriage so long as I could convince Kieran, Which evidently she had. Warmth began in Marion's stomach and surged outward, filling her chest with satisfaction. If father permitted the marriage, nothing would stand in Kieran and Isabel's way. His word was final, though Marion was surprised he agreed to this. 
After the marriage agreement had failed between Isabel and Miles Duncan, the Laird of Dalnain across the loch, Marion believed her father would use Isabel in some other way to establish peace between their feuding clans. The McEwans and the Duncans would not see eye to eye unless some drastic measure was taken. How did you manage to convince my father? Marion asked. I told him that if Kieran married me, I could keep him at Morag. Marion shook her head. Of course father would agree to that. Kieran was his best warrior and was needed to continue to train the men for combat. Brilliant, Isabel. She smoothed back a loose blonde tendril. I rather thought so too. Heavy footsteps dragged down the stone steps and Marion jumped on her chance to pull away. If she waited much longer, she would miss the whole of the conversation taking place in the study right now. I must go, she whispered. I've been avoiding my cousin. No, not Kieran. The other one, Simon. And I fear those heavy boots might be his. Isabel looked to the echoing chamber behind them, which led to the circular stairs and nodded, wrinkling her nose in ill-contained disgust. I will go that way and give ye time to slip away. Marion thanked her and turned on her heel. Isabel had nothing to fear from Simon. Not when the man consistently ignored her. He was pompous, arrogant, and held a glint of darkness in his gaze that sent a shiver down her spine. But he only had eyes for Marion. Or rather, he had eyes for the position of Marion's husband. Foolish man! Father would choose Marion's husband. Whoever she married would be next in line for Clan McEwen chief, and thus it was understandable. But he would never choose Simon. He couldn't. Surely even Father saw how unfit the Kilgannon McEwens were to lead their people. Uncle Brian had nearly brought his estate to ruin, only able to save Kilgannon thanks to Father's help. But their inadequacies went beyond any lack of skill to manage finances. Their tempers were too wild, too red and erratic to be trusted in such a position as chief. She swallowed. As it stood now, she wasn't entirely sure who besides Simon fit the qualifications, and she knew father would not allow her to remain unmarried much longer. Marion turned for the stairs on the other end of the corridor and ran directly into a solid wall of wool and linen. She bounced backward, but Simon's large hand closed around her forearm and steadied her. Drat! The heavy tread she'd heard in the other stairwell must have been someone else. Careful, lass, he said, his low voice sending a volley of unpleasant shivers over her skin. You didn't wish to injure yourself. Had he been standing there this entire time, listening to Marion's conversation with Isabel? It would seem she was not the only McEwen practised in the art of eavesdropping. What could he have overheard? Marion searched her mind for any key points in the conversation she ought to be worried about, all while Simon's beady dark eyes raked over her with naked desire. Forgive my clumsiness, she said, moving to step around him and let herself into the stairwell. Simon did not release her arm. I was hoping to find the chance to speak with ye privately. The very last thing Marion needed was to find herself in a private situation with Simon. At least now she could scream for her father if she found herself in immediate danger, for his study was around the corner. Isabel could not have gotten too far either, chasing the other set of boots up the opposite staircase. She tried to sound nonchalant. Oh! What about? I said privately, lass. We are alone now, Simon. Anything you wish to say can be said now. Marion tugged her arm, but still he would not relinquish it. His fingers dug into her skin, and she ceased attempts to free herself, instead suppressing a whimper. She was sly and stealthy, but her strength did not match his brute force. It never would. I reckon you're unaware how easy it is to overhear just here. Less so than he might think, Marion sucked in a quiet breath, aching to be free of his grasp. I dinna have the time for this now, cousin. My mother is waiting for me. 
She could see how he rolled those words over in his mind. His grip lessened, and she smoothly pulled her arm free, refraining from rubbing the tender place on her forearm that now bore the red marks of his large fingerprints. Another time, then, he said, delivering a blinding smile. His charm and charisma had won him a favoured seat at the head table, but his true nature was not very well hidden. He fooled some, but he would never fool Marion. She dipped a quick curtsy and stepped around him, careful to keep her head raised and her shoulders straight. Mother had rigorously trained Marion in the ways of being a lady, in the responsibility she would one day have as a chief's wife, in what it meant to be a woman of esteem and privilege. Marion knew well the importance of appearance, and she did her best to mimic her mother's effortless grace and poise, though she knew she had a long way to go before she mastered it. The fear that climbed into her belly and curled up like a wet hound before a fire tightened and solidified as she mounted the steps away from her cousin. Marion reached the next floor and stepped into the corridor. She turned and rested her back against the cold wall, allowing her eyes to drift closed as she regulated her breathing. Her shoulders sank with the weight of relief, but she could not remove the slimy residue of Simon's touch pressing into her arm, as though his phantom continued to hold her. One, two, three, four, five. Marion's eyes snapped open, and she shook away the discomfort clinging to her like wisps of stubborn fog. She'd allowed herself five seconds to feel, and now it was time to move forward. She locked away the disgust and dirt, slipping into the cleanliness of the empty corridor. Marion checked over her shoulder to ensure she hadn't been followed before sneaking quietly into the room above Father's study. She closed the door and bolted it, then pulled the string through the hole so no one could unbolt it from the other side of the door. It was a small guest room that hadn't been in use much during the last few years and thankfully hadn't been claimed by either of the visiting Kilgannon McEwans, Simon or his father, Uncle Brian. It took the work of a minute to roll away the corner of the navy rug and slip the loose, narrow plank from the floor. Marion lay beside it and pressed her ear to the slim hole, able to faintly hear the conversation taking place in the study just below her. It was my pleasure, a smooth voice said. That must be Captain Hunt, the English officer. His accent stood out among the Scots. You're welcome to remain for dinner, Father said. Marion could discern through his polite tone how deeply he hoped the redcoat would refuse the offer. If we stay for dinner, we will be forced to remain for the night. I think it is better if we are on our way. We must return to Brelug tonight. You have a long ride ahead of you. Allow my cook to pack you something for the journey. Father continued to speak, this time too soft to distinguish, undoubtedly sending Hugh or Ian to run his message to the kitchens. Marion pressed her ear closer to the floor, flattening her temple against the hard wood and straining to hear better. A lock of raven hair fell over her eyes and she swiped it back over her head. The murmur of movement, chairs scraping against the floor, the shuffle of feet, signified the end of the conversation. Drat! She'd learned nothing. Marion replaced the plank and unrolled the rug, pressing the corner flat with her palms. Her arm caught the light and she grazed her forearm with her fingertips, wincing at the soft red marks, appearing where Simon had dug his fingers into her skin. Determination swept through Marion and she rose. She smoothed her gown over her waist and raised her chin. Marion refused to give Simon anything to allow him to win anything from her. One way or another, she would convince her father that Simon was the wrong man for the position. Her tender arm winked a soft shooting pain and she gritted her teeth. She had no other choice. Chapter 2 Cormac McEwen tightened his hold in the reins and pressed his lips together. Elin jostled on the seat beside him, her fire-red hair escaping its messy knot and tickling his cheek. It was the same red of his own hair, but he knew his sister wore it much better than he. She was a beauty, which the men of Gilmuir had made abundantly clear. They could not have left their home soon enough for Cormac's liking. 
Can you no stay in your side of the bench? He teased, flicking her stray strands of hair away. I can't keep this bloody cart in the road if your hair waves before my face. Elin narrowed her green eyes at him. Perhaps if you drove smoothly, I'd no fall into you so often. Her shoulder bumped his, as though for emphasis. You can't blame my driving. He threw out an arm in mock frustration. It's these uneven roads shaking you about. The corner of Elin's mouth ticked up in a brief flutter and Cormac's chest tightened. He wanted so desperately to make his sister smile, not the flicker of a weak candle flame as she'd just done, but the smile of a roaring fire-filled hearth. A smile that matched her hair in brightness and vivacity, one that implied that she was happy. But Cormac hadn't seen Elin's smile in such a way in more than a year, not since before they lost their mother. Do you ken why the chief summoned ye? Elin asked, not for the first time. I canna help but think I should have stayed behind with Mrs Lundy. You could have sent word when you learned why you were summoned. Tis impossible to ken how long the chief will need me for, and I couldn't bear being parted from my favourite sister if it happens to be a long while. Though his true reasons for forcing her to pack her belongings and accompany him were buried beneath frail excuses, he hoped she was unaware of how deeply he'd been bothered by what he'd seen. Elin scoffed lightly. It'd likely be a rare treat, do you mean? Cormac didn't grace her with a reply, instead keeping his attention on the road. Elin had been dimmed, and he needed to find the fuel to brighten her once more. If Mother's death hadn't been so sudden, perhaps Elin would not have been so affected by it. But as it stood, nothing Cormac could do seemed to make her happy. He scratched his stubbled jaw. Could be he's offering me a position at the castle. He'd be so lucky, Elin delivered a humourless laugh. More than likely he's offering ye a position in his stables. I wouldn't mind that and you well can it. She looked at him quickly and he held his breath, hoping for another flicker of a smile, anything that implied her joy in this sibling banter. Her lips remained flat and Cormac dragged his attention back to the road again. When he'd received the letter from the chief, summoning him to Castle Moreg, it had been vague and commanding. He was to come at once, but the reason was not explained. The timing had been good for more than just a way to remove Elin from Gilmuir, as rent was soon due and Cormac had nothing to pay it with. His crops had failed, his animals didn't thrive, and he'd learned very thoroughly over the previous year just how deeply he was not meant to be a farmer. He'd been taught the appropriate skills, but he didn't enjoy the tasks, nor did he take any pleasure in the occupation. Failure after failure had tempted him to gather his belongings and walk away, but it was a tendency passed on to him by his father, and he'd done his best to honour it. Mother had wanted for him to mirror his father in his position and occupation, just as he did in appearance, to love the land and flourish. But when one spoke to coos or goats, the animals only stared blankly back, and the stalks of barley and stacks of cut peat were no better. Cormac enjoyed people, and his days were far too void of them to bring him much happiness. The lane slipped out of the trees and opened to a large glen on one side that dipped down and fed into a long, narrow loch. Moreg sat on a rise just before the water, its tall grey stone edifice imposing and powerful. Hills built up and away from Moreg, giving it the unique feeling of being comfortably nestled within the embrace of the surrounding majestic mountains. Elin sucked in a breath, and Cormac struggled not to do the same. It was one of the most magnificent sights he'd beheld in all of his six and twenty years. I do think I shall beg for a position in the stables merely so I might remain here forever, he said quietly. Do you think they'll have me? Elin shot him an amused glance. Of course they will. Everyone loves you, you daft loon. Careful, Linny, or I'll believe ye to be teasing me, he said gravely. He looked at her waiting for that peak of a smile, but was unrewarded. Blast! Hopefully Mother was not watching down in them now, or she would be sternly shaking her angelic head at him. Grey clouds overhead shifted and moved behind the castle, casting the scent of impending rain over the glen. The murmur of voices reached Cormac's ears above the clopping of horse hoofs on the packed dirt lane, and the bustle of activity flurried about the castle grounds. 
Men gathered in formation between Moreg and the loch in the midst of combat training, while women moved about in pursuit of their tasks, carting buckets or resting baskets on their hips. Cormac's veins hummed with anticipation, the veritable energy about the place a stark contrast to the quiet croft he'd previously inhabited. Everything he owned sat nestled in the ancient trunks, strapped to the wagon behind him, and he was glad. Clean air filled his lungs, carrying the freeing potential of a fresh beginning. It pulled back his shoulders and straightened his back, and he sat prepared to accept whatever challenges that might lay ahead of him. Cormac would be satisfied if he never left Moreg and its bustling ambience again. If the chief's business was brief, then Cormac would need to make arrangements for their future, for they could not return to the little croft now, not after what had occurred before they had left. Didn't he hate me for saying so? Elin muttered. But I canna be gone from this place soon enough for my taste. Her words sliced into him like a cool blade, sucking the anticipation from his lungs. His once social sister had changed so completely she was nearly unrecognisable. If Mother descended from heaven right now, she would believe Elin to be a selkie masquerading as his sister, undoubtedly. She was simply not the Elin he'd been raised with. Cormac pulled the horse to a stop before the stables and shifted to better face her. We needn't remain long if it is that much of a disturbance to your happiness. Happiness? Elin rolled the word over her tongue, like she was tasting it, her freckled nose scrunching in thought, her green eyes, those which had also belonged to his mother, met his. And what of your happiness, Cormac? I needn't anything more than to ken you're safe and well. Elin scoffed lightly but turned away again. She gathered her skirts in her hand and hopped down onto the water-laden ground, her feet audibly squelching with each step. Their conversation evidently was at an end, and Cormac's future could very well be before them. Ian McEwen hunkered low behind the rotted log where he watched the wagon pass and continue down the road toward Moreg. A woman sat beside a man in the driver's perch, their hair both the flaming copper of a blood-red sunset. Ian had failed to obtain a good look at either of them, but he assumed they were arriving for the games. The travelling trunks jostling in the back of the wagon spoke of a long visit, and McEwen had mentioned sending away for another contender. Though who could possibly beat Simon? The man was purely brute strength and unrelenting morals. Ian was not a paragon of virtue, but he did have his limits. He was uncertain if Simon understood what limits even were. The wagon containing the newcomers rolled to a stop before the stables, and Ian turned toward the woods, losing himself immediately in the tall beech trees blocking some of the crisp coolness in the air. Rain was coming, if the new tang he smelled was any sign. The fairy tree was becoming something of a daily trek for Ian of late, before leaving to track down Isabel on her way to Bongari Spring and return her to Moreg, and he would be happy if the letters could be left a little closer to the castle. But it held such a prime location, he could not fault Blue Bonnet for using it. If only Ian knew Blue Bonnet's identity, he could have a chat with the man and discuss options that sat closer to the castle. But he understood McEwen's need for secrecy. One wrong move and they would all be sent to the gallows. Traitors. The word rumbled through his brain. Was it traitorous to wish for a betterment of one's country? To want to be ruled by a man whose blood ran with thistles and heather, moors and lochs? The Hanoverian usurper who currently sat on the British throne was not but an imitation of a British king. The man wasn't even bloody British. Ian shook his thoughts, pressing them down before they could rise and heat his blood. He had a task and he needed to see it done before he was missed from training. The large ash tree, known as the fairy tree, sat nestled in a dark area of the wood. Light streamed down, indicating the clouds had finally broken above, though the scent of impending rain continued to linger. Ian looked over his shoulder to ensure he was alone. When he felt satisfied by the stillness in the air, he approached the tree and reached into the crevice behind the burnt bark. Rough paper met his fingers and he pulled it out. Mmm, not what he'd been expecting. A few folded sheets of paper had been crammed into the area and he peeled back the first damp sheet to see a list of names, the ink splotchy and running in some places. 
D marked quite a few of the names, but no further explanation. What could the D mean? Ian folded the papers and slid them beneath the belted waist of his great kilt, covering them completely with the portion of fabric that swooped up over his shoulder. He would deliver these papers, make a notation of the drop in the ledger, then ask McEwen for answers. He'd been at this long enough, acting as McEwen's lackey and putting the cause before himself, but it was time he was allotted a little more trust. No one cared more about the cause than Ian. No one. If McEwen could not trust Ian with more information and bring him further into his confidence to avoid the constant guesswork he forced upon him, then Ian would have no choice but to find a way to make himself more useful. It was either that or leave, and Ian was a McEwen. He couldn't leave his men, his clan, his people. He would need to become indispensable. Chapter 3 Marion had spent more time lying on the cold floor listening to father's conversations that week than she'd spent in the stables, and it was beginning to wear. Her horse, Chinna, deserved better, certainly, but Marion would not be able to rest until she had answers. Father had been unaccountably secretive of late, watching her closely through meals and when he passed her in the corridor, and she knew he was planning something. But what?! She'd discovered a small leather ledger a few weeks ago that her father had tried to hide, and when she'd approached her mother about it, Mama had paled and strictly forbade Marion to investigate it further. It was clear her mother did not want her to embroil herself in whatever father was up to, which only made Marion need to know more. The ledger had a series of sums with odd notations that didn't make reasonable sense. Fairy tree... Well, blue bonnet. Though Marion wondered if the latter had meant to say blue bonnet. The other two notations she recalled were places near the castle, but the third was an item, a hat. Marion visited the well often, but she hadn't been to the fairy tree for at least a year. The last time she visited it, nothing had seemed out of order. It still had the same charred trunk she recalled, and new growth sprouting from the long branches. What could the well, the fairy tree and a blue bonnet have in common? She shook her head to dispel the distracted line of thinking. Father was up to something, and it had to do with Marion. She could sense it deep within her, which was only proved further by the extended presence of Uncle Brian and Simon at Morag. Last night she heard Father speaking to Ian about inviting another man to Morag to compete, and it drew an icy chill down her spine. Compete for what, exactly? Marion stepped into the kitchen and searched for Mrs Crabbe in the frenzy of activity. Maid stood at the counter, mixing pastry dough and cutting cooked meat into small portions, while young boys darted about with dogs at their heels, pilfering small pieces of dough. Mrs Crabbe flitted about the room, issuing orders. Remove those mongrels from my kitchen! she snapped. The boys each took a bannock before running outside through the far door, Mrs Crabbe angling a straw broom at them from behind. When she turned, she caught Marion's gaze. What do you need, lass? Nathan, Marion said hesitantly, stepping closer. Is there a special reason you're making such a great quantity of food? It takes a great amount of food to feed this entire castle. Mrs Crabbe said, leaning the broom against the wall. She took an open place at the work table and began chopping cabbage. Even more when your father hosts a feast. We're to have another feast? Marion questioned. Something about this felt excessive, and she wasn't sure she liked the way things were adding up. A competition and a feast? Is this for the Kilgannon McEwens as well? I don't ken what you're celebrating, lass. You need to ask your father. Of course. Father was particular with the information he chose to share, and even more so with whom he shared it. Mrs Crabbe would know nothing that wasn't common knowledge. The door opened from the outside wall and Ian stepped inside. His dark eyes darted about the room, a friendly smile warming his handsome countenance. The man was too good-looking and he knew it. He'd never caught Marion's eye, though. He was too much of a flirt to be taken seriously. When his gaze settled in Marion, he missed his footing and his eyes darted away. 
The motions were nearly imperceptible, so slight that they would have gone unnoticed had she not been paying close attention to him. Can I get ye something to eat? Mrs Crabb asked. Marion shook her head, delivering a warm smile to the woman while Ian crossed the room and left the kitchen through the staircase behind her. I am no hungry, but thank ye, Mrs Crabb. The older cook gave Marion an odd smile. She was lightly wondering if Marion was beginning to go mad, wondering why the woman would go down to the kitchen if not to eat something or sneak outside. But Marion had not expected to see Ian looking as though he was on an errand. Any time, lass, Mrs Crabb said. You're always welcome in my kitchen. Marion could only assume Ian's purposeful stride meant he was walking to Father's study just now and she wanted to know exactly what they were going to discuss. She took the stairs behind Ian at a sedate pace, allowing him to stay far enough ahead that he might not realise that she was following him. Father took precautions to avoid eavesdropping by stationing a man outside his study door. It was a good thing he didn't bother to check his ceiling for loose boards as well. Marion passed the floor where Father's study was located and continued to climb, her pace quickening, her practice footsteps silent. Her bedchamber was down the corridor from the empty eavesdropping room, which had made it possible for her to continue to use it undetected. What cause had anyone to be curious about her behaviour? They were all likely thinking she spent a great deal of time in her chamber. She reached the empty room and slipped inside, closing the door behind her. She dropped the latch in place and rushed toward the rug. After missing the entirety of the conversation with the Redcoats a few days before, Marion was eager to be in the proper position on the floor quickly and not miss anything else. Ian would have already been in the study with Father for at least a few minutes by now. Marion peeled back the rug and loosened the narrow floorboard before she lay over it and strained to hear. Her eyes were trained on the bedchamber door. Had she pulled the string through after latching it? In her haste, she was certain she hadn't, but she could not bear to miss anything more. Surely no one would enter this room. No one had done so, to the best of her knowledge, in months. Muffled voices came through the crack and stole her attention. Father was speaking. I've been expecting this. There was a brief pause followed by the sounds of movement. Chair legs scraping across the rug beneath Father's desk, perhaps. What is it exactly? Ian asked. The D's beside the names. What do they mean? Is it no obvious, lad? Father scoffed, anger entering his tone. Deceased. Who is deceased? Why? What in heaven's name were they speaking of? There are too many of them. Father said, sounding mildly panicked. Far too many. I dinna ken how we can return from this. We dinna have much time. Why does it matter so highly? Can we no raise more men to our cause? We can replace these men who died. Aye, we can. But these numbers set us back something fierce. Father swore. I dinna ken how we will recover. The door to Marion's chamber swung open and a man stood in the open space framed by the doorway. His startled eyes widened on her. Blast! Ock! Marion said. Too late did she realise that her head was still close to her eavesdropping hole and her father could have heard her. She did not wish to bring his attention to this feature in his ceiling. Are ye hurt, lass? The man asked, stepping into the room. He set a trunk on the floor with a thud. She took his momentary distraction to sit up and shove the plank in place, rolling the carpet over the hole. Nay, I'm perfectly well. I only fell when I was straightening the rug. The man's auburn eyebrows rose on his forehead. Marion stood and smoothed out her gown. Why had she failed to pull the string through to the interior of the room? Drat her impatience. Why were you straightening the rug? Did she detect scepticism in his tone? Her umbrage rose. How dare he find her excuse less than believable? She shoved aside the thought that her excuse was, in fact, delivered with a lack of confidence. How frustrating, for she was usually adept at thinking on her feet. Who are you? She asked, presenting the most regal picture she could after the ridiculous display he'd walked in on. Perhaps he would not question her further if she distracted him well enough. 
Cormac McEwen, he said, bowing. Why did that name sound familiar? She had heard it recently, but she could not remember in what capacity. Perhaps in an overheard conversation. But between whom? Marion lifted her chin. What are you doing here? This is my bedchamber, lass. I think it would be more appropriate to ask what ye are doing in my room. The other man her father invited to compete, whatever the competition was. This had to be him. That's where she heard the name. You're visiting? Aye. Why? He opened his mouth and closed it again, and the action drew her attention. He was rather a handsome man, possessed of bright copper-red hair and a tall, well-formed physique from what she could see beneath the layers of tartan wrapped over his shoulder and around his waist. His shoulders were wide, his stance comfortable. He reminded her of Kieran, though this man did not stand like a soldier. His eyes narrowed. Ye ask a lot of questions. Who are you? I live here. Marion said primly. This is my home. I have the privilege of asking the questions. Ah, Cormac nodded, resting his hands behind his back. He started to circle her, his steps slow and measured, and Marion mirrored him, forming an arc around the room and maintaining an equal measure of distance between herself and the stranger. You're Miss McEwen, then? Tis a lucky guess. He tapped his temple, "'Tis a clever guess. You live here, and you're dressed too fine to be anything but a close member of the chief's family. "'Who are you, then? A niece? A daughter?' Cormac must have noticed her eyes flinch when he guessed correctly. He stopped moving when he reached the carpet corner she'd been laying over when he'd opened the door, and Marion now stood near his travelling trunk. His lips ticked into a delicious smile. "'Daughter, then?' Did not realise I was standing amidst royalty. Marion's lips flattened into a line. The man was clearly a flirt and not to be taken seriously. She immediately sectioned him into the quadrant with Ian that was titled Handsome and a Tease in her mind. A pity, that. He really was excessively handsome. Didn't he let me keep you from settling in? Marion said. How long do you intend to stay at Morag? I didn't can. That'll be up to your father, I reckon. And now she would no longer be able to listen in on conversations in the study, at least not while this man stayed in this room. Perhaps she could find a way to have him move to a different chamber. She searched for an idea, anything which might convince him to leave the room willingly. Welcome to Morag, Mr McEwen, he winced. Call me Cormac. I haven't grown used to the formality yet. My father will always be Mr McEwen. Marion nodded but had no intention of honouring those wishes. Surely he understood the oddity of such a request. Cormac towed the edge of the rug with his boot. Had he seen the hole her ear had lain over? A wrinkle on the rug sat just over the loose plank and she worried that she hadn't quite wedged the narrow plank back in place as she'd thought. What if he found he could hear into the study and told her father? Panic seized her. She needed to distract him, to remove him from the room immediately. She cleared her throat. I suppose you haven't been informed of the... She looked away, pretending to hesitate, hoping to entice him to want to know more. Cormac's eyes were fastened on her, his expression a mask of stone. Drat the man. Was he not going to press her for information? She pretended not to be waiting for it. Well, you didn't wish to be frightened... I suppose. It is better if you dinna ken. How thoughtful of ye, Miss McEwen. Indeed. I dinna wish for ye to turn and run away. You've only just arrived. She gave him her widest, brightest smile, her hands still resting behind her back. Marion rocked a little on her heels and waited. He nibbled at the bait. No much frightens me, lass. Marion pretended to look relieved. Lovely. This is the perfect chamber for you, then. A light flicked across Cormac's dark eyes, something akin to interest. Marion shrugged slightly. Of course, if you hear anything, unnatural, after dark, dinna be frightened. She's never actually harmed a soul. Lines of surprise formed in his forehead, or perhaps there were lines of confusion. She? Aye, 
Marion widened her eyes. She glanced at the four-poster bed in the corner, the thick blue bed hangings gathered on the ends so it was open and aired out. She pointed to them. You may want to pull those closed before you sleep, though. Because of the... Finally! Was the man made of pure control or merely uninterested? The spirit! She's roamed these corridors longer than I've been alive. Did they not tell you this room has long been abandoned? I cannot recall the last time a brave soul slept in this bed. Marion's shoulders shook as a chill ran up her neck. She was beginning to frighten herself with her own fabricated story. Cormac's boots stopped toying with the curled edge of the carpet and he took a step toward her. She ran her finger along the carved wood of the footboard as he approached, doing her best to look appropriately concerned. What am I to do if I see the spirit? Nathan, Marion said, eyes wide. You stand perfectly still and wait for her to leave you be. She'll no cause you harm, I can promise you that. Stand perfectly still, he repeated. His eyes were a dark green and they bore into her. Or you can sing to her if you wish to please her. She was once married to a piper, and the sounds of a lilting ballad are sure to please her mightily. I assume I have a pleasant voice, lass. Perhaps my singing will not please anyone. The low timbre of his tone caused her to grow still. She did assume he had a lovely singing voice, but only because his speaking tone was rich and soothing. It formed a shiver that ran down her arms, prickling her skin, or perhaps that was merely due to the conversation taking place with a strange man alone in a bedchamber. Cormac's fingers traced the wooden footboard, but his gaze was locked on Marion. Marion swallowed hard. She needed to leave the room before they were found if she did not want to cause rumours to spread about her and Moreg's new guest. I'm certain your voice would soothe the spirit. How can you be certain when you've yet to hear me sing? Because the only thing that angers a spirit is to be spoken of. Marion dropped her voice to a whisper. A bad singing voice wouldn't hurt her, but if she hears herself being mentioned, that is na good. So dinner repeat what I've said to anyone. Cormac mimicked her whisper. And yet, you've been speaking of her these last few minutes. She is na here now. How are you so certain? Och, believe me, if she was here, we would ken it. A feminine voice drifted from the doorway, startling Marion. Are you speaking of me? Marion jolted, and Cormac did as well, a fact that was altogether satisfying. She had to have scared the man just a little for him to startle as she had. Cormac dragged his gaze away from Marion and sent a pleasant smile to the woman in the doorway. Her thick red hair was drawn away from her face, but curly locks had managed to escape and framed her lightly freckled forehead. Her softly sloped nose and pale eyes were nothing like Cormac's, but in every other way she looked similar to the man. She must be a relation of some sort. Och, Elan, of course not, he said. His familiarity with her was only further proof. Marion breathed a silent sigh of relief. She had been afraid he would reveal her ridiculous plot to frighten him from his room. I'll leave you now. Cormac turned wide eyes on her, his expression adopting a look so innocent. Marion was certain he had trouble up his sleeve. She braced herself for what he was about to say. But Miss McEwen, he drawled, do you no wish to warn my sister? Chapter 4 Cormac was dangerously close to revealing his hand to this raven-haired minx. Marion was clearly up to something, and watching her try to manipulate him into leaving the chamber was exceedingly entertaining. If he wasn't careful, she would soon know how deeply she'd sparked his interest. Elin shot him a confused expression from the doorway. What do you need to warn me of? Marion turned, casting a wide-eyed look at him, and he had to fight not to grin. He chose to have pity on her and not reveal her ghost. This room is the coldest in the castle. Miss McEwen was only warning me, so I might be prepared when I sleep. Aye, if your brother intends to rest at all, he needs to be certain to close the bed hangings completely. Elin glanced between them, clearly not accepting the story completely. She looked to Marion. Elin McEwen, 
she said, dipping into a curtsy. Cormac was glad to see she hadn't lost her manners as he had done. Elin, this is Miss Marion McEwen, daughter of our chief. Of course, Elin said, recognition dawning in her eyes. I've heard of he. Marion's dark, sleek eyebrow rose. She straightened her back slightly. Good things, I do hope. My friend came to Moreg with her father last summer and spent a few days with he. Her name is Anna Lundy. You might remember her. Oh, of course. Anna was a delight. Elin shot Marion a faint smile and silence descended on the room. Marion looked at Cormac over her shoulder and he was not entirely certain, but he believed her expression to be full of gratitude. Though, if she was appreciative of his careful discretion, that would only be admitting she didn't want him to share the ghost story with his sister. Why would she want him to keep that secret unless she had falsified the story? When he'd opened the door and caught her eye, her porcelain skin had paled considerably. Until Cormac could decipher why Marion wanted to frighten him and what exactly she had been doing lying in the middle of the floor when he'd come upon her, he would keep her secrets. A man appeared in the corridor, the same one that had directed them to the maid who showed them to their rooms. Cormac was glad he'd gone to put his trunk in his chamber alone, or he was certain he would never have received the ghostly tale from Marion. McEwen would like to see you, the man said. Thank you, Hugh, Marion said. Does father wish to see both of our guests? Nay. Hugh flicked his head toward Cormac. Only he... Marion's smile didn't falter. She turned it on Elin. I plan to go down to the stables. Would you like to accompany me? I haven't seen my horse in days, and I need to remind her how much I care before her loyalties shift to another. Elin nodded. I would love to. The women quietly left the room, and Cormac sent a glance to the corner of the rug Marion had been lying on. He would examine it later. Now he needed to meet his chief. Hugh said nothing as they made their way down the stairs to the level below their bedchambers. He stopped midway down the corridor and knocked at a door. Enter! A gruff voice spoke and Hugh immediately obeyed, opening the door and stepping aside to allow Cormac through first. Welcome to Moreg, Alexander McEwen said, rising from his seat behind a monstrous desk. He was tall, his imposing stature intimidating to Cormac, though they were of similar builds. This man held a lot of power, and it was clear in the steel blue of his eyes that he knew it well. Some men wore greatness like a cloak, and others like a skin, intrinsically and wholly part of them. Alexander McEwen was of the latter, born to the role he held and comfortable in it. Thank ye for having me, Cormac said, dipping a bow. McEwen gestured for him to be seated, and Cormac took the carved wooden chair in front of the desk. Hugh stepped from the room and closed the door behind him, but Cormac had a feeling the man did not go very far. He was likely standing sentinel on the other side of the heavy oak door right now. The chief of a feuding clan needed protection. He needed people surrounding him that he could trust. I'll admit the invitation took me by surprise. Cormac did not need to say that he hadn't realised McEwen knew of his existence. McEwen leaned back in his chair. He rubbed a hand over his grey beard, his eyes so hard they could lightly see directly through Cormac. I did not realise you would look so similar to your father. You remember my father? Father had gone to Moreg occasionally during Cormac's life for various gatherings, but never for long and always alone. Mother had remained home with Cormac and Elin when they were small. The trek was too long to take little ones along, unless they absolutely must, and as Cormac grew older, he was needed at home to tend the animals. McEwen barked a dry laugh. Did he never mention it? Aye, I suppose not. He rubbed his chin further, looking to the ceiling as though it held the very picture of father upon it. When McEwen directed his gaze back at Cormac, it was calculating. I kenned your father well, lad. He was very important to me for many years. Surprise slid down Cormac's chest and nestled in his stomach. Father had never mentioned a personal relationship with the chief. He'd never spoken a word of familiarity about the man at all. 
If Cormac had not known this, what else had his father been keeping from him? He fought alongside me at Glensheel, the chief continued, watching Cormac closely, but that is now why I summoned you. McEwen rose, his hands resting casually behind his back. The man who marries my daughter will be the next McEwen chief. That is how the law is written. I have long had my eye on a man who is fit for the role, but recent incidents have led me to question my choice. Your daughter, she is aware of the arrangement? Cormac could not help but think of Marion's teasing ghost story. She was a clever lass and inordinately beautiful. She did not seem the sort to meekly stand aside and allow another to dictate her life. Aye. McEwen said no more on the matter of Marion, though Cormac had to bite his tongue and his desire to ask further questions. He was interested in the woman and he wanted to know more of this arrangement. I have broadened my consideration to three candidates, McEwen continued. Ye are one of them. Cormac froze. A candidate for chief? For Marion's husband? He hoped his face was not too revealing of his complete and utter shock. But ye didn't he ken me. I ken your father, lad. If you're anything like him, you're deserving of this. He held Cormac's gaze a moment longer before clearing his throat. But ye need to prove yourself. We are preparing for a series of games and ye will compete against the other two men. McEwen wished to choose a chief based on the merits of who could throw the straightest caber. It felt unreal. Because it was. There must be more to the situation than merely the games. The man who exhibits the greatest strength will become chief, he asked. Aye, but I have the final choice in the matter. You'll see that there is far more at play here than the weight throw and the foot race. I should hope so. Cormac said, grinning. You dinna want a quick-footed chief if he is dim. McEwen looked as though he meant to speak, but he turned toward the window and looked out at the group gathered on the grass below them. A Duncan house sits on the hill across the loch. Cormac rose and came to stand beside his chief, looking out over the water at the house, just visible on the opposite bank. It looked tall, built of stone and imposing to the naked eye. Is it a friendly household? As friendly as one can expect during a feud, the laird has expressed his desire to end the discontent between our clans, and we need to find peace with the Duncans if we wish to pass peaceably through their lands. McEwen turned his attention on Cormac. We need to find that peace soon. It is imperative. Cormac waited, but further information wasn't forthcoming. Imperative for whom? Why? Did ye have trouble with the Duncans and Gilmuir? McEwen asked. Nay, no much. We weren't close enough to the border for that, I believe. Likely no. McEwen rubbed a hand over his bearded jaw and watched the men wrestle in the grass. We had the Redcoats visiting recently, and I didn't need to say how unpleasant that was. If ye hear of anything, ye'll be sure to tell me. Of course, Cormac said at once. He didn't question his chief because he didn't need to. Redcoats brought nothing but trouble. My daughter Marion is a beauty. McEwen clapped him on the back. She takes after her mother in that regard. You'll no be disappointed, lad. Cormac was well aware of how beautiful the chief's daughter was and still had difficulty accepting that she had the potential to become his wife. When he'd set out for Moreg, he'd hoped the visit would lead to an extended stay at the castle and time to regroup and determine how best to move forward in his life. He had not imagined he would be fighting for the chief's daughter's hand in marriage. Did he have a chance at winning? Who am I to compete against? He'll meet them tonight. McEwen's attention was gone, shifted to his men on the lawn below. A breeze slipped in through the open panes and ran shivers over Cormac's neck. Then I must go check on my sister. McEwen gave him a nod of dismissal, and Cormac slipped out of the room. He bent his head toward Hugh and then continued down the stairs toward the stables. It did not take him long to find the women in a stall at the far end, brushing a chestnut mare with a long flaxen mane. Cormac crossed to it and folded his arms over the wooden gate, 
Elin glanced up and caught his eye, then looked back to the horse. She ran a slender hand along its chestnut flank and listened to Marion, whose back was to him. It is generally safe in and around the castle walls, but dinna leave the area, and you will na have trouble with the Duncans. The Laird of Dalnane lives in the house on the other side of Loch Gileach, and he is now looking for a fight, but our relations are tenuous at present, so it is best to be cautious. Marion continued to brush Shenna's coat. If you dinna ride alone, though, you dinna need to worry about any of my warnings. Ride? Elin? Cormac's hopes rose to the stable rafters until his sister raised her gaze to meet his. Why was she allowing Marion to tell her riding safety protocol if she couldn't even get on a horse? She sent Cormac a wide stare and he bit his tongue. My brother is one to appreciate such a beautiful horse, Elin said. Wouldna you say she is the loveliest you've ever seen? Marion's hands stilled and she glanced over her shoulder, her wide eyes locking on Cormac's. He swallowed against a suddenly dry throat. Lovely did not even begin to describe the creature looking at him right now. Her raven hair was immaculately swept back, with one curled lock trailing over her shoulder. Her skin was creamy, her nose narrow, and her pale blue eyes the colour of an icicle hanging from a thatched roof. Cormac! Elin pressed, a smirk bending her lips. His ears were hot and he straightened. Indeed, the horse is simply magnificent. What lines she has! I should like to watch her run. It is far better to feel her run, I assure you. I believe you, Cormac said. He looked beyond her to Elin. Are ye considering riding? No today. Maybe tomorrow then, he pressed. Elin shot him a warning look and he did not further press the issue. Watching their mother die beneath the hoofs of such a beast would put anyone off riding and Cormac did not blame her for being hesitant. He believed she could find her happiness sooner were she to try to ride again, though. Perhaps he could use Marion's help in that regard. Did my father complete his business with you? Aye, Cormac said, crossing his arms over the gate once again. Elin took another brush from the wall to rub down Shinna's coat, and Marion shifted to better see him. This was the woman he would soon be competing for. It was impossible not to notice how lovely she was, a true prize for any fortunate man who won her hand. You've come to compete then? she asked. Cormac watched Marion. How much did she know? She appeared well versed in exactly why Cormac was at Morag. Perhaps she knew more than he did. But the calculating manner in which she watched him made him feel like she was testing him somehow. Would he seem like a fool if he was too eager? Or would she accept it as the compliment it was? Aye, I've come to compete. Elin's eyebrow lifted and Cormac shook his head. He would explain it to her later. He had a feeling she wasn't going to approve. She was not easy to please of late. Marion turned her attention to Elin. Welcome to Moreg. I look forward to ken you better. Elin gave a soft smile and Cormac had to fight the urge to cheer. And I as well. Cormac had never before put much thought into marriage. He hadn't eyed a particular woman for the role, and neither had he felt inclined to shackle himself to another at so young an age, at six and twenty. But when Marion had thus far managed to put a smile on Elin's face and somehow enticed her to brush a horse, she easily accomplished two things Cormac had been working toward for months. Cormac was gone for her. He would worship and serve any woman who brought the light back into his sister's eyes. Presently, that distinction appeared as though it could soon belong to Marion. Chapter 5 The cavernous dining hall was heavy with chatter, for every person who lived at Morag had come to dine. Dozens of people lined the tables, all but the two newcomers as meaningful and familial to Marion as her own parents. The spirit in the room was pregnant with anticipation and Marion had difficulty focusing on the conversation occurring at the head table around her. Mother sat to her left and father just beyond her speaking to Uncle Brian. 
father always took the middle seat at the table, regardless of how many people were in attendance, and he liked to be perfectly balanced. With Marion and her mother on one side of him now, that left Uncle Brian and Simon on the other side, and an empty chair sat at each end. The untouched place settings were complete with clean plates, waiting to be filled, and Marion's stomach twisted in nervous anticipation. The last time Father had a secret to share at dinner, he had tried to publicly coerce the Laird of Dulnane into a wedding agreement with Isabel. The evening had ended in a refusal to the marriage scheme and a brawl between the Duncans and some of the McEwen men. It had been an attempt at peace and healing the rift between the feuding clans and it had been an utter disaster. Marion allowed Mother to place mutton on her plate, but she wouldn't be able to eat a bite of her dinner until Father had revealed the purpose for this feast and for inviting Simon and Uncle Brian to sit at their table tonight. She would have assumed Father meant to make a public marriage announcement between herself and Simon, but for the empty chairs at the table. Those empty chairs gave her an inkling of hope. Something else must have been planned. A marriage announcement would only require one empty chair, or so she hoped. She leaned closer to her mother. Do you ken the purpose for this feast? Mother took a sip of her wine and nodded softly. She was the picture of poise. Her dark hair, sleek and impeccably styled, trailed one long barrel curl over her pale shoulder. Marion was a younger representation of her mother, and lesser in every regard. She was not as regal, as sophisticated, as beautiful. She could never measure up, but neither did she intend to. She had her own strength, certainly. She was a far better strategist, though no one would ever learn as much, for how could they? Marion analysed things she had no business knowing. Marion felt the scrape of father's chair legs rumble against the rug at their feet. He stood tall and waited for the din in the room to silence. Servants walked the corridor that sat open on the floor above them and paused, coming to stand at the balustrade and listen. Announcements made at dinner were not to be missed. It is no secret that we've welcomed guests these last few days. Father's booming voice rang out, echoing from the tall ceiling. He indicated his brother and nephew to his left, and cheers of welcome rang out in the room. Marion politely clapped, the same as mother, but she would not feign joy where she felt none. As ye all can, my daughter is of an age to marry. Father's hand swept toward Marion, and with the flick of his wrist, he commanded her to rise alongside him. Cold chills swept through her body, but she pushed back her chair and stood, avoiding her mother's eye. What had mother known of this? Why had she not placed a warning in Marion's ear? For this purpose, I invited three men to compete in a series of games. The victor will win honour, esteem and a place at this table forever. He leaned forward and banged a fist on the sturdy tabletop for emphasis, and Marion's mutton jumped on her plate. The room erupted with cheers while Marion's stomach sank to the cold floor. Father intended to choose her husband based on a pageant of strength and speed. He could not be in earnest. Her gaze sought the brother and sister with bright copper hair and she found them toward the back end. Cormac's eyes were fastened on her, his expression unreadable. Had he been watching to determine her reaction to the announcement? She knew he was here to compete, but she'd had no idea she was meant to be the prize. Oh, that was far more conceited than necessary. She was not the prize. The role of next chief of Clan McEwen was the prize. There was no sense in fooling herself. Father waited until the noise in the room quieted and the attention returned to him before speaking again. The first contender is my nephew, Simon McEwen. Marion's stomach turned as the room erupted once again, heightening the nausea roiling within her. Simon stood from his position on the other end of the table. Uncle Brian supported his son, yelling as though he was running into battle, and Simon matched him in exuberance. Marion fought to conceal her irritation. Surely the entire room did not support Simon so fully in this endeavour. They must be excited for the games themselves. Father waited for silence and the group supplied it. 
The next contender is a stranger to most of ye, though his father isna. Join me in welcoming Cormac McEwen, the son of my brave friend and soldier, Alistair McEwen. Cheers and applause filled the room once more. The castle's inhabitants were excited, and the feeling echoed off the walls as they shouted approval for a stranger. Father crossed behind Mother's chair and pulled out the empty seat beside Marion. Cormac did not take long to understand the meaning of this gesture. He leaned over and whispered something to his sister and she nodded to him. He didn't seem to believe her though, for he remained watching her a moment longer. Surely she would survive sitting alone for the duration of one meal. It was impossible to deny how sweet Cormac was for caring so deeply about his sister. The only person who cared for Marion in that way was Isabel. By the time Cormac made it up to his new seat at the head table, the noise had died down. Father clapped Cormac on the back. Standing beside her, he seemed taller than he had before. His arm brushed hers and the hair on her forearm stood on end. Cormac appeared unaffected, his hands clasped loosely before him and legs planted in a warrior's stance. What had he done before coming to Moreg? Did he know before he arrived that he would possibly become her husband? Marion knew nothing about this man who had travelled to compete for her hand in marriage. Father cleared his throat, highlighting the final empty seat at the table. No one else had travelled to Moreg recently, and there were no other men present who Marion believed her father would deem worthy of competing for the role of chief. Her gaze swept over the inhabitants of the room and snagged on a cluster of men near the front, where young Rupert, Rory, Hugh and Fergus sat. Kieran leaned over and spoke into Isabel's ear, and Marion wished she could be down there beside them, watching the spectacle instead of participating in it. The final man I've chosen to compete is known and respected by all in this room. Marion's heart raced with anticipation, and her quick intake of breath was nearly silent, but Cormac must have heard it. He bumped her shoulder softly with his own and leaned over just the slightest bit. Do you ken who it is? No, I've nae idea, she whispered. Cormac made a clicking sound in his mouth, and she looked to him. Dinna judge me. I dinna have a say in any of this. He nodded, but his green eyes did not leave her face. Marion did her best emulation of her mother's cold dignity and looked out over the room. Regardless of who her father announced, she refused to flinch, to show any response. Whoever the man was, he could not be nearly as bad as Simon. Our final contender is Ian McEwen. Ian? Marion located him seated beside Kieran, and the shock in his face was proof that this was just as much a surprise to Ian as it was to her. He had always been obedient to her father, but she had not known him to be a particular favourite. Ian was far too flippant and playful for the role, was he not? He rose, a cocky smile immediately sweeping over his face, and swaggered up to the head table. He stood beside Simon at the final empty place. Eat heartily tonight, father said loudly, for tomorrow we begin. Cheers roared throughout the room, and Marion had never felt such isolation in her own home. Cormac moved to stand behind her chair, his hands resting on the tall, carved ladder back, and she sat, allowing him to push in her chair before lowering himself beside her. Marion absently passed him platters and helped to fill his plate before turning her attention to eating what was before her. Is this strange for ye? Cormac asked quietly, leaning close. Marion kept her attention on her plate. Nay, nee, she lied. It was strange. She would soon be engaged to one of the men seated at this table, and she did not wish to marry any of them, but she wanted to appear strong. It is strange for me, he said with a scoff. I didn't think I would arrive at Morag and pledge myself to a stranger. So he hadn't known before he arrived. Is there another woman you would prefer to pledge yourself to? Nay. He spoke so quickly, his denial so swift, that Marion glanced up and held his green eyes. You didn't have a lass waiting for ye at home. He was so handsome it was difficult to believe. Cormac took a bite of his mutton and chewed. Nay, I've never had a lass before now. You didn't have one now either. 
He smiled and she had to fight not to match it with one of her own. Nay, no yet. But now I have a lass in mind. I have a lass to fight for. Marion leaned back in her seat. She brought her wine glass to her lips and took a sip, and Cormac's eyes followed the motion as he stared at her mouth. Do you wish to win my approval with your flattery? He continued to watch her lips. Nay, I don't need your approval, lass. I need your father's. Marion hitched an eyebrow, but Cormac wasn't finished. He mirrored her, taking a gulp of his wine before setting the goblet back on the table. But I would like to have it, if you're offering. I don't wish to wed a woman who has her eyes set on another man. My eye is set in nae man. Cormac grinned. Truly? Right now, I think your eye is on me. She looked away, unable to stop the chuckle that rolled from her chest. She shook her head. You're a flirt, then? No, usually nae. He leaned closer and lowered his voice to a whisper. But you bring it out in me. Marion's chest glowed, so she focused on sipping her wine. She could not find herself too attached to this man, or fate would command her father to choose someone else. Of the three men sitting at the table now, she would be lying if she tried to deny that Cormac was the most appealing prospect. But attraction aside, of the three contenders, she believed Ian was the most logical choice. He had never laid a hand on her, and while she could not be guaranteed of his fidelity, she knew what to expect in a marriage with him. She would be safe, she would be taken care of. If not loved, she would at least be respected for the position she would hold. What more could Marion expect? She looked down the table and found Ian's easy smile resting on her, and she returned it. Yes, he was the man she would root for. He was neither a brute nor a stranger. He was the safest choice. Her fingers grazed the soft red marks left by Simon on her forearm. They would undoubtedly become bruises. No matter what happened in the upcoming games, she could not allow him to become the victor. She wasn't sure how she would manage it, but she would come up with something. Discovering the purpose of her father's mysterious leather ledger would have to wait. For now... Marion needed to focus on not becoming engaged to Simon. What happened? Cormac asked softly, his voice cutting through her thoughts. His gaze fell to the marks on her arm. Marion looked down and slipped her arm beneath the table to hide the marks, but the action was too late if Cormac was asking about it. Tis Nathan. That didna look like Nathan to me. Cormac's eyes turned hard and he searched her face. The scrutiny was unbearable, and Marion attempted flippancy. Your sister did not appear pleased with the announcement. He was quiet for a moment, and Marion wondered if he would press the issue further. Her mother sat just on her other side, and this was not a conversation she wished to be overheard. She didn't want to worry her mother unnecessarily. Blessedly, Cormac moved on. Your father shared his plans for the contest when I met him in his study earlier. I told my sister of the situation, and she'll support me as long as I choose to be here. But she does not approve. Why do you think that? Marion pushed her cabbage over on her plate with the tines of her fork. You say she'll support you. No, that she's happy about it. Can you blame her? She does not want me to get hurt. She looked over his strong physique. You'll nae be hurt, she said easily. His green eyes sparkled in the candlelight. Why do I have the feeling your confidence is knowing me? Because that isna how I meant it. You have nothing to lose, Cormac. You win, you're a chief. You lose, someone else is the chief. This situation is quite a low risk for you. But what of my heart? Marion raised her eyebrow and looked down her nose at him. Your heart is now engaged in the competition. Not yet, perhaps. Marion's fork skidded over her cabbage and flung a bit off her plate. She hurried to clean it up and sat back in her seat, straightening her spine. Dinner toy with me, Cormac. This isn't a game to me. Forgive me, he said quietly. I didn't mean to make light of your situation. Despite her determination not to care about this man, she found her opinion of him softening. Oh dear, that wouldn't do at all. 
she needed to harden the wall around her heart before he could damage it. Chapter 6 Cormac's footsteps sank into the water-laden ground as he rounded the stables. He rolled his shoulders hoping to loosen his muscles. It had been a few days since the announcement had been made during dinner for the games. Despite a thorough evaluation of his bedchamber, he could not determine why Marion had lain on the floor when he first discovered her there, or what she'd hidden beneath the carpet. Neither could he seem to find her alone again in order to ask her. He was not typically a flirtatious man, but something about the way Marion spoke to him made him into a tease, and he enjoyed bantering with her excessively. The overcast sky and misty air chilled Cormac's skin, and he looked out over the loch and the har that curled and bled up the banks. The dreary woods spread forward beneath a white sky, void of any stray sunlight seeping through the clouds that might add colour. Today's hunt was bound to be difficult, cold and likely wet. He hadn't been in the stable since the day after his arrival, when he had come to visit his ageing horse. The steed had served him well by carrying Elin and him to Morag, but it was not long for this world. Motion near the stable's door caught his eye as he rounded the bend. A navy blue gown flicked out of the open door at the back of the building, the wide skirt swaying along with Marion's quick steps after she let herself from the stables and snuck along the back wall. She glanced over her shoulder and Cormac ducked back before he could be seen. Cormac had come this way because he wanted to step through the woods and see if there was an easy game trail to follow for the hunt, but he'd found nothing. The only reason Marion would choose to leave the building from this side was if she was avoiding being seen. Cormac's heart raced despite his efforts to calm his breathing, and he waited a moment longer before looking around the side of the stone building again. It was empty. Marion had either fled or snuck back into the stables but her absence at least led him to believe she hadn't seen him. Cormac walked the rest of the path to the back door and paused. A navy blue ribbon the colour of Marion's skirts lay in the mud at his feet. He bent down and retrieved the length of ribbon, swiping it between his thumb and forefinger to remove the mud as best he could. The silk draped incongruously over his calloused hands, and he slid it beneath the plaid at his shoulder and tied it into a knot just below his father's brooch, the ribbon ends dangling just over his heart. For good luck. He wasn't fooling himself into thinking Marion would want him to win this competition, but he did enjoy the way she smiled at him, and he suspected he would make a better chief than he had a farmer. Cormac's father had taught him to be a man of honour, and he would not be honouring himself or his father's memory, if he did not give his best effort in this competition. Elin's warning ran through his mind, but he shook his head at the thought. She had not believed it wise for Cormac to embroil himself in the affairs of Morag, for its politics would catch up to him one way or another. He'd lied to Marion when he had said his sister supported him. She didn't want him to win. She did not even wish to be here, but he hadn't wanted for Marion to look badly upon Elin. Her fiery eyes were seared in his mind, full of concern. You'll have to choose a side eventually, Cormac. At some point, you'll always have to choose a side. Are ye prepared for that? No, he was not prepared for the political component of ruling the clan. But at this point, it wasn't yet a necessity. He would take this competition one day at a time. Cormac slid the door open and let himself into the stables. Kieran stood near a white horse at the far end of the block and nodded in greeting. Which steed does mine? Cormac asked. Kieran smiled. He looked at the row of stalls and pointed toward a black horse just three stalls down from where he stood. That one, if you think you can handle him. Cormac wasn't sure of anything any more. He'd been riding since he could walk, but he'd had mostly docile or ageing horses at his disposal. He'd never before been forced to handle a powerful steed like the tall, black stallion Kieran had indicated. He'd like to think he was capable. Kieran watched him closely, interested, it seemed, in his answer, and it gave him pause. 
Was this part of the test? Perhaps McEwen had asked Kieran to test the men on their willingness to ride more difficult horses, to gauge how far he was willing to push himself for this. Well, Cormac was willing to do nearly anything. What had he to lose? Nothing. Marion had said so herself, but he had everything to gain. He lifted a shoulder in feigned nonchalance and sent a confident smile. I will try. Kieran chuckled. I like ye, Cormac. He pointed to the black horse. That is thunder. The warmth of approval filled his chest and Cormac crossed to Thunder's stall. The horse stomped his powerful feet, uncertain of the new man hoping to ride him. Don't he say you're shifting your loyalties? Ian called from the door. Kieran laughed and let himself out of the white horse's stall and into the next one. It is better than having to take orders from the likes of ye. Ian lifted a saddle from the wall and brought it to Kieran, then proceeded to help him prepare a brown horse just a few stalls down. You nervous? Kieran asked. Nay, nee, Ian said, but I'll know when. I don't ken why I'm in the games at all. A strange sentiment. Did Ian truly believe he had no chance of winning? It could not be from any sense of inferiority to Cormac. Was he so assured of Simon's abilities? McEwen always has a reason, Kieran said. Aye, but what is his reason for choosing me? Kieran bent down to tighten a buckle on the saddle. Because you're qualified, dinna doubt yourself, you fool. You're more qualified than I, Ian countered. If you didna promise yourself to Isabel, you'd have been the third man called into the games. I'm certain of it. Cormac unlatched Thunder's stall gate and led him out. He seemed skittish, and he wondered if that was typical behaviour for the horse. Kieran shrugged. I canna marry Marion. She's more akin to my sister than a wife. Sister? The lass looks naething like you. That be true. She's a lucky woman, he grinned. And of course, I love Isabel. He paused and rubbed a hand over his beard. McEwen wants a man with McEwen blood. I never would have been included, no really. Ian shook his head and clasped Cormac on the shoulder, stealing his attention from the monstrous horse. Good luck, man. May the best of us win, eh? Kieran led Ian's horse from the stall and stopped it alongside Thunder. He lowered his voice. As long as it isna Simon, I dunna care who wins between the two of ye. Ian laughed humorlessly. I'd wager Marion agrees with you there. Have you seen the way she avoids him? He rolled his shoulder, gripping it lightly with his other hand. Kieran's brow furrowed, his eyes clouding. It's too soon, Ian. Didn't a McEwen consider this? You need to rest your arm, Ian scoffed. It's been over a week and it's healing right and properly. I can shoot with my other arm. You were shot already. Kieran didn't look convinced, but he handed Ian the reins, the lines further creasing on his forehead. Ian had been shot. How? A shadow fell over the doorway and Simon stepped inside, effectively silencing Cormac's question with his presence. Simon was tall, his shoulders straight, head tilted up as though he already held control of the McEwen clan in his beastly fist. So long as fisticuffs were not part of the games, Cormac believed he would make it to the end of the competition alive. He wasn't much shorter than Simon, but the man was a beast, and Cormac knew men of his ilk didn't always fight fairly. Simon brushed past them, knocking Kieran with his shoulder. Still hurting from our wee match last week, stable boy. Kieran's lips pressed together and he shot Ian a look of long suffering. Simon paused when he reached the stalls and looked back. His eyes fastened on thunder, then shifted to Cormac. You have my horse. Kieran took the reins of a deep chestnut he'd been saddling and pulled him free of the stall. You have this boy today. You will not be disappointed. He shares blood with Shina. Silence settled upon them. Cormac would have happily traded steeds with Simon, except for the childish portion of him that didn't want Simon to get what he wanted. Simon's irritated gaze swept over to the chestnut mare in the end of the stables. The horse Marion had brushed with Elin the day of Cormac's arrival. This seemed to satisfy Simon, and Cormac turned away to lead Thunder outside before anything more could be said on the matter. 
People gathered along the short grass field between the stables and the loch, and Cormac searched the growing crowd until he set eyes upon Elin. Marion stood beside her, engaging her in conversation, and when she looked up at him, Cormac nodded once to her in greeting. Marion gave him a fleeting smile before returning her attention to Elin, and warmth filled his belly. His sister might not believe she could find happiness at Morag. Indeed, she did not believe she could find happiness anywhere. But Cormac hoped the change in scenery would be good for her. Evidently, the people would be good for her too. If he could make their trip last and remain a participant in the games, perhaps he'd have time to change her mind. Simon and Ian mounted their horses, and Cormac gripped the reins tightly in his hand. He planted his feet firmly on the sodden ground and moved to mount when the chief stepped forward and quiet fell over the people. Cormac stood his ground and waited to hear what the man had to say. Some would argue that the clan chief's greatest honour is providing for his people. I am not one of those men. Laughter rolled through the crowd. Ironically, those gathered lived at Morag and did rely on their chief to provide for them in some capacity. McEwen continued, The man who returns with the most fouls will be victorious today. Best of luck to y'all. A flick of McEwen's wrist signalled the beginning of the competition, and Simon and Ian both took off, their guns bouncing against their backs as they rode forward into the woods. Cormac was a good shot, but he was unfamiliar with the land and the birds' habits in this region. He didn't have a chance today of coming out victorious, but he would give it his all. He glanced back to Elin and sent her a confident smile, though she could not seem to manage to return anything apart from concern. Cormac's gaze slid to Marion when he swung into the saddle, and the fear in her icy blue eye shocked him, forcing him to land hard in the saddle. Thunder neighed unhappily from the jolt and bolted forward, forcing Cormac to cling to the reins and scramble to slide his boots into the stirrups. Cormac's heart jumped as he passed through the crowd and he slipped into the trees too fast to look back and make certain he hadn't trampled anyone. What was wrong with this horse? A scream followed him into the trees and he couldn't discern whether it began while he was at the castle or after he left the grounds. Branches whipped into his face and nothing he tried to do managed to calm the horse. He was typically a decent rider, but staying on top of thunder much longer would prove impossible for a rider of any skill. Cormac did his best to stay low in the saddle and pulled hard on the reins. Thunder slammed to a stop and Cormac briefly recognised that the horse was no longer moving before he flew forward and landed squarely in a bush. Branches scratched at his arms and his back felt stiff and uncomfortable. Darkness closed around the edges of his vision until it completely disappeared. Chapter 7 Oh, drat! Marion stood brushing the dirt from her navy blue skirt amidst the murmuring. She wanted to shout that Thunder was not too much horse for Cormac, as some were conjecturing. He was simply too much horse for anyone in this particular situation. Her heart stopped briefly as panic filled her. She had specifically told Kieran to give thunder to Simon. What was the horse doing with Cormac? My brother! Elin turned for the woods and ran, heedless of those behind her and what they might think. Marion lifted her skirt to avoid muddying it further and ran after Elin into the canopy of trees in the direction the mad horse had gone. Elin paused and looked over her shoulder, her face devoid of colour. Marion stepped ahead of her and followed the trampled grass and bent foliage. Thunder had made such a fuss running away that he would lead them directly to Cormac, merely through his path of destruction. For there was no way Cormac managed to stay atop the horse for long in his state. Kieran rode up behind them on a horse. Nay luck. No yet, Marion said. She pointed away from the trampled foliage. You can look that way and we will continue on. Thunder could be anywhere. Kieran held her gaze and nodded, and Marion sucked in a relieved breath. She couldn't risk anyone learning of her tampering with Thunder's saddle. What if word of her action reached her father? I didn't think Cormac could handle Thunder. 
Kieran said. The horse is far too peevish. I thought Simon was better suited to ride him. Marion gritted her teeth together. Then we are in agreement. I didna think anyone except Simon should have ridden thunder today. Kieran shook his head softly. So it was a misunderstanding after all. Kieran must think her daft. I thought you said. Just keep looking, Kieran. He could have been thrown. Elin looked towards her swiftly, her green eyes widening in fear. Kieran left in the other direction, and Marion reached forward and took Elin's hand. Dinna fash, love. We will find him. He canna have gone far. Elin's hand was limp and unresponsive, and Marion squeezed it once before dropping it. She moved forward in the direction of the trampled grass. They continued toward the fairy tree, deeper into the wood and away from Moreg and Glen Ellen. Marion's heart tripped as she consumed the familiar path she hadn't travelled in ages. Father didn't deem it safe for her to be out this far away from the castle, so she kept her walks to the surrounding fields and Glen Ellen when she could manage it. And Marion missed her tree. Hoof prints marred the muddy path and Marion picked up her speed a neigh filtered through the trees to the right of them and both women halted. Should we no follow that sound? Elin asked, but the proof of the horse's movements led straight ahead. Marion swallowed that argument and nodded. It was best if she found the horse alone so she could remove the thistles before anyone had an opportunity to find them. Ye go on and I'll continue this way. Marion whispered a prayer as Elin ran the other direction. She gripped her woolen skirt and ran through the trees until she found Cormac laying oddly on the ground before her. Thunder nowhere in sight. Cormac! She breathed, dropping to her knees, heedless of the mud. He stirred, his dark auburn eyelashes fluttering against pale cheeks. She raked her gaze over him, but couldn't see any obvious injuries. A blue ribbon, the colour of the one in her hair, was tied just below his shoulder brooch. Marion reached up to the base of her coiffure and found that the ribbon she'd tied there earlier was missing. Had Cormac found it and tied it about his plaid? He stirred and she shook the thought. Are you hurt? she asked. Nay, lass, I'm invincible, he mumbled. His eyes blinked open and settled on her. But I canna stand because the world is spinning the wrong direction. You're hurt? He scoffed. Nay, I'm bra. It would take more than being thrown from the saddle to finish me off. He sat up and looked around, his eyes darting madly. Where is my sister? Searching for you. Marion gripped his shoulder and gently pushed him back down. He could hurt himself if he was injured and rose too quickly. I found you first. We need to find her he said frantically. We need to tell her that I'm well, that I'm alive. She will learn it soon enough. Ye must wait a moment. It canna wait, he repeated. Why is it so urgent? Cormac closed his eyes and swallowed. My mother died from being thrown by a horse, and Elin has not been able to ride one since. She's no doubt in a panic now. Marion remembered the ghostly pallor of Elin's face, and guilt washed through her anew. Drat the thistles beneath Thunder's saddle, and drat the misunderstanding which put Cormac on the wrong horse. She was right worried for you. Marion took Cormac by the hand and helped him rise. He faltered, his steps unsteady, and his arms went around her to balance himself. He was much taller than her, and much wider as well and the weight of him nearly brought them both to the ground. But Marion was no wilting flower, and she tightened her arms around his waist. It felt much like being held, and she would be lying if she tried to pretend she was not enjoying the feeling very much. I promise I was not trying to be closer to ye, he inhaled, his nose near the top of her head, though I'm an honest man, so I must admit this is quite lovely. You smell divine. Marion had never been so glad that she'd thought to add rose scent to her bathwater the evening before. She suppressed her amusement. Thank ye, Cormac. You can see sniffing me now. Had he hit his head when he landed? Indeed, he agreed. 
no more sniffing. I must find my sister. Marion pulled her arms from his waist and waited to be certain he would not topple to the ground before stepping back. He seemed to know her purpose and his eyes glittered in amusement. I promise I'm not so bad as that. It took a moment for the blackness to recede from my vision is all. His eyebrows bunched together. I suppose I'm not as skilled at riding as I believed. Marion knew a moment's temptation to admit that she was at fault for his fall, that he could lightly have ridden thunder fine if she hadn't tampered with his saddle. But as much as she felt that she knew this man, he was still a stranger and had yet to prove himself worthy of her trust. She needed to be certain he would not report her to her father before she trusted him. And she hoped Ian would win the games, so it wasn't as though she wanted Cormac to succeed. They walked in the direction Elin had gone when they heard Thunder's neigh. Cormac stopped and pointed toward the horse's sound. That way. They continued the direction Cormac had indicated for a few minutes and came upon Thunder grazing on dry grass. Marion stepped forward to soothe the horse and took him by the reins dangling at his side. Cormac watched Thunder with suspicion. I'm not sure I should get back on him, but I need to give my best effort. Elin crashed through the trees and threw her arms around Cormac. Easy, lass, he said, soothing his sister in much the same way Marion had soothed the horse. I am well. Elin scoffed but released her brother and stepped back, resting her hands on her hips. You're not riding that beast again, Cormac. Are ye mad? It threw ye. He tilted his head toward Marion. I need to give it my best effort. I've yet to even see a foul, Linny. It is not worth your life, though, ye ken. Elin looked to Marion. I hope I did not give offence, but I didn't regret my words. I'm no offended, Marion promised. I never pretended to believe myself the prize in this scheme. Elin raised a copper eyebrow. Are you not? Nay, the role of chief is a prize here. Marion smiled to soften the bluntness of her words. I am merely part of the deal. Cormac stared at her hard, his bright green eyes unyielding. He seemed to have regained his equilibrium. You cannot truly believe that, lass. Marion levelled him with a look. You did not agree to compete in the games because the prospect of marrying me was enticing, did you? You agreed to this because the prospect of ruling Clan McEwen was enticing. Cormac held her gaze, and she could see that he was too much of a gentleman to agree with her, so he said nothing at all. His hand snaked around his sister's back and rubbed between her shoulder blades. Come, we should return to Morag. Marion took Thunder's reins and tugged him along, following behind Cormac and Elin. He snorted his disapproval, throwing his head, and Elin stopped ahead of her. She looked distrustful. This isn't a typical behaviour, is it? Something is wrong with that horse. Something was wrong with Thunder. The thistles beneath his saddle were bothering him, but Marion couldn't remove them until she was alone, or she risked being discovered. She yanked again to pull Thunder back on the path. He's always been hot-headed. He and Simon are well suited in that regard. Cormac studied Marion, so she smoothed her hand down Thunder's neck and cleared her throat before he could ask her to explain herself further. Thunder is likely unhappy. We can return him to the stables and find you another mount so you can hunt. Kieran will ken what to do with him. Elin looked like she wanted to argue but conceded. She reached forward as if she meant to smooth her hand down Thunder's neck as well and soothe him. But her hand paused before making contact and she pulled it back. Cormac gently nudged her forward on the path again and his cloudy expression looked from Thunder to Marion. His concern was a handsome quality and Marion found herself appreciating the way he looked out for his sister as he trekked back toward the castle. What would it feel like to have someone care so deeply for her well-being? If Cormac won the games, would he grow to care for her with a similar regard? She shook the thought. She'd already decided that Ian was the best choice. She could trust that his character would remain consistent, that she would be safe with him, 
she'd known Ian long enough to know exactly what to expect from him. They reached the edge of the wood and the path widened onto the grassy hill that led up to Morag's stone edifice. The final dregs of fog licked the ground and a sheer mist hovered over their heads, as though the fog wanted to recede, but there was not enough sun yet to burn it completely away. Marion pulled thunder toward the stables and Cormac fell into step beside her. He gave her a pointed look. Remember that I would be out there trying my best right now if you'd have let me. Marion fought the smile, curving her lips. I take full responsibility for ensuring your safety, Cormac. Though the words were playful, Marion felt the farce. Cormac had not stayed off his horse for Marion's benefit, but because Elin asked it of him. He had lightly only spoken those words to Marion now for Elin's benefit as well. Surely he didn't want his sister to feel the sting of the choice he had made on her behalf and how far it set him behind the other two competitors. Though the truth was that it was Marion's fault and Marion's thistles that had truly set the man behind, thistles that were meant for Simon. Two things were abundantly clear. Cormac was a good brother and a good man. Cormac left his sister on a bench seat in the light of the open stable door and crossed the mucky straw hewn ground toward where Marion was trying to entice Thunder into his stall. Allow me to help, he said softly. Tis nae bother, Marion said swiftly. You can take my horse, Shenna. She's the chestnut. I can find which is yours. He watched her. She seemed eager for him to be on his way. Can I help you with Thunder first? Nay, her hand came up to stop him and her eyes widened. You must make haste if you want a chance of finding any birds at all. Something wasn't right, but Marion did not appear to want to explain herself. He crossed to Shenna and smoothed a hand down her silken back. She was a fine horse and after watching Marion with her last week, he believed he knew how special Shenna was to her. It was an honour to have been given this mare to ride, and he well knew it. He pulled down a wool blanket and laid it over Shenna's back, smoothing out the edges until it lay flat. Can I take the saddle from Thunder? Marion looked up, her eyes wide. I dunna think it'll fit her. You best get a different one. She was hiding something. She was too skittish to not be hiding something but Cormac was getting further and further behind Simon and Ian, so he did his best to saddle Shenna with efficiency. When he had the horse ready to go, he pulled her toward the doorway. Marion closed Thunder's stall and met him at the stable entrance. You have my ribbon, she said, lifting her hand and rubbing her thumb along the blue ribbon tied to his plaid. Warmth bled up Cormac's neck and tipped the edges of his ears, it's years. I didna ken. I found it on the ground outside before the hunt began. Marion nodded. She rubbed her thumb along it again and looked up at him. I suppose I dropped it. You can keep it. Perhaps it'll bring you good luck. Thank ye, lass. He was glad the spectators had remained near the castle and weren't here to watch him take both Marion's horse and her ribbon. If he was found out, would they believe him to be Marion's favourite? Would they have any sway on the chief's decision? Marion pulled her hand away and cradled it behind her, stepping back from him. He tugged on Shenna's reins, pulling her past his sister who still sat on the bench near the door and mounted in a smooth motion. Shenna was powerful and he could feel her strength as he took off toward the woods again. He glanced over his shoulder and found Marion's gaze. He smiled softly to her until the trees swallowed him up. It was time to shoot some fowls. Chapter 8 Alexander McEwen stood across the room from his wife and absorbed her displeasure like a dry rag thrown over a spilled drink. Candlelight wavered against the dark windows, and the castle was quiet around them, the only noise breaking through the silence, the mewing cat stretching near the fireplace. Yet dinna think our daughter deserves a husband who will care for her as much as he will this clan? She asked. Of course I do. Why do you think I invited the son of Alistair? 
Yet then I ken the man. Not every son is a copy of his father. For all ye ken, Cormac is a tyrant and a brute. And Ian, she scoffed, he is hardly fit for riding. He's only a week off being shot in the arm, Alexander. One week. He should be resting. McEwen knew this well. He didn't think Ian was right for the position either, but he needed a third contender, and he'd already promised Kieran to Isabel. Ian's resolve had been lacking of late. He did everything he was asked, of course, but the fire McEwen had noticed in the beginning was missing. Ian needed to be reminded that he was favoured. He wouldn't win the games while recovering from a wound, but his faith in McEwen would be restored. Simon couldn't have shot so many fowls as he brought in today, she continued. Surely he doesn't think we believe he did so without assistance. Brian shot half of them more than likely. Did ye notice him missing for a good deal of the afternoon? Aye, McEwen had noticed his brother missing. He didn't want to argue about Brian's honesty right now. It doesn't matter who brings in the most fowls, love. McEwen said, I still choose the winner at the end of all this. Catherine's glare held the weight of a pack of hounds, and McEwen crossed the room until he was within arm's reach of his wife. Best to let her come the rest of the way, he'd learned over the years. You care for the people, she said, and I have always admired that about ye, but my priority will always be my daughter, and I fear ye dinna consider her enough. I will consider her when I make my choice, he soothed. But I must think of more than just marrying. It is my duty. Catherine scoffed. Duty? That is what I fear, she whispered. McEwen didn't allow himself to stew in the meaning behind her quiet words. She knew of his Jacobitism. It would be impossible for her not to know with how he'd fought and the company he kept but it seemed as though more Jacobites had perished in the last two decades than joined the cause. And the clan needed a strong leader who would prepare them for the impending arrival of the true king. He needed men who would defend the Bonnie Prince and reinstate his father when it became necessary. It was no secret McEwen supported the Stuarts. The travesty was that he could count on one hand the men living at Morag who would die for the proper king. But it hardly mattered. When the call to fight came, McEwen knew his men would follow him. They were so loyal they would risk their lives for McEwen, if not for the Stuarts. He needed to know they would follow the next chief as well. Until things were better arranged between Blue Bonnet's group and McEwen's men, he could not guarantee the sizeable company of men his French liaison had requested to fight for Prince Charlie. He sighed his gaze tripping along the tapestry lining the wall behind his wife. I've long had my eye on Simon for the role, but I dunna ken if he is the right man to lead any longer. Catherine glanced up. Because he and Brian nearly lost Kilgannon. Aye, that is one reason. I dunna wish to hand Morag to my brother's kin, only to watch him lose it in a game of cards. He ran a hand over his face. Simon is reckless, but he is strong. He would be a good leader with the proper training. Do you no fear that it is too late to train anything into Simon? Aye, he feared that. He was concerned that Simon's hubris would be too grand, that he was too far past the age to be teachable. But that was why McEwen put safeguards in place. Simon was not his only option for Marion's husband. Much was yet to be decided. He was eager to watch the way the men competed, the strategies they used. Much could be discerned about a man's character and his battle mentality by the way he participated in the games. We've time on our side, love, McEwen said. Och, time. Ye started the hourglass when ye began the wretched games. They'll no cross me. I can introduce a fourth contender. I can tell them I will make my decision in a year's time. I can add competitions for the next three years. Who will argue? 
This will continue for as long as I want it to. Devious, she whispered. Nay, love, tis no devious, tis control. Then why did ye start the games if they have nae bearing on your choice? They have bearing, but the men dinna see that I am testing more than their strength. They have much to prove. She didn't look entirely convinced, but McEwen could see he'd placated her. Keeping the peace with his wife was a skill he hadn't realised he would need to perfect over the course of their marriage. But she had proven herself a useful ally and worth consideration. McEwen knew his daughter well, and he was certain she would prove to be just as useful and just as much a thorn to her husband as Catherine was for McEwen. He was equal parts proud of the woman Marion had become and apologetic to the man she would marry. Catherine sighed and stepped forward, sliding her hands around McEwen's waist and resting her head against his shoulder. I wish you could marry for love. McEwen couldn't help but smile at the wistfulness. We didn't marry for love. Aye, look how that turned out, she quipped. He hooked a finger under her chin and gently raised it until she met his eyes. We proved that love can grow, ye tease. Catherine smiled softly, but her eyes told of the concern that still plagued her. She tilted her face up and kissed him, and McEwen savoured the feeling of Catherine's lips. She never ceased to warm his spirit and soothe his troubles. He hoped he did the same for her. He leaned back and looked at her. Isabel is to marry Kieran. Aye, Catherine said, nestling into his side. Do you plan to have them wait until the games are finished? Nay. He'd given up Kieran as a contender for Marion's hand. He wanted the wedding to be soon, so the man did not have a reason to go back on his word and leave Morag. McEwen needed Kieran to continue to train his men. War was imminent. This had never been more important than now. Can you put the wedding together in a fortnight? Catherine looked him in the eye. Perhaps, but you'll want to have the bands read. Aye? Aye, three weeks then. Three weeks, she repeated softly. Or perhaps a month. These things take time, Alexander. He could give her a little more time. That might work to his benefit, for he'd long wanted to invite his French liaison to Morag for a real conversation, not letters that needed hefty deciphering. Take the time you need. Chapter 9 Marion slipped out of the castle and walked past the stables and chickens, pulling her arisade up over her head and tighter at the neck. The thick plaid wrapped over her shoulders, kept out the cold and hid her raven hair from interested eyes. She told her mother she intended to nap because of a sleepless night. Hopefully no one else would feel the need to locate her over the next hour and discover her missing. Since passing the fairy tree last week during her search for Cormac, Marion had felt drawn to return. That and curiosity over why the tree had a place in Father's ledger. Though she'd sworn to focus her efforts on removing Simon from the games, or at least lessening his chances of winning, she might as well try to see if anything was out of the ordinary while she was there. She hadn't been to the tree in years, not since the fire had blackened half of the trunk and ruined the magic. It was soon after that incident when her father had forbidden her from travelling so far from the castle alone. She was breaking that rule now, but she had her knife for protection and knew how to step silently and avoid detection. She was in no great danger. The path leading to the fairy tree was overgrown with green plants and scratchy overreaching branches that snagged in her blade. Marion lowered the hood and ducked beneath gnarled, low-hanging branches. Leaves had begun to change, deep greens bleeding red and orange, painting over the landscape with a brush meant to match a vibrant summer sunset. Though the chill in the air and the mist hanging overhead spoke of the looming shift in weather, at this rate winter would be along before she knew it. The farther Marion walked from Morag, the quieter the path became, 
Green lichen covered the trees, climbing up the trunks and blending with the still green leaves. Marion loved the way the path to the fairy tree had always felt like stepping into a magical world, transitioning away from the castle's open grounds and into a lush, enchanted wood. Eerie silence stretched forward and misgiving bloomed in her stomach. Where were the animals? The birds? Perhaps she ought not to have come alone. If she was set upon and screamed for help now, who would hear her? She always carried a knife on her person, but she'd never before had to use it. Marion swallowed. She could have invited Isabel to walk out with her, but ever since becoming engaged to Kieran, Isabel had become increasingly harder to locate. It was a blessed thing Mother had begun planning the wedding. The sooner they were married, the sooner they would cease sneaking off to be together at odd hours during the day. Not that Marion was jealous, but... Oh, who was she trying to fool? She was inordinately jealous. She hated how unfair it was that she had to uphold duty and honour, that she could not have love. Her father loved her in his own way, but she was little more than currency, ornamental, useless after marriage. The path turned and the fairy tree appeared, mossy and green on one side, charred and blackened on the other, the fairies her grandmother had told her about would hide within the thick, wide branches and blend into the leaves, changing in form with the seasons to better hide themselves away. On days when sunlight peeked through the branches above and filtered its light, she could make out the flutter of wings moving among the branches. But today was too cloudy for such magic, if any yet remained. Marion circled the wide trunk and halted, a suppressed squeal ripping from her throat when she set her eyes on the man standing directly in front of her. He lifted an arm to steady her and recognition pushed forward, abolishing the squeal before it could ring out in the empty forest. Cormac stood before her, his legs planted firmly apart while his hands rested on her shoulders. Warmth bled into her arms and she shook herself free of his hold. She considered reaching for her knife, but she did not feel she was in danger. What are you doing here? she demanded. He lifted one copper eyebrow and stepped back, putting more space between them. I could ask ye the same. She inhaled the musty scent of the woods to clear her head. It is my tree. Och, your tree? Forgive my scepticism, but if it is your tree... Then why have I no seen ye here this past week? I've been visiting it nearly every day since that blasted horse tried to kill me. It wasn't the horse that had tried to hurt him. It was Marion, but she wouldn't correct him. He had not been her intended target. I canna come as often as I wish, but that does not make it any less my tree. Her grandmother had given it to her in a sense when she told Marion how strong the link was between Marion and the fairies how powerful their bond felt. He ignored her claim of ownership. Why'd you stay away? My father does not wish for me to travel far from the castle unattended. She swept her hand toward the tree. Visiting the fairies isn't a something one does with an audience, though. Not that she truly minded coming upon Cormac, but she couldn't easily allow him to believe his presence was more soothing than vexatious though she could not discern exactly why this was. His calming voice had chased away her fears, as loath as she was to admit it. Marion turned and sat on a thick, protruding root at the base of the tree, puffing out a breath. Nothing looked out of the ordinary. Nothing was altered to indicate why Father had named this place in his ledger. Marion had slammed into another wall, unable to decipher the mystery of the leather book. Cormac lowered himself down beside her, his voice thoughtful. Is it really so unsafe? Marion puckered her brow. Not for all, perhaps, but it is for me, she shrugged, though perhaps not as much any longer. The Duncans have not attacked in some time, not since the Laird of Dulnane came to dinner a few weeks ago and tried to broker peace with my father. It did not turn out well, though. I've heard whispers about the fight. Aye, there was a fight, Marion nodded. It started between Kieran and a Duncan man. Before that, there were attacks. They've burned villages and stolen livestock. 
and there was nae way to ken when they would attack or where. His gaze broke through her gentle layer of defence and unsettled her nerves. So it could be unsafe now for ye to walk this far from Morag. Marion met his eyes. Aye, it would be considered unsafe, though currently she did not feel unsafe at all. How had Cormac inspired such confidence in so short an association when men she had known her entire life merely stirred fear within her? Perhaps it had begun with Cormac finding her on the floor of his bedchamber and maintaining a respectful distance, and that he had never once mentioned it again. Cormac leaned in and lowered his voice. Why are you here then, if it is so dangerous? Because I missed my fairies. Have you seen any of them? She gestured above their heads. They like to hide in the branches. According to my grandmother, they didn't much care for big warriors. Amusement played on his lips. Am I considered a big warrior? According to your fairies, I mean. Marion pressed her lips together and looked from his head to his boots. He rivalled Kieran and Ian in stature, but there was a softness about him she hadn't noticed in the others. Perhaps it dwelled in his eyes. She cleared her throat. Och, I dunna ken. You'd have to ask the fairies that. I canna ask them. The only one who spins magic here is ye. Marion sighed wistfully. I wish I could spin magic to go through the door into the fairy world and gain wings, but alas, it isna in the cards for me. I'm destined to remain human forever. Her grandmother had thought the same thing, and that had not ended well. Cormac chuckled. If ever there was a human role to envy, I believe being daughter of the chief is a good one. Spoken like a man who does not ken any better. Does na ken ye lead an enviable life of power and prestige and comfort? She could hear the disbelief in his tone, and she wanted to prove how wrong he was, but it wasn't worth the argument. Ye truly ken not of what ye speak. Annoyance dripped from her tongue, colouring her words. I find your frank opinion of my life vexing. I canna blame ye for that. He paused, his voice growing distant. But if I could give your life to my sister, I would do so without hesitation. Your sister may not wish for my life. If given the choice, Elin would likely wish to marry for love. Cormac shook his head softly. I dinna think she is jealous of ye, Marion. I merely want to give her an easier way. She has dealt with many hardships. Marion swallowed her frustration. She couldn't make him understand her plight, that her life was not her own. She was tempted to explain that she felt like a string puppet, her father holding the strings, but she still had both of her parents, and she knew they cared for her. That was much more than Elin could say for herself. I canna imagine losing a mother. Cormac's mouth tipped into a smile, but it didn't reach his eyes. There is more to her struggles than losing a mother. The men of Gilmuir were... Well, I am glad your father wrote to me when he did. I needed to find a way to remove Elan from the dangers there. One of our neighbours was possessed with the idea of having her for a wife, and I feared for her safety at times. I took great care when we left to conceal our destination. Only one woman kens where we went, and she will keep the secret. If there was something Marion could understand, it was fear for safety. Her heart reached out to Elin. Have you taught her to defend herself? Aye, but I dinna wish for her to be forced to use those lessons. Marion leaned back against the base of the trunk and sighed. Father had made certain Marion could wield a knife, and she never went anywhere without a small dagger hidden on her person. But she hadn't ever been forced to use it, and she didn't care to. Birds sang overhead, hidden within the thick fog that blanketed the tops of the trees. She wasn't ready to return to Moreg, but she knew she'd be missed if she remained out here much longer. Time slipped away from her while talking to Cormac. He was guileless, his conversation comfortable and bluntly honest. 
She turned to face him and found him looking at her, his clear green eyes raking over her face in unabashed interest. Cormac swallowed and looked away. You must be impressed by the number of fowls Simon managed to shoot. I am only impressed with his confidence in himself. No one can possibly believe he shot so many birds in such a wee period of time. She scoffed. He must rein in his exaggerations if he wants my father to continue to trust him. It is no wee thing to claim the man falsified his winnings. That calls his honour into question, to claim he doesn't fight fair. Marion didn't fight fair either, but if Simon was going to fake his success, she needed to bring him down a peg or two. She gave Cormac another smile, hoping he could not see her guilt through her stretched lips. It is the truth. She eyed him and shifted, the root growing uncomfortable beneath her. I would recommend a similar approach to ye, but I dinna wish for ye to mistake that for a declaration that I want ye to win. Who do ye want to win? he asked quietly. Marion looked ahead again, her fingers absently stroking her forearm beneath the arisade, and the blue fingerprint bruises there. She'd believed Ian was the best choice, but now she wondered if the focus was on the wrong man. She spoke the truth. Anyone but Simon. Interesting, Cormac said. Kieran said the same thing. Of course he did. He is like a brother to me, or at least the closest I've ever had. Is that why he does not compete for your hand? He is marrying Isabel soon, who is more like a sister to me than a friend, and I'm glad they found happiness together. Their wedding will be a bright spot in this awful situation. Cormac scoffed playfully. I will try no to be too offended by that. She smiled and bumped her shoulder into his. You canna be offended. You have na kenned me long enough for that. Cormac said nothing. Instead he stood and offered Marion his hand. Let me walk ye back to Moreg. I canna leave you out here alone after learning of the danger it poses to you. His eyes twinkled down at her. I promise to wait in the woods when we reach the castle, so it does not appear to watchful eyes that we snuck away together. I suppose that would be fine. Marion took his strong hand and allowed him to help her rise. She released his sturdy grip, turning toward the tree to give her heart a moment to slow to normal. The black burned wood worked a jagged line down the trunk, pocked and charred from the fire. Marion gently ran her gloved fingers over the charred line and the scent of lemon soap lingered in her memories. Grandmother had shared all manner of mythologies with Marion, kneeling wrapped at her feet, and the fairy tree had the persistent ability to transport her back to those golden years of her youth. She looked again, but still nothing appeared altered from the last time she visited the tree, nothing that would indicate why this tree was listed in her father's leather ledger. What happened? Marion looked up sharply. She could not tell Cormac exactly what she'd been thinking about the ledger. Her fingertips snagged on the burnt bark and she realised that his question was likely about the fire. She forgot that he wouldn't be familiar with the history of the area. My grandmother's connection to the fairies. Some say she was mad. I believe she was burdened. Marion turned her attention back to the bark. This is the fairy tree. It is believed to be a doorway the fairies use from our world to theirs, and my grandmother tried to close off their access to our world. She set fire to the trunk. Did she dislike the fairies? His voice was soft, his curiosity genuine. He did not sound mocking, and she appreciated that. Marion lifted one plaid, shrouded shoulder. Nay. She sucked in a breath, pushing away the image of her bedridden grandmother, pale and listless. Her mind deteriorated soon after that, and she never again left her bedchamber. And the tree survived. Indeed, it lived to tell the warning tale. Cormac's green eyes reminded Marion of the moss-covered tree. And the fairies? Was their doorway damaged? Marion smiled. I have not seen them since. You can decide for yourself if it's damaged or if they're merely hiding from the madwoman. I would hide from our world too, if given the chance. 
Cormac didn't grace her final comment with a response. He stepped onto the path that led toward Castle Morag, moving aside to make room for Marion. She shouldn't come out here alone, but she had a feeling that when she was with Cormac, she was completely safe. Ian crouched low behind the bushes and watched Marion and Cormac walk away from the fairy tree. He felt like a fool watching them, but after coming upon them sitting on the tree roots, he couldn't leave. He needed to be certain they weren't aware of his hiding place in the burned bark. Besides, he hadn't listened for long and he had to agree that Simon faked his fouls during the hunt. Someone must have helped him. But how to prove it? Ian ran a hand over his dark beard. He would not be proving Simon's faults. He only hoped Simon would continue to exaggerate or cheat until even the chief could see through his facade and understand the man's true character. The more Ian saw of Cormac, the more he realised Cormac was likely the best man for the role. Ian had been flattered to hear Marion would prefer him over Simon, but he'd never truly considered himself for chief. He used to believe he might marry Isabel before Kieran had swept in and fell in love with her, but his heart hadn't truly been engaged, so it was not a hard loss. Some men had all the luck, and others were left with the scraps. Ian was one of the men who ended up with scraps that never seemed to last for very long. Not that he was complaining exactly, but a little good fortune wouldn't go amiss. Marion and Cormac's footsteps receded completely and Ian waited in the silence to be certain they were truly gone before rising on stiff legs. He rubbed his sore arm, the wound still healing under his sleeve. He'd been shot fighting the Duncans a few weeks ago and the wound was taking longer to heal than he'd hoped. It would undoubtedly interfere with his ability to perform in the games, but McEwen must have known that would be the case when he had chosen Ian. He crossed to the tree, glancing back over his shoulder to confirm he was alone. McEwen had been using Blue Bonnet for ages to pass letters to his informant in Edinburgh, who passed the information on to France, but the man was too frightened of being discovered to come close enough to Morag to be spotted, so they used the fairy tree. Blue Bonnet was such a ridiculous code name. Ian was certain the need for such a privacy device was unnecessary. Had he not proven time and again that he could be trusted? When would McEwen see he could also be trusted with Blue Bonnet's identity as well? Ian wondered if a man was too afraid of being caught out as a Jacobite to reveal his true name to those within the trusted circle. How would he present himself to Bonnie Prince Charlie when the man landed on Scottish soil? In Ian's opinion, now was a safer time to do so. He hoped McEwen had not put his trust in the wrong courier. He turned McEwen's letter over in his hands and curiosity nipped at him. What would happen if Ian broke the seal and read the missive? He could hide it in the regular place with the corner poking out so it would appear that someone had discovered and read it after Ian placed it in the tree. No one would know it was him. Temptation buzzed through his chest like a swarm of insects but Ian swatted it away and filled his lungs with wet, musty air. The work was too important for Ian to so brazenly risk it. He crossed over the raised roots and checked the burned cavity for funds before he slid the letter into place. It had been ages since money appeared alongside a letter. He would need to reference the ledger hidden in his room, but he was certain it had been at least two months since the last drop contained any sort of money. Perhaps the dried-up funds correlated with McEwen's recent frustration. Ian was certain the list of men marked deceased only constructed part of McEwen's anger. The roster of Jacobites had been signed more than 15 years ago, and now so many were dead. Prince Charles was preparing to land in Scotland. Would he have enough men to protect him, to fight? Ian wondered again if he would be better used recruiting men than acting as his chief's lackey. Ian would do his part, whatever that was. Prince Charles would do his. One way or another, Scotland would once again have her king and restore the Scottish Parliament and all would be well. Chapter 10 Cormac waited at the forest's edge until Marion disappeared around the side of the grey stone castle toward the kitchen door. 
He remained within the curtain of trees, picking his way along the outer edge of the forest until enough time and space had passed that he would not be connected to Marion before he slipped onto the long grass down near the loch. The ground was water-laden around much of the castle, the earth boggy and soft beneath his boots. He paused at the edge of the water and looked out across the loch. The mist had risen from the water, coating the tops of the nearby mountains and clinging to the turrets of Castle Morag. The house across the loch stood tall and square, the top shrouded in low-hanging clouds, and Cormac wondered if anyone within its walls was watching him now. He'd heard whispers that the Laird of Dulnane wanted peace, but the Duncans had another plan. It had been among the first warnings given to Cormac when he'd arrived at Moreg, to watch for any sign of discontent and to be mindful of the enemy across the water. Cormac couldn't understand why there was still strife when both chiefs wanted peace. Perhaps the world of politics was too far out of his reach already. He was too simple-minded to manage it as a chief. A hacking sound stole his attention and Cormac followed the jagged bank along the water's edge until he rounded the corner. Kieran stood at the head of a fallen tree raising his axe and bringing it down on the pole over and over again. What was he doing? Cormac crossed the marshy ground and stopped at the head of the cut log. Kieran worked at a branch midway down the trunk, chopping at its base until he hacked it all the way off. Are we tossing cabers soon? Cormac asked. Kieran stood to his full height, stretching his back. Aye, you've a blade on you. We need to smooth this log. Cormac nodded and slipped the blade from his boot. He moved down to the end of the log and got to work carving out a jagged nub where Kieran must have chopped a branch off. Are we throwing these over a river? Cormac had seen the caber toss a handful of times. And it had also been done once near his home to create a bridge over a creek that had grown too deep to cross. Nay, Kieran said, hacking at another branch further down. McEwen isna that traditional. I think he'd prefer to stay near Morag. Likely over there. He pointed to the flat bit of land that bled into the mouth of Glen Ellen. And not for a few days yet. We can smooth this out and I reckon you'll have time to practice before the event. Do ye ken when he plans to have the toss? Nay, Kieran shrugged. McEwen likes to keep things close to his chest. He does na share freely. Does he not trust easily then? Would ye? Kieran asked with a light scoff. He stopped chopping and moved down to another branch, stretching his arms again. The man was a kenned Jacobite for years. That alone is treason. He told me recently of the battle at Glen Shiel and the Highland troop that came to aid the British troops. He kenned a man from his village and had to watch the man approach him to fight from the opposing side. You never ken who you can trust. Cormac had heard rumours. He knew his own father had fought at Glenshiel, and evidently McEwen had fought at his side. Surely, with the red coat steam clear out in Brillug, he is safe here. Aye, Brillug is a fair distance from here, but nay man is safe. The Duncans are just on the other side of that water, and until we have peace with them, we all must be on our guards. My father was a Jacobite, but he died at the hands of a Duncan, and it had nay to do with the Bonnie Prince. Cormac shook his head. We didna have problems with the Duncans in Gilmure, not this badly. Kieran moved closer and sat in a smoothed area of the log. He swung his axe lightly between his knees and looked up at Morag. You lived inland, aye? Gilmure is far from the border between our lands. Aye. I recently went down to Bongari Spring, do you ken it? Cormac nodded. He'd never been before, but he knew of Bongari and where it was located. He'd heard stories of the healing well and how it had helped some of the people of Gilmure. On our journey, we saw evidence of disputes along the border between McEwen and Duncan territories. I think it'll be a trial to rid ourselves of the strife between our clans where the boundaries meet. But I'm glad it hasna bled further inland than that. I've heard the stories, Cormac explained, but I dinna have any personal experience with the Duncans. Hope it remains that way, he shook his head. 
These old feuds canna be fixed easily. But McEwen and the Laird of Dulnane both want peace. Does McEwen have a plan? Kieran grinned. The plan was to marry Miles Duncan to Isabel. He wanted her to begin the peace over there, but Miles refused to marry her. Now I have that honour. Cormac chuckled. Who is Miles? The Laird of Dulnane. Kieran pointed over his shoulder. That big house over there. Rory and Rupert approached from the castle, and Cormac returned his attention to smoothing the nub from the branch. He didn't want anything sharp in the log to dig into his arms when he tried to throw it. The smoother, the better. You're needed inside for a wedding question, Kieran, Rupert said, his cherubic pink cheeks rounding in a smile. Och, nee, I don't care about anything but the bride. Madam McEwen wants you. Rory said, this must be more important than a conversation about the feast or the flowers. Kieran muttered something unintelligible and swung the axe down into the ground beside the log. He pointed to it and looked at Rupert. Keep working on these branches, aye? Rupert agreed and Kieran stomped up toward Morag's kitchen door. Cormac's attention shifted from the smoothed area he'd completed onto the next rough hacked away branch and he moved down the log to continue smoothing it. Your sister is a quiet one, Rory said. Familiar defensive prickles marched up Cormac's spine, straightening his back. He'd left Gilmure and its overactive suitors behind. He wasn't ready to begin fighting them off again so soon. Aye, he said. Perhaps if he didn't engage further in conversation about Elin, the men would leave it be. Rupert picked up Kieran's discarded axe and swung it against the log, working away at a thinner branch. Does she have a lot then? Nay, she does not want one right now. Or Cormac didn't think she did at least. She used to confide in him about everything, but the death of their mother had changed her in so many ways, even that. She hadn't felt the need to tell him of Gregor's repeated efforts to get her alone and convince her to marry him. Cormac had come upon them and discovered that unsavoury bit of news himself. His blood heated from recalling that evening and how the man had had Elin by the waist, doing his best to hold her still while she struggled to free herself of his amorous clutch. Thankfully, he hadn't gone so far as to even kiss her and Cormac knew how lucky he'd been to come home when he had that evening or things could have grown out of control. Gregor was known to imbibe whisky too freely, and that night had been no different. Perhaps she hasn't found the right man yet, Rupert said, puffing his chest. Cormac would have found it endearing if it didn't annoy him so much. I dunna speak for Elan, but I can save ye some trouble. She'll nae be interested in anyone here. She does not intend to remain at Morag longer than she needs to though privately Cormac was hoping to change that particular opinion of hers. Rupert grinned. Maybe I'll win her over with my charm. She's a right bonny lass, your sister. You're welcome to try, Cormac said, clenching his jaw. He held Rupert's gaze. If you're respectful. Rupert clutched his chest. You wound me, man. Of course I would be respectful to the lass. Rory chuckled, but Cormac believed Rupert to be sincere, and he liked him for it. That didn't mean he wanted his sister to be inundated with interested men again so soon. He believed she was likely enjoying the reprieve as well, though he didn't know for certain. Rupert was young, though large in stature, and Cormac was confident Elin would consider the lad far too young as well. He teetered on the cusp of manhood, but he had not quite tipped into it fully. Dinna get your hopes up, Rupert. We might not remain for long, Cormac said. You dinna ken what'll happen with the games. Cormac was not confident that he would be able to yet remain once they were completed. What reason would he have to do so if he was not the victor? Are you trying to leave Morag? A feminine voice asked behind him. A smile tugged at Cormac's lips. He knew who had addressed him even before he turned around and saw her sparkling light blue eyes. He had spent a good deal of time talking to Marion earlier that day at the fairy tree and he knew her voice now very well. The unexpected sound of it caused his stomach to swoop 
and his heart to quicken at the same time. How did this woman's voice have such a physical effect on his person? He swallowed hard and turned to face Marion more fully. I didn't say that exactly. Her raven eyebrows pulled together, but her eyes were bright with mischief. Isabel stood beside her, her blonde hair tied back and a quiet softness about her. What did you say then? Marion asked. Cormac chuckled and shook his head. Has anyone ever told ye no to listen to other people's conversations? Nay, Cormac, I haven't learned that lesson quite yet. Something about the words rang true, and he couldn't tell if Marion was genuine or facetious, likely a little of both. Marion swept her hand over the log. What are ye doing? Preparing the caber for the toss, Rupert said, swinging the axe against the branch again. I haven't seen this in some time. It was always my favourite of the games as a lass. Though it begs the question, Isabel said in her quiet, steady manner, what a show of strength might possibly do to prove that a man is worth the role of your husband or that of the next McEwen chief. Kieran approached from behind, undoubtedly finished with his conversation with Madame McEwen and slid his hand around Isabel's waist. He lightly pulled her against his chest and bent to kiss the top of her head. A comfortable, sweet smile settled in Isabel's lips and they made such a picture of bliss that envy rose up in Cormac's chest like a rearing horse. He sucked in a deep breath and returned his focus to smoothing out the wood he still straddled. Kieran lifted his gaze to the caber but didn't release Isabel's waist. I would imagine that strength is an important attribute. It isn't a necessity, but it would be a benefit to the man to have the ability to fight whatever he comes up against. McEwen is a strong man, and he will fight beside us if the need arises. He must want a man next in line who will do the same, who values what McEwen values. Cormac's blade continued to smooth the wood, but his mind slipped away into the scene Kieran had explained. If the Redcoats arrived with ill intent or the Duncans attacked or another war began and the McEwen men were called upon to fight, would he be willing to stand at their sides? Would he be willing to stand before them and lead the McEwens into battle? Surely the people would prefer a leader who inspired confidence and safety. Cormac struggled to protect only his sister. How could he pledge to protect an entire clan? Simon was a cheat and a brute, but he was strong and capable. Cormac was no weakling. His farm upbringing had built a physique that could lift and toss this caber as surely as Ian or Simon could. But he was not a beastly, grisly man. No, he paled in comparison. Rory scoffed. If strength will determine the next chief, then we already ken who it is. Aye. Can anyone flip a caber better than Simon? Surely nae one is as strong as he. Cormac looked into Marion's calculating gaze and swiftly flicked his eyes away. He didn't know what he detected there, but her mind was spinning, which she could clearly see. He was equally interested to know what she thought of this conversation and frightened of not liking what he'd hear. Kieran studied him for a moment. I dunna think Simon is unbeatable. He slid his hand from around Isabel's waist and stepped forward to clasp Cormac on the shoulder. Cormac will na make it easy for the man to win. What of Ian? Rupert asked. He looked up to Kieran clearly and valued his opinion. His axe had gone still, his focus solely on soaking in everything Kieran had to say. Kieran smiled easily and squeezed Cormac's shoulder. McEwen has chosen three well-matched men, in ability if not in temperament. Rory's wide grin resembled an eager cat preparing to pounce. This will be fun. Isabel narrowed her gaze thoughtfully at the long log. Could we no have had this prepared weeks ago? The games feel needlessly spread out. Maybe McEwen wants more time between the challenges to better make his decision. Kieran shrugged. I would like to think that means McEwen is considering this thoughtfully. It is a big decision. Our children's future is at stake here. He shared a look with Isabel that was warm and full enough to force Cormac's gaze away. A motion at the top of the hill caught his eye and he glanced up toward the well near the castle. 
Elin walked past the well and slipped behind the ash tree situated at the top of the rise and out of view. Rupert's axe sat unmoving still, his face trained up toward the tree where Elin had disappeared, his eyes dark with longing. Give it here, you useless fool, Kieran muttered, taking the axe from Rupert's loose grip. Dinna stare, Cormac warned, though he couldn't keep the slight amusement from his tone. It was hard to be angry at Rupert when he was mooning over Elin like a young calf. He was soft and young, far from the risk Gregor was. Rupert's cherubic cheeks pinked and he shook his head. She's the most beautiful creature I've ever seen, he said reverently. Kieran reached down and helped Cormac stand. Let us go find a good place to secure the bar for the sheaf toss, and we can leave these loons to finish smoothing the caber. Rory pretended umbrage but pulled out his own blade and began smoothing the cut branches on the log. Rupert followed suit. Marion turned and slid her arm around Isabel's to pull her back up toward the castle. Good luck, Cormac, she called, looking over her shoulder. Thank ye, lass, he said, following Kieran in the opposite direction. He lowered his voice. I'll be needing it. Chapter 11 Miles Duncan ran a hand through his sandy brown hair, knocking some of it loose from its cue. He quickly righted it, for it would not do to have Mother believe he was distressed and send her further into her illness. He knocked at her bedroom door and waited for her reply, smoothly drawing in his breaths to appear as though nothing was amiss. He nearly missed Mother's soft reply, but leaned in close to the door and heard her weakly bid him to enter. Miles let himself into the room, schooling his face to reveal only mild interest. How are you feeling? His mother lay on the plush four-poster bed, her shoulders propped up by an abundance of pillows. Her skin was pale, so white it blended with the hair at her scalp. Her blue eyes matched the papered walls. She blinked at him and he could see the smile she offered was strained. I've been better, lad. But dinna fash yourself on my account. Ye have more important things to worry about. As though Miles could even consider anything outside of his mother's health at present. The illness had come on swiftly just a few days previously and seemed to have attacked with the force and swiftness of a band of charging Highlanders. Miles imagined the McEwans would be a force to behold in such a battle, with how regularly he saw them training on the grass before their castle, though he was careful to keep those observations to himself. Someone in this house would surely find something to bemoan about their neighbours if he was to mention them, and further animosity between his people and Clan McEwan was the last thing Miles wanted. Mother's eyes drifted closed, and Miles crossed to the bed and lifted her papery, dry hand in his. Please allow me to call the doctor back. She scoffed quietly. That fool Cain's Nathan, and I dinna want him bleeding me dry, she sighed quietly. I dinna have the energy for another doctor, Miles. There are other doctors who will not bleed you if we ask. Allow me to ride to Bralug. Surely I can find someone there who can help. Someone who is competent. It is nae matter, Mother said. I will heal, son. I only need to rest. She looked completely awful, and Miles had a hard time believing she could be healed from rest alone. She needed a decent poultice, at least. Anything to draw the illness from her body. His own cook had similarly proven inadequate in such matters. He crossed the room and stood at the window, looking out over the narrow loch. Men were gathered on the opposite bank, each of them wielding a tool and working at a long log. Curiosity nipped at him, but he couldn't discern what they were doing. They looked to be preparing the wood for something, but what? Do you think we need to train more often? He asked his mother mildly. He didn't want to fight with bordering clans, but he was no fool. He knew his men needed to be prepared to defend their own against any adversary. Your brother-in-law is coming soon, as he know, Mother said weakly. I'm certain he will have an opinion on the matter. 
Aye, he'll certainly have an opinion. He's been insufferable since. His throat clogged with emotion. Well, you can well what I mean. Mother scoffed, her chapped lips curving into a soft smile. Ivor was insufferable long before that. Do you care to ken what I think? Miles took one last look at the McEwans on the distant shore before he turned away from the window. He crossed the room again and lowered himself on the edge of his mother's bed near her feet. Her blue eyes watched him closely. She might be ill, but her wit was as sharp as ever. She spoke slowly, measuring her words as though each one held significance. I think ye should determine what ye can do to end the strife between the McEwans and us. Ye wouldna feel the stress of no having ready warriors if ye didna live across the water from an enemy. They are close enough to see from our windows, and that is causing ye to worry. Nothing made him worry more than his mother's health at present, but she made a valid point as always. Perhaps you're right. I need to come up with my own plan. You could have agreed to marry the lass, she said softly. She seemed a kind-hearted one. Miles swallowed and looked away. Pain rose in his chest, making it difficult to draw breath. He agreed that the women had been kind. When the fight had broken out between the clans at the end of the feast a few weeks before, Isabel had taken his mother from Morag and led her to safety with no thought for herself. He admired and respected that about her, but that was not enough to agree to marriage. You can or could na marry her. I'll never marry again, mother. He tried to lighten his tone. Besides, after the duel, that lass arrived and kissed Kieran Buchanan. I believe they are to be married now. If I'd agreed to McEwan's demands, I would have stood in the way of a love match, and I could na lived with myself. His mother smiled sadly. I ken it well. She seemed to pause and weigh her words. But perhaps ye dinna need to secure a love match for yourself, son. There are other reasons to marry. His chest tightened again, and he breathed through the pain. Aye, but none which appeal to me. Silence descended upon them, broken by his mother's heavy, steady breathing as she slipped into sleep. Miles waited until he was certain she wouldn't wake before he rose from the edge of the bed and left the room. He knew seeking another doctor would vex her, but he didn't have a mind to care about whether or not she was frustrated with him. Healing her was his priority. Miles had already lost too much. He couldn't lose his mother as well. He'd lived at Dalnane for months now, but still he could see how the tenants nearby did not fully trust him. He understood why that was. When the previous laird of the estate, Angus, had ruled with an autocratic fist... Miles had yet to prove that he was a compassionate man who only wanted the best for the people on his land. He'd taken Tavish and gone to visit the tenants on his property, but he'd yet to meet them all, and now he needed to put a hold in that plan until his mother was better. Miles trudged down the stairs and paused at the base, his hand resting on the carved rail. Tavish waited against the wall, his arms crossed over his chest and his partially hooded eyes fixed on Miles. How is your mother? Tavish asked. Miles had known Tavish his entire life, and he could detect genuine concern in his friend's gaze. I need to ride to Brelug and retrieve a doctor. Can you keep an eye on things here? Tavish nodded slowly. Aye, but I need to speak with you before you leave. He'd assumed so. It wasn't common practice for Tavish to stand around in corridors and at the bottom of the staircase waiting for Miles. What is it? Miles asked, stepping past Tavish to let himself into the study on the ground floor. Tavish followed and closed the door behind them. There are whispers of unrest, and I dinna ken if it's wise to ride alone. Ye ought to take a man with ye. What sort of unrest? Tavish dropped into one of the faded blue chairs near the hearth. It is being said the Redcoats are looking to form another company for Am Fregadindu. They've been patrolling eastern Invernessshire, and they could be coming our way. They were recruiting for the Black Watch. Surely they already had enough Highlanders keeping watch over their fellow countrymen. 
If they wanted to form another company, they must be worried about an impending dispute. But this unrest has not reached us yet, aye? Miles asked. Tavish sucked in a breath between his teeth as though he disagreed. Some of the redcoats are staying down in Bralug. The watch was seen near it, and people are nervous. You're no yet well kenned in these parts. If you're mistaken for part of the watch, they could be looking to retaliate. You really ought no to go alone. It seemed that Miles would be forced to take another, and that could slow his errand. He suppressed his frustration. Tavish's explanation was reasonable, albeit taxing. The last thing Miles was concerned with at present was the watch, or even the redcoats. I will not go alone then. I can take Fergus or Murtuk. Tavish's thick black eyebrows bunched together. You're only fetching a doctor, aye? You can send them in your steed and remain safely here. It was the same tired argument they'd had time and again. But Miles needed to go himself. He couldn't trust such an important task to any of his men. They would find themselves distracted in town among the entertainment to be had there. Urgency was not their strong suit. He'd witnessed their poorly ranked priorities before. Miles shook his head. I am no an important man, and my safety is no so vital as that. Finding a doctor to help my mother is my priority, and I cannot leave it to anyone else. She'll be mad enough as it is. Tavish grinned. She does not want you leaving either. Nay, tis no that. She does not want another doctor, but she is not feeling any better, and it has gone on long enough. If you're determined to go, you better take both Murdoch and Fergus. Aye, perhaps. Miles didn't much care who went with him, as long as they could ride swiftly. If the Redcoats were recruiting for the Black Watch, it would be good to have more men for all their safety. All will be well. If we're set upon by angry farmers, I'll assure them I am their new laird and mean them nae harm. If they were set upon by Redcoats... Miles didn't have a plan for that scenario. Certainly, Tavish said, though he didn't seem convinced that it would be so easy. I need to prepare, Miles stood. I must ride out at first light. I will keep watch here. Miles paused and looked at his oldest friend. Please look after my mother. Tavish looked affronted, his thick brows ticking close together. I care for her too, you can. Of course I will look after her. Miles did know this, but he was distracted. He crossed over the thin rug toward the window, looking through the trees toward the water. He couldn't see the opposite banks from this height, but he could make out the distant shadow of a man standing sentinel on Moreg's parapet walk. Hills rose up behind the castle, covered in blended spots of green and brown, as the grass was beginning to die and prepare for winter. It was a majestic image and plainly beautiful. He understood the McEwen need for ceaseless training. He would protect and guard Moreg, just as valiantly were at his home. It was time to reinstate the friendly relations which once existed between the McEwens and the Duncans. As soon as Miles returned with the doctor and found a cure for his mother, he would set his mind to finding the path to peace. It would become his highest priority. Perhaps he needed to complete his rounds among the tenants, to introduce himself and ask about their feelings regarding the feud. When he'd questioned tenants before, no two families had carried the same reason for clinging to the feud. It was ridiculous that they would hold fast to a fight which belonged to their grandparents. He felt better now for having a loose plan, heal his mother, question the people, fix the feud. If he asked the Duncans what it would take for them to heal, surely they would have an answer for him. Miles was expecting a visit from his brother-in-law next month, the chief of Clan Duncan. And it would be better for everyone if he had a solid plan in place before Ivor set one foot in Delnane. It was time to get to work. Chapter 12 the slow, lilting ballad melded with the smooth fiddle and drifted up from the great hall. Marion stood on the open walkway that ran the length of the room, hidden in the shadows. 
It was late, and the men who remained in the hall had drunk enough to lightly not remember how the evening had shifted into a makeshift concert from Rupert's father, with Mr Crabbe on the fiddle. Or rather, she assumed Mr Crabbe was on the fiddle, but she had not actually seen him. Marion could lean forward and look out over the balustrade to the people gathered in the great room below, but she was happily shrouded in shadows and enjoying her peace. She rested her back against the cold grey stone of the wall, nestled snugly between two covered windows. The torches resting in sconces along the walkway had yet to be lit, and Marion listened to the music as it swelled and mixed with the clinking of tin cups on tables and joyous, muttered conversation. These familiar sounds warmed and soothed her. They were the ambience of home. "'You're prepared for the sheaf toss, then?' a voice asked above the rest. "'It is to be the next game and the caber toss next week.' "'Aye,' Simon replied. "'I dinna need to practice tossing sheaves. I can win that in my sleep.' Marion's stomach clenched, Simon's voice never failing to chase away her comfort and peace. Could Cormac be down there, listening to Simon's overzealous confidence? She had not seen him much in the few days that had passed since she had come upon him at the fairy tree, and she found herself thinking about him when her mind was free to wander. Rain had begun in earnest not long after she and Isabel found Cormac preparing the caber, and it hadn't ceased since. Surely the rain and mud were the reasons for postponing the caber toss. Not that Marion would complain. She'd had a few ideas for how she might hurt Simon's chances for winning that particular game, but couldn't discern how to do so without harming Ian and Cormac as well. They were all using the same caber as it was. Ian was practising this morning. It might be wise to rein in your confidence. Someone said with a mildly warning tone, the man sounded like Hugh, but Marion could not be entirely certain. Och, nay, Simon blustered. You'll see. I'm confident because there is nay other man here fit for chief and nay other man who'll wed Marion. A chill ran up her spine and she shut her eyes. Rain pinged against the window panes on either side of her and she felt each hit directly in her soul. She wouldn't marry Simon. She couldn't. Old Rupert's song shifted into another, and then another, the peaceful music washing over her and replacing the trepidation nurtured by Simon's confidence. He'll be furious when Ian wins the sheaf toss, Hugh said some time later. Simon must have left the room. Marion's eyes flicked open. She was tempted to peek and see who Hugh was speaking to, but she didn't want to give herself away. She was located just above their table on the walkway and could easily listen. It would have been useful had they said anything of worth, but they were not finished speaking yet. It could still be of use. Aye, Simon will be furious when Ian wins the whole of it, another voice said, his tone rich and low and difficult to discern. Was it Rory, perhaps? I dinna wish to be around him when that happens. Ian's been McEwan's favourite for too long. He has my support. Och, nay, Hugh said. Kieran is the chief's favourite, but he's no a McEwan. That's the only reason he's marrying Isabel instead of competing. Even then, I wager McEwan was tempted to invite Kieran to compete. Not a McEwan, Hugh reminded him. But Marion could not reconcile the earlier statement that Ian could win the whole of it and do so with the clan's support. Ian! the favourite. She tamped down her surprise. She had felt certain Simon had everyone fooled. It was with relief that she realised Simon was not the people's favourite, not all of theirs at least. She guffawed slightly to herself, shaking her head. A shadow paused in the opening of the walkway and turned to face her, and Marion clamped her mouth closed. Drat, she shouldn't have made any noise. That was an amateur's mistake and she'd been eavesdropping long enough to know better. She'd given herself away. The tall, broad shoulders were backlit by a torch in the stairwell, and fear nestled in her chest for a fleeting moment. Surely Simon would have no business being in this area of the castle so late at night. She fought the temptation to bend down and feel the thick curve of her knife handle against her leg. She had never used it, and she was determined not to have the need to pull it free tonight either. 
The shape turned and Cormac's profile was easily discernible in the light. Relief washed through her like a fall of sudden rain. He crossed toward her, a smile playing on his lips. Faint light from the great hall's massive fires below danced along his face until he slipped into the shadows near Marion. His expression was difficult to discern in the dim lighting, though she believed him to be amused. Cormac leaned back against the stone wall beside her, resting against the covered window. Can I ask what you found to be so humorous? I heard your laugh from the stairwell. Laugh? Surely he did not believe her laugh to sound as boring and bland as a guffaw. It was nothing. I overheard some men discussing the sheaf toss. She lowered her voice. If she had so easily heard Hugh and Simon and the others, they could certainly hear her as well. I would share what I heard, but I didna wish to hurt your feelings. You canna hurt me, lass. His voice was low, his pitch matching hers. That is good. Well, he prompted, what did you hear? She eyed his relaxed posture and fixed gaze. Only that you are no the people's favourite yet, but perhaps you've already noticed as much. Cormac scoffed quietly, his smile belying his umbrage. Well, what was that for, eh? Are ye trying to hurt my feelings? Marion laughed, the warmth permeating her chest and bleeding down her arms. She could see he was not truly offended. She felt the orange glow lighting her body like the flames in the fire below, though she remained in the cold shadows. Speaking with Cormac was effortless in both practice and feeling. Had she not thought the same thing before when they had spoken at the fairy tree? He acted as though he valued her opinions, as though he was interested in what she had to say. Marion had regularly made herself heard. She was the daughter of a clan chief, and she had ample exercise in authority and examples of strong, resilient people to emulate. But when she was with this man, she did not have to perpetuate an artifice. She never felt like she must straighten her back, lift her chin and stare down her nose at him to reiterate her status. His conversation tenderly breathed life into her lungs and buoyed her. Cormac shifted to better face her, dragging her from her musings. He leaned his shoulder against the covered window and crossed his arms over his chest. Perhaps the people of Morag dinna want me to win, but what do you think? Who is it ye cheer for silently? Silently? Aye, I've never heard ye cheer aloud or publicly give your support to any of the three contenders. You mentioned at the fairy tree that you'd done a mind who wins as long as it isn't a Simon, but I assume you must have a preference. Who is it? I have not changed my mind. I will be content with anyone but Simon, she said quietly. She couldn't allow herself to hope for a certain man, or fate would determine she was not worthy of her choice. It was better to guard her heart until she knew for certain Simon wasn't the victor. Cormac didn't appear wholly surprised by this answer, though Marion did detect disappointment in the soft downturn of his lips and the quick absence of his smile. She'd let him down with her answer, though she didn't know how. Part of her clamoured for more from him to better understand his purpose in this line of conversation, but most of her was simply frightened. He kept his voice low. We are discussing more than the position of clan chief here, Marion. You'll marry the man. You dinna have any more preferences than that at Isna Simon. She reached down and rubbed her forearm. The incident with Simon in the corridor hadn't been repeated in the previous weeks, but Marion had taken extra care to ensure she did not find him alone again. He terrified her, and if he was placed in a position of authority... No, she could not allow herself to consider what future would lay ahead of her then... Her eyes drifted closed, and she counted. One, two, three, four, five. Marion's eyes flicked open, and she pushed aside her worries and fears, trampling them into submission. Whoever my father chooses will become my husband, and I ken it well, Cormac. I cannot choose the man myself, so why would I allow myself to hope for one when I have no say in the matter? Between ye and Ian, I am confident I would be safe. She steadied her voice, realising how strongly she felt the truth of those words. 
However, I will not marry Simon, regardless of what my father says. The muscle jumped in Cormac's jaw, and he stared down at her with steely dark eyes, aided by the shadows and his apparent irritation. Do ye even have a choice? Nay, no really, she said. But I'm no against pleading my case. I would trade my pride for a life without Simon. Then why do you no say something now? You can end the games and help your father's choice, surely. Marion laughed mirthlessly, the sound echoing softly in the corridor. Music continued to drift up from the main hall, wrapped in the din of conversation and the general movement of cups on the tables and bench legs scraping against the floor. She was suddenly aware that they could be found alone, and while there was nothing wrong with speaking to a man in the corridor, she didn't want it to incite any rumours. I canna see anything yet, Cormac. I dinna wish to give up my pride, unless I have nae other choice before me. In truth, Marion was unsure if begging would work with her father. She had the sinking suspicion that he would call upon her to do what was best for the clan, as he'd done so many times before. He would not believe Simon to be truly dangerous. Why would he? Yes, her father loved her, but duty, honour and the good of the clan always came first. Marion pushed up from the wall. Cormac reached for her arm, his fingers softly pressing into her skin. Wait. She registered the fact that Cormac's grip was nearly where Simon's had been before, but his large fingers softly grazed her skin, his hold light. She could pull away, but she found she didn't want to, for she didn't feel unsafe. She felt desired in a way that didn't make her skin crawl. She felt desired for herself, her conversation and companionship. It was heady and potent, and she didn't wish for it to end. Yes? She asked, leaning into his hold, swaying just a little closer. Cormac's green eyes were still dark, the cut of his jaw moving as though he was actively refraining from saying whatever was on his mind. His gaze flicked away before landing back on her, and his lips formed a soft smile. I merely wanted to tell ye that I hadn't yet met your elusive spirit. Marion grinned. Cormac hadn't released her arm and was now running his fingertips lightly over her skin as he looked into her eyes. Chills cascaded down her arms and she struggled to focus on what she meant to say. Ah, yes, the ghost. I would consider myself fortunate in that regard then, she said. Unless ye want to see the spirit. I plan to ask for her help in defeating Simon and Ian, but she's so far been very unhelpful. By not proving her existence? Precisely, Cormac muttered. Marion clicked her tongue as though speaking of a regular visitor or a dog and not a deceased woman. These spirits are all the same. She'll come to ye when ye dinna wish for her to. Perhaps she can teach me how to toss a sheaf, he suggested absurdly. Marion frowned. Och, Cormac, dinna say ye canna throw the sheaf, he shrugged. I have not had a reason to learn before now. I can help ye. His eyebrows rose. You ken how to do it? I've seen it plenty of times, so I ken the basics. I'll sew you back in the morning, and we can begin if the rain has ceased. His fingers stopped moving, resting against her arm. You dinna have to do that. She stood so close now she could feel the warmth emanating from him, and she wanted to lean all the way in, to feel his arms wrap around her. The thought startled her, and Marion sucked in a quiet breath. She tried to cover it with a chuckle, though it sounded strained even to her own ears. I have grown weary of practising the clarsac. Helping ye will give me something to do if this rain persists. I have na grown weary of hearing ye practise it, but I will not refuse the help. Cormac lifted his hand as though he meant to smooth the loose hair away from her temple, but he paused, dropping his hand before it could make contact with her skin. The degree to which Marion felt disappointed, frightened and excited her in equal measure. She lowered her gaze and Cormac released her arm and the broken contact left a lasting chill on her skin. Does your sister sew? she asked, hoping to steer them onto more neutral ground than the competition in which he was fighting to become her husband. Aye, she does, he said, his voice raspy. 
then I will invite her to join me tomorrow. Perhaps she will enjoy her time here better if she feels she has a friend. Cormac's gaze warmed. Aye, she will indeed, he all but whispered. Marion nodded and stepped away. Her heart skittered unbearably quickly in her chest, but she didn't mind it. She had never before felt the way Cormac made her feel, and for this moment, at least, she would not ruin it with worries or fears for the future. Tonight, she would simply bask in the warmth that yet remained from his touch. Cormac watched Marion walk away. He couldn't hear her receding footsteps over the heartbeat pulsing loudly in his ears. He hadn't planned on touching her at all. But once he did, he couldn't seem to break the connection between them, and from the way Marion had leaned into him, he hadn't thought she wanted him to. He could still smell the faint rose that followed her about like a soft cloud, and it made him chuckle. When she'd found him in the woods after he was thrown from the horse, he'd sniffed her, more than once. She had laughed then, but had he been completely in his right mind, he wouldn't have told her how nice she smelled. He would have just smelled her and silently thought about it, which, in hindsight, sounded odd. But not nearly as odd as her statement that she would be happy with either Ian or Cormac as a husband, because she knew that with either of those men, she would be safe. Not happy, not loved, not esteemed, but safe. His blood boiled and it had taken great restraint to not call out Simon then and there. He should have asked if her safety was currently in question, but he had no right to ask that of her. Instead, he would keep a close eye on Simon for the duration of his time at Morag. If it was up to Cormac, that man would not be allowed in the same room as Marion. How could her father genuinely consider Simon an option? Cormac had seen Marion rub her forearms at the mention of Simon on more than one occasion, though he knew not why. He wondered if she realised she was doing it. He wanted to soothe away the fear present in her eyes, and he had done so. He'd replaced it with a look akin to longing, one that had made his heart gallop and his breath shallow. Cormac needed to cease thinking about Simon, or he would turn and ram his fist into the stone wall, which would only damage his knuckles. Though, if McEwen was willing to choose Simon, Cormac would need to make certain that wasn't an option, that the victor was either him or Ian. Imagining the future that potentially sat before Marion, he grew determined to do his best to be chosen. Cormac paused on the stairs and looked at the small torch burning on the sconce, the flame bouncing about the curved wall. He wanted to win. He wanted to become Marion's husband. He wanted her. But who could blame him? She was resilient, strong, beautiful and witty. She was everything he could hope for in a companion. Would he be the same for her? Could he be? Furthermore, was he truly capable of leading a clan? Cormac ran a hand over his face and took himself up the stairs. When he reached Elin's door, he paused, then knocked. Yes? she asked softly. Cormac opened the door and found his sister sitting against her headboard, a lamp lit on the table beside her, a book open on her lap. He closed the door behind him and took the chair in the corner, lifting his feet to rest them against the wooden edge of the bed. Are ye happy here? he asked. He couldn't remove Marion's voice from his head, repeatedly stating, Between ye and Ian, I am confident I would be safe. Did Elin feel safe at Moreg? She lifted one shoulder in a brief shrug. The wee library is decent, and no one is telling me I'm no fit for reading, which is a pleasant surprise. I never told you that you're no fit for reading, and I was your only housemate in Gilmure. Aye, but you can I heard it elsewhere. Gregor, he'd forgotten. Other men looked at Elin and her habit of reading askance. But Gregor had been outspoken on occasion. He didn't want a wife who read when she should be doing the laundry or cooking his meals. Cormac enjoyed a hot meal as well as any man, but Elin's fondness for novels had yet to make him starve. If anything, it had only put a dent in their expenses due to the additional candle purchases. We haven't have spoken about that night, he said softly, when I found ye and Gregor. I ken ye like to keep to yourself, but if something like that happens again, I need to ken it. Ye need to tell me. 
worry about your own troubles, Cormac, she said lightly, dismissing his concern at once. Nay, lass, ye are my family. She shook her head clearly in disagreement. Ye have enough on your mind with the games and this ridiculous competition you're part of. I don't need a warrior. I am perfectly capable of looking after myself. Ye should focus on winning the games, on your own life and cease trying to shape mine. Had she gone mad? In what way was his interest in her safety an attempt to control her? I'm no trying to shape your life, Elin. I am your brother, the last of your kin. It is my responsibility to keep you safe. Mother and father both would have expected so, and ye well ken it. They're no here, though, are they? She said with an unexpected bite. We can do whatever we please. Cormac clenched his jaw and looked to the woven rug on the floor, frustration tightening the muscles in his forearms as he gripped the arms of the chair. Every conversation with Elin was the same of late. Where was his happy, silly sister who loved and admired him? Why could he not show her she was far from a burden, but rather a blessing in his life? Promise you'll tell me if you ever feel unsafe, Liddy. Do it for me. He swung his gaze back to her and held her defiant glare. I love ye too much to see ye hurt. I love ye too, ye daft loon, Elin whispered, shaking her head softly. A small smile tipped the edge of her lips, though. Cormac smiled, grateful their conversation had ended on a lighter note. He needed that, or he would have felt far too heavy to pull himself from the chair and make it to his own bed down the corridor. He stood. Elin turned her attention back to her book, and he let himself from the room. Chapter 13 Marion sat in the quiet of her mother's sitting room and shifted the sheaf on her lap to the side. She pinched the edge of the burlap sack closed and drew her needle through it, stuffing a few stray stalks back inside. Rain continued to fall, though it had slowed to a mist and would not put off the games much longer if Marion knew her father at all. Elin sat beside her on the long, carved bench seat, head bent to the task on her lap, a copper lock curling down over her freckled cheek. Isabel sat in a tall back chair nearer the fire, mending Kieran's shirt, her ankles tucked delicately to the side. Conversation had yet to flow naturally with Elin, but Marion was determined to find some common interest between them. Isabel glanced up and caught her eye, and Marion flicked her gaze with meaning, indicating the other woman. Isabel looked to Elin, but shrugged one shoulder so softly that Marion would have missed it had she not been paying close attention. Marion cleared her throat and indicated the torn burlap sheaf on Elin's lap. Ian has torn that sheaf to shreds. Do you think it might be better to sew a new sack? Elin leaned back a little, looking at the sheaf in quiet contemplation. I dunna ken enough about the sheaf toss to answer that. He asked for the holes to be repaired, though, so I suppose I ought to do that. Ian mentioned his pitchfork slides off the bag as soon as he slides on it. Marion grinned. That is one way to lose immediately. Elin smiled softly and returned her gaze to her needle and thread. A throat cleared in the doorway, and Marion looked up to find Ian standing there, his arms crossed over his chest and his gaze on Elin. His dark eyebrows sat expressively over deep eyes, the same colour as his beard. I heard my name. Were you talking about me then? Yes, Marion said. We were discussing the likelihood of you winning with these massive holes in your sheaf. Ah, but that is why I asked Miss McEwen to help me. You canna sew a wee hole, Marion asked dubiously. In reality, she was only trying to goad Ian into teasing Elin. She needed some help drawing the woman from her quiet shell. He grinned. Aye, I can sew well enough. He nodded toward Isabel holding the shirt. So can Kieran. Isabel laughed. This is a benefit of marriage, Ian. You're no marriage yet he said. Elin's attention remained on the sheaf in her hands. Was she determined not to make friends while she was at Morag? Isabel was shy and quiet, but even she could be coaxed into conversations. 
Isabel shook her head, but her smile was good-natured as she directed her attention back to the shirt. Ian, will you look at this and tell me if I've done it correctly? Marion asked. He pushed off from the doorway and came to inspect her sheaf, which she was fairly certain she'd done exactly the right way. Ian nodded. It looks bra to me. You want the straw to be balanced and each bag must have the same weight. He lifted it, then looked at Elin, who still focused on her needle as she sewed. May I pick it up? Elin paused. She held the bag up to Ian but did not release the needle. He took it and held both sheaves. Aye, they're balanced. He set the sheaves back into the woman's hands and turned to Elin. Perhaps you'll infuse my sheaf with good luck from your magic touch. Her needle stilled above the burlap and she lifted her face to meet his gaze, staring at him blankly, as though she did not understand why he yet remained in the room or why he still spoke to her. I assure you, I have not any magic to spare. If I did, do you know, think I'd use it on my brother? Marion watched the interaction with growing trepidation. She didn't wish for strife in her own household, not when there was so much opposition against them from outside forces already. Ian laughed, his voice booming in the small room. A twinkle in his eye betrayed his apparent amusement and he bowed to each of the ladies. I will leave you to it, Marion breathed out a sigh of relief. When the door clicked closed behind Ian, Isabel turned to face Marion better and spoke, her voice low so as not to be overheard. "'Tis interesting, isn't it, that he would flirt with ye? She looked pointedly at Elin, when he is clearly trying to win your hand, Mary. Och, that man has kenned me my whole life, Marion scoffed lightly. He has no feelings for me, and he's always been a flirt. She eyed Elin, whose needle hadn't ceased moving, though it had slowed. But Ian is a good man. If he does na win my father's favour, he would make a fine husband to any other. Elin laughed, the brittle hollow sound void of humour. Her smile was pretty, curving her lips, but it failed to reach her eyes. Had every smile she offered since coming to Moreg been the same? Marion hadn't noticed that before now, and it worried her. A smile that didn't reach one's eyes was unlikely to touch one's soul with warmth. Perhaps Elin missed her home or her companions in Gilmuir. What could Marion do to help her? Elin shook her head. I will na marry without love. It was a warm sentiment from such a cold-fronted woman. Not that Elin was unkind, exactly, but her distance was nearly palpable. If ye have the choice, I recommend marrying for love, Isabel said. Marion agreed. Your brother would not require otherwise, surely. He is a kind-hearted man, and he appears to love ye dearly. Aye, Cormac is both of those, but he will not be responsible for me forever. I will find my own way. Her own way? But why? If she had a brother who loved her, what would possibly drive her to the point of dangerously making it on her own? Isabel filled the silence. I am glad to have you here as long as we can. Elin smiled, and it was far more genuine than before, but still her eyes were not affected. I have felt very welcomed here. You have a good home, and it is full of good people. She paused. Mostly. You have met Simon, then? Marion quipped before she could think better of it. Elin glanced up sharply from her sheaf. Ought I to be weary of him? Isabel and Marion shared a glance. Marion set her sheaf on the bench beside her and stood crossing toward the door. She opened it and looked out into the corridor, glad to find it empty. She wouldn't have put it past Ian to remain there and listen. He was a better soul than she, evidently, for Marion would certainly have stayed behind to gather bits of information if she had been in his position. Perhaps Ian didn't need to stoop to such levels. Being such a favourite of her father's meant he must know quite a lot about what happened around Moreg, directly from father's lips. She closed the door and took her seat again. I ken how easy it is to eavesdrop in this castle, and I dinna want to be overheard by the wrong person. But I, you want to avoid Simon if you can. He does na have a good heart. He can be... The words dangled unspoken and Marion struggled with how to phrase her warning. 
Elin lowered her hand and gave them her full attention. There was a man like him back in Gilmuir, if I take your meaning correctly. He was persistent. You must be glad to be rid of him, Marion said. Elin nodded. Aye, he was, well, I can defend myself right enough, but this man scared me. One evening I walked home rather late from a friend's house. Anna Lundy, you remember her? Marion nodded. Aye, I remember her well. They'd spoken before of the girl who'd come to visit last year. Elin glanced at Isabel. This man, Gregor, found me on the path between Anna's house and my own. He'd had too much whisky and was more persistent than usual. He pressed me to... She swallowed, and the dullness in her green eyes had turned sharp. I told Cormac Greg had only been asking to marry me, but his requests that night were not so wholesome as that. He did wish to marry me, but not that night. Filthy, Isabel said under her breath. Loathsome, Marion agreed. "'Twas a blessed thing your brother found you,' Isabel said. Elin fidgeted with one of the frayed holes in the burlap. "'Aye, the man had me pinned, and I couldna reach my knife. "'I feared I wouldna be able to reach it at all,' she swallowed hard. "'I keep it in a much more accessible location now.' "'It was difficult not to notice Elin didn't seem grateful her brother found her in time.' Rather, it seemed she was angry she had not been able to defend herself. She was a fiercely independent woman, which was a trait Marion both admired and understood, but it could be a fault if she was unable to ever accept help. It could become dangerous. Marion willed Elin to look up again, but her attention was riveted on the sheaf's holes. It is not a bad thing to rely on others. I ken how important it is to feel independent, but it is also good to recognise others are there to support and help you. Elin nodded, but her eyes had dimmed. Had she closed herself off a little? Well, after he found us, Cormac panicked and started prepping the land for us to leave. That was when the letter from your father arrived, inviting us to Moreg. Or... He likely only invited Cormac, but my brother brought me along. I am glad he did, Marion said. She gestured to Isabel. We only have each other for company usually, and we both appreciate new acquaintances. Isabel nodded. Marion grinned. Now that Isabel is about to be married, I'll have no friends at all, so your arrival truly could no have been better timed. Isabel blushed. It is not true. We are remaining at Moreg, which ye can well. Aye, but you're difficult enough to track down now, Marion affected frustration. Just wait until you're tending bairns and knitting wee stockings. The smile on Isabel's face grew to an alarming degree. She turned it to her lap and smoothed the shirt sleeves over her knees, her pale cheeks blushing a soft pink. I cannot wait to become a mother. I can wait. Marion said wryly, I hope to hold your bairns for a long time before I hold any of my own. Regardless of who was chosen as her husband, the pressure of raising the next chief or chief's wife was something Marion didn't care to think about quite yet. Father would want some control in that regard too, in the raising and caring for her children, and she was going to struggle with his influence concerning her bairns. No, she would need to wait a few years before she could stomach such a sacrifice. Her husband, whoever he was, would have to understand. Elin had remained quiet. Isabel must have noticed the same, for she tempered her smile. Do you care for a man in Gilmuir, Elin? Nay, I've no met a man yet who I wish to become my husband. Elin shifted uncomfortably in her seat. She appeared eager for the topic to move away from herself. When did you meet Kieran? Six years ago. I've loved the man nearly that long as well. But it took him a wee bit longer to notice me back. He did not look at me properly until he learned that I was meant to marry the Laird of Dulnane. Dulnane is across the water, Marion explained. The big house, the one you can see from here. Aye, Isabel confirmed. The laird is Miles Duncan. My father invited him to a feast and announced that he could have Isabel for a bride before everyone in the hall. He refused the honour and it was... Elin cringed. 
Och, uncomfortable. Aye, Isabel agreed, very uncomfortable. But Miles is a kind man. In his words, he isn't afraid to wed. Perhaps he's promised to another and she's far away. Or he's married? Elan asked. Nay, he isn't married. Marion turned the sheaf so she could sew the other side. But he is handsome. I wouldn't be surprised if he left a few broken hearts behind when he came here. He is new to the area. Aye, his brother-in-law is the chief of Clan Duncan. The last laird of Dulnain was a brute and he died with nae family, so Duncan chose Miles to replace him here. Elan strung her needle through another hole. We lived simply in Gilmure, so your lives sound quite adventurous. When Marion had spoken to Cormac at the fairy tree, he'd mentioned the hardships and difficulties that littered Elan's recent experiences. She might not have had such an adventurous life, but she was no stranger to hardship. She'd lost both of her parents, had too many ardent suitors, one of which had become dangerous, evidently, left behind her dearest friend to move to a strange castle, and was now afraid of horses. She might call her existence simple, but that made it no less full of heartache and trials and things that she might need a shoulder to lean upon for. Marion did not say anything about what she knew. She didn't want to break Cormac's confidence, but she smiled kindly at Elin and vowed silently to help her carve a space in Moreg that would feel as much a home to her as it did for Marion. The peace Marion felt the night before when she had been standing on the open walkway, listening to the din and chatter an impromptu concert in the Great Hall, was what made Moreg a home for her. She wanted to help Elin find that peace as well. It would be rewarding, for Elin was an especially guarded soul. Sometimes the most guarded of hearts, the ones who needed the most attention, were the most difficult to reach. Soft sunbeams danced through the window, and Marion looked up to find the warm rays glowing outside. If the sun was finally peeking through the heavy cloud cover, the rain must have mostly dried up, which meant the sheaf toss would take place soon. Marion looked down at her finished sheaf and ran her fingers along the seam. She was not the most talented seamstress, but her stitches did not need to be even to serve their purpose here. Though the question plagued her as she analysed the bag, how could she use this to make certain Simon would lose the game? Add rocks to his bag? Remove some straw so its weight was lighter? Cut the bag so it flew from the tines? No, not the last one, much too obvious. Marion would come up with something. She only needed more time to think. Chapter 14 Cormac had done everything he'd been told to do, but still he could not toss the sheaf straight above his head, nor did it fly high enough to reach the pole. He was growing increasingly frustrated. It really should not be so difficult to spear a burlap sack with a pitchfork and fling it up in the air and over a rod. But the mad thing was that it was inordinately difficult to toss the dratted sheaf high enough. Kieran had climbed the tree at the edge of the clearing and secured the horizontal branch higher than Cormac believed necessary. He'd been shocked when Rory had nodded his approval of the height. It was much higher than he'd recalled. Cormac puffed out his cheeks. He slid the tines into the burlap again and swung his arms back and forth as Rory and Rupert had shown him. He tried to feel the weight of the sheaf and time the release well. When he swung the pitchfork forward, he flicked up the sheaf. It flew from the tines, arcing like a rainbow until it was swallowed by the trees. Bloody sheaf! He'd been at this for hours. And what was the point? He was not going to master this. He grumbled to himself about the ridiculous nature of tossing hay into the air and how it was in no way indicative of his ability to govern a clan. Cormac crossed into the trees to retrieve the sheaf. When he found the burlap sack and stomped back out of the woods, he paused, unable to hide the grim expression on his face. Ian stood at the edge of the glen, laughing. He was undoubtedly finding great amusement in Cormac's poor attempt to toss the sheaf and something about Ian's entertaining laugh untied the knot of frustration in Cormac's chest, enough that he could smile at his own failure. Ian trudged across the muddy ground. You're doing it all wrong. 
Give it here and let me show you how to toss a sheaf like a real man. I've seen it done many times, Ian. Watching you will not help. Ian took the challenge, a glint shining in his dark eyes. Aye? Are you no a farm lad? I think ye can do it. Watch me closely. Ian slid the pitchfork onto the sheaf and swung his arms much as Cormac had. He swung a few more times before releasing the bag. It flew straight up into the air and arched over the horizontal pole secured high above them. Cormac watched the man closely, but nothing Ian did looked any different from what Rory and Hugh had demonstrated. He poked his pitchfork into the bag, tried to mirror Ian's stance and number of swings, and let the sheaf fly. Ian laughed again. I am glad you're finding such humour in my feelings, Cormac said wryly. He glanced to Ian and was surprised to find Kieran riding thunder past the field behind him. The horse appeared to handle smoothly, slowing and rounding a small herd of sheep easily. It only proved that Thunder was capable of such obedience. His behaviour during the hunt had been off, and Cormac suspected that something had been wrong with the horse that day. Do you no pay me any mind? Ian said, drawing his attention again. Firstly, you're stabbing the bag all wrong. You need a nice shallow puncture so the bag can fling from the tines with an easy flick. You buried your fork in too deep. You need to do it like this. Ian showed him how to shallowly slide the pitchfork into the sack, remaining close to the surface. Cormac studied the angle he inserted the pitchfork in and shook his head. It was absolutely ridiculous that he was studying hayfork tines and sheaves, but this was what his life had come to. Hold the fork on the end of the tines. Move your hand up. Ian helped him place his hand in the appropriate place where the cool metal met the wooden handle, and he could already feel the depth of control increase. Swing now, he asked, faintly noticing Kieran disappear from view. He was glad to have less of an audience for his inevitable failure. Aye, swing a few times to feel the sheaf and loosen your arms. But when you're about to release, dinna swing out, swing up. Swing up, Cormac repeated. He swung his arms back and forth, keeping them loose, and tried to remember all of Ian's advice. When he felt he had a good swing going, he tossed the sheaf upwards and flicked the edge, allowing the burlap bag to soar through the air. He followed it with his eyes, and while it didn't reach the pole it was meant to cross over, it did get much closer. It went up. Much better, Ian said, grinning. Cormac couldn't help but smile. He felt he had some control over the direction of the sheaf that time. Surely that would only improve the more he practised. Ian rubbed a hand over his dark beard. Perhaps I shouldn't have showed you how to beat me. I will now win. One lesson will no make me a master. Ian shook his head. This has always been one of my favourite games. My father taught me to toss the sheaf, and it is one thing I am fairly confident in. Cormac laughed. Then why am I bothering to even learn it? You're no out of the game yet, Cormac. You need to give it your all. Believe me, I am. Ian nodded, but there was a strange light of determination in his eyes. He contemplated something in the distance, eyebrows drawn and turned away. I must be off. I was going for a walk in the woods when your awful tossing distracted me. Why? Need to clear my head is all. This competition is different than usual, isn't it? The games are drawn out and we have nae warning of what is coming next. I dunna ken why I'm even included and it's confusing. He rubbed his upper arm and Cormac wondered if his injury was bothering him and why McEwen would ask a man who had recently been shot to compete. Surely Ian could not perform to the best of his abilities in his current physical state, though he had seemed to be doing well enough to Cormac. Aye... I could say the same for myself. Confusing. Ian nodded in understanding before he turned and walked into the trees. Cormac watched him disappear down the path he had taken himself toward the fairy tree. He hadn't returned to the tree since he last saw Marion there, and he was uncertain if he would want to see it without her. 
It had interested him, the burned bark and new growth, but after learning of the cause for the fire, he felt the tree was somehow woven into Marion, that the two were part of the same, and he could not have one without the other. Though he questioned the mythical nature of it, he knew of stories where fairies had caused people to disappear or tiny shoes were found, left behind after a fairy had visited someone during the night. But until he saw the creatures with his own eyes, he would not believe the fairies, or even Marion's ghost, to be in existence. A prickle of awareness tickled his neck, and Cormac looked over his shoulder to find Marion standing at the top of the glen where he'd earlier seen Ian. Had he imagined her into existence? Conjured her through her fairies somehow? A shiver washed over him, chased away by the pleasant warmth of finding himself in her presence. She walked toward him with purpose, and he knew at once that she was real and not imagined. Marion paused, and he wondered at the potential misjudgment of being alone together. Morag sat to their side, though its distance was enough to make them feel completely isolated. Will you show me how you throw? Cormac clutched the pitchfork tightly, the smooth wood of the well-worn handle warm in his grip. Aye, if you promise not to mock me. I haven't had a very successful toss yet. I vow it. Cormac suppressed the desire to impress this woman and slid the pitchfork tines into the sheaf as Ian had shown him. He swung the handle and let the sheaf fly into the air with a decided upward swing. It arced, nearly reaching the pole that was meant to cross over, and fell the other way. But he had gotten the height correct this time. He would consider it progress. Marion tried to hide her smile. Cormac grinned. I told you I wasn't any good. You have potential. Exactly what every man wants to hear, he cringed. I think I will need to sew this bag up again. I've pierced it too many times, and the pitchfork is sliding off before I want it to. Much the same happened to Ian. Aye, but Ian can make his sheaf over the pole. If I didn't amend these holes, I will not have any control over it during the competition. Marion's eyes brightened. She looked from Cormac to the discarded sheaf, her face splitting into a smile that lit her face. What is it? She startled, looking to him like a deer caught before a hunter. Tis nothing. I have had a dilemma, and I didn't ken how to go about solving it, but ye gave me an idea. Thank ye, Cormac. Something about the careful way she spoke gave him pause, and he peered into her clear, light blue eyes. The sunlight poured through them and he found no artifice there, only brimming gratitude. I can mend it for you, she offered. Nay, lass, I put these holes in your fine sheaf. I'll fix them myself. She looked uncertain. Very well. Marion hesitated before dropping a curtsy and turning to return to Moreg. Cormac watched her leave, his body yearning to run after her, to walk by her side and engage her in conversation. He needed to remain and practice with the sheaf, though, if he wanted a chance at winning. He couldn't allow her to cloud his priorities. Miles flew through the back door of Dulnane and out into the garden, past the kale yard and toward the small grouping of trees beyond. He would have sought refuge nearer the water, but the daylight was too harsh and shone down on his disappointment. He could not hide in the brightness. Carriage wheels bounded away down the road and Miles turned his back on the retreating unhelpful doctor. Did the man know nothing? He'd been unable to help Miles's mother at all, resorting to bleeding her still more until her pale skin was chalky and her energy dissolved. He was tempted to cross the loch and ask McEwen for assistance. A household the size of Moreg would certainly have a healer, or at least a cook who could provide a decent remedy. Surely doctors and healers were not so inept that they could not pull his mother from this illness. Miles had watched others he'd care for slip away into nothing. He simply could not bear to do so again. Footsteps caught his attention and he turned to find Tavish coming from the house, a worried expression on his brow. I dunna think that man will ever return to Dalneen. A good thing that, Miles said. Tavish offered a grim smile. What do you plan to do next? We ought to make Mrs Duncan comfortable. 
Miles squeezed his eyes closed. No, he would not admit that they'd sunk so far yet. Not until he'd exhausted every avenue open to him. He lifted his head and looked Tavish square in the eye. His friend was not going to like this. The man had all but begged Miles not to attend the feast last month at Morag. He'd believed it was a trap, too dangerous to trust the clan chief across the loch. He had been correct in one count. The chief had meant to trap Miles into marriage, but he'd firmly declined joining their clans together in that way. He could never marry. The only fight that had occurred was between Kieran and Magnus, a fight which spanned a grudge of generations and had nothing to do with him. Miles had been perfectly safe. I am going to Moreg to request help. Nay, Tavish said, his eyes widening. You cannot take such a risk. I would risk anything for my mother, Miles said calmly. Tavish nodded. I can so, but you have not tried all of our own people first. We can ride into the village south of the glen and find the healer. I heard one of the maids speaking of her. Miles paused, swallowing his suspicion. You did not say so before. I came out here to tell you, dinna go to Moreg. You dinna ken if they even have a healer. That was true. If one of the maids knew of someone Miles could fetch nearby, that would be better. Aye, vera well. Let us go to her now. Tavish looked relieved. Aye. Chapter 15 the McEwen clan gathered in the glen that led up away from Moreg, sitting on benches and chairs brought out from the great hall. The sky was white, a cloud cover reaching over them and hiding the sun. The three competitors stood near the tree line, their pitchforks in hand and sheaves resting on the grass. Marion sat beside her mother. Father and Uncle Brian sat on mother's other side, their heads bent in quiet conversation. She leaned closer to her mother, trying to make out what her father was saying from the low rumble of his tone. She hadn't been able to glean much of anything since Cormac had arrived, and it was difficult to feel so uninformed about what was going on around her at Moreg. She leaned closer still, under the guise of inspecting her shoe, and the conversation halted at once. Ah, well, whatever it was they spoke of, they clearly did not want her to overhear. Drat her father. Do you have a favourite? Mother asked, leaning close as Marion straightened in her chair. Nay, but I have a least favourite, she mumbled. Father had begun speaking again. He must have deemed himself safe again from her listening ears. Mother gave her a disapproving look. Marion swallowed an exasperated scoff. Do you think all the men father chose would make good chiefs? I rather wondered, daughter, if the men chosen would make good husbands. I had thought ye would have considered the point as well. Marion fell silent and looked again at the contenders. Cormac was watching her, and she drew her gaze away from him and settled it on Simon. The man stood tall, as though a rod lined his back, forcing his puffed chest forward. Ian waited beside them both, his stance comfortable, she followed the direction of his gaze toward her father, who still spoke quietly to Uncle Brian. Ian paid them close attention, and she wanted to inquire why he was so interested in what they had to say. She shook her head, clearing her mind. The men were evenly matched in some regards, but in every way that mattered, they could not be more varied. Cormac's attention had shifted to the crowd, and it came as no surprise to Marion to find him watching his sister, he was caring and valiant and brave. So, is there one man you prefer above the others? Mother asked again. In the quiet recesses of her heart, Marion could softly admit she would have a preference among the contenders if she allowed herself to. But she closed the door on that thought before permitting herself to consider those possibilities. Mother had asked her if she had considered these men as husbands, but the truth was she could not allow herself to do so. Opening that potential would do nothing but hurt. She smiled at her mother whose hopeful eyes shined despite the white cloudy sky. I dunna wish to say. Mother nodded. 
I will respect that. Father stood, and the very action caused a hush to sweep over the gathering. Welcome to the sheaf toss. A cheer rose up, subduing after Father lifted a hand. He gestured to the men standing at the tree line. The bar will raise with each round until one man remains successful. Let us begin. A long, smooth branch had been secured horizontally to two trees on the edge of the wood, low enough for the beginning round to be fairly easy. The crowd gathered on the grassy rise that sloped up to Castle Moreg, watching intently as the men moved to retrieve their sheaves. Marion had sewn Cormac's burlap sheaf for him, so she knew the particular one well, and Ian hadn't yet arrived when she'd come early, so she was confident she had tampered with the correct one. She was careful not to commit the same mistake she had during the hunt and harm another man. It had only taken a brief moment to slide her knife from her bodice and slit the repaired holes from his practising open again. It would be easy to discern if one looked closely at the sheaf, but it was the only thing Marion could think to do that would not be obvious prior to the games. The men lined up before the correct trees and Ian stepped forward. He pierced his sheaf with his pitchfork and swung his arms, releasing the bag into the air and easily arcing it over the smooth branch. Hollers and cheers rose up from the crowd. Simon followed him and did the same, his bag arcing smoothly over the pole to a resulting chorus of cheers. The wider holes in the bag hadn't seemed to affect his throw at all, but that was likely because the bar to cross had begun at such a low height. Cormac took his position after Simon had retrieved his bag. He pierced the sheaf and let it go. The sheaf flew into the air with an odd spin, but it made it over the pole, if only just. He watched the sheaf, a line forming between his auburn eyebrows. Could the pressure of the competition have reached him? When he had tossed the sheaf during his practice, he'd done far better than this. Young Rupert and Hugh climbed the trees and moved the pole up higher, and the men lined up to toss the sheaves again. Ian and Simon both completed the task effortlessly, their sheaves arcing high over the pole and across it as though they merely tossed it up with their hands. Cormac stepped forward again, and Marion found her fingers clenching the edges of her chair beneath her gown, her knuckles undoubtedly white and her skin pink from discomfort. Cormac pierced his sheaf and began swinging his arms widely to the sides. The sheaf flew off the tines on a regular swing and flew into the woods getting lost in the trees. Marion's heart rate increased. She looked to Cormac and found him staring after his sheaf, his hands still positioned on the pitchfork at the tip of the handle and the edge of the tines, his mouth hanging open just enough to see his confusion. Hollers rose up from the crowd, disappointment and jeering ripe in the air. Cormac moved to retrieve the sheaf, while Rupert and Hugh climbed the trees again to secure the pole further up still. Marion watched Cormac's defeated face, his pinched brows and flat lips as he stood at the edge of the trees further down and lifted his sheaf, turning it over in his hands and looking closely at the stitching. Ian and Simon threw their sheaves again, and both men managed to get them over the pole. Simon didn't appear to have any trouble with his. Could they have been switched? Could Simon have taken Cormac's sheaf by mistake? Rupert and Hugh climbed again to move the pole further up still. Panic slid into Marion's chest and tightened, as though her stay strained against her ribcage. She tried to look for the markings on Simon's sheaf, but it was difficult to see much of anything at such a distance. It appeared to be the one she'd cut, but they all looked so similar it was hard to tell. If they hadn't accidentally been switched and she had cut Cormac's bag, then he must have repaired it beyond recognition. He must have practised for so long and thrown the bag so many times that he'd ruined it completely. The look in Cormac's face now, glaring down at the sheaf in his hands, was frustration. Drat! She must have mistaken Cormac's sheaf for Simon's. It was the only plausible explanation. Now Marion had twice unintentionally compromised Cormac's ability to win in the games. She had been so very careful this time so as not to repeat the situation with Thunder and the saddle thistles. She bit her lip. Next time she was going to have to be completely certain it was Simon and him alone who would falter at her hands. 
Cormac stood on the grass holding his sheaf while the men continued the competition behind him. He'd sewn the holes tightly himself, so he could not understand why they gaped open. He was positive the bag in his hands was his own. He could see that from the haphazard stitching. But now there were so many holes it had become limp, unable to cling to the metal tines of the pitchfork. After the first faulty round, Cormac had tried to insert the pitchfork low enough to avoid a loose grip, but still it hadn't cooperated and he was out. After seeing Kieran ride thunder toward the glen and witnessing the possibility that the unruly horse could be tame and obedient, Cormac was fairly certain thunder had been somehow tampered with prior to the hunt. And now this. It was too pointed to be a coincidence. Someone desperately wanted for him to lose. He shook his head in confusion. Cormac had known no one at Moreg before coming to the castle. Who would want to harm his chances so severely? Simon, perhaps? But the man had given no indication he was the cause for either of Cormac's failures. No victorious grinning at the holes in his sheaf. He was merely victorious. Cormac looked at the burlap he'd sewn himself the afternoon before and ran his fingers over the clean lines of the slits. They had definitely come from a knife. He looked up and caught Marion's gaze. Guilt poured from her icy blue eyes as she worried her lip and averted her gaze, and he knew at once she was to blame. She had been speaking with Ian near the sheaves when Cormac first came outside, but he hadn't thought anything of it at the time. With a sinking suspicion, he recalled her strange behaviour in the stables following Thunder's misbehaviour. Could she truly have been behind that as well? It wasn't Simon then who'd intentionally harmed Cormac's ability to perform in the games thus far, but the woman whose heart he had begun to yearn to know. He didn't love Marion. He hadn't known her long enough for that. But he'd been unmistakably drawn to her, impressed by her and attracted to her. To know that she wanted him gone from the games this badly cracked his chest, fracturing it directly through his heart. She seemed to sense he was suspicious of her because of the careful way she watched him. And he had to fight the temptation to march across the boggy grassland and confront her before the gathered inhabitants of Moreg. With great restraint, Cormac turned his attention back to the games. He needed time to think before he did something rash and foolish. If Marion wanted him gone, she must have a reason for it. Cormac would discover what that reason was. The branch had been moved up fairly high now, and Ian tossed the sheaf cleanly over the top of it, just barely making it over the smooth pole. Simon followed him, and his sheaf didn't quite reach the branch. It fell to the ground, and an audible sound from the crowd accompanied the disappointed flop. A beat of silence preceded the cheers that rose up from the gathering for their victor, while Brian shouted his displeasure at Simon's loss. Simon kicked his sheaf into the woods, and it smacked against a trunk with force before falling to the mud below. Cormac looked to the chief, but his expression was blank. Was he upset or merely careful? It mattered not. The only thing on Cormac's mind, ramming his brain like a battering log, was Marion. Why would she choose to rule him out even before she knew him? Did she care for Ian more than she let on? If that had been the case, Cormac would have thought Marion had changed her mind after she grew to know him a little better. Their conversation in the dark corridor a few nights before was still fresh in his mind. The way he touched her arm and run his fingers over her skin was palpable and present, sloshing prickles down his skin from the memory. He'd felt a connection between them and it hurt to believe that she would disregard it so grossly. That he had misunderstood the situation, that he had been so utterly wrong. Cormac found Marion watching him again. He looked away, embarrassed and hurt by the way he'd allowed his feelings to blossom and develop. He shoved the feelings aside and firmly lifted his jaw just a fraction. He was on to her and he couldn't decide if he would allow her to know it or not. He needed to consider this carefully before making up his mind. Chapter 16 Thus far in the competition, Simon had won the hunt, though the man had clearly cheated, and Ian had won the sheaf toss. Cormac's losses were only made more glaring by the embarrassing margin which he had lost each competition by. 
he would be utterly ashamed if he had not discovered his success had been tampered with in both instances. He was only frustrated that he'd lost the chance to prove himself from the beginning. Cormac watched people filter toward the castle now the sheaf toss had ended, carrying chairs and benches back to the great hall. The cold air bit at his exposed skin and mist began to fall from the white cloud cover above. His shoulders and hair grew damp as he waited for every last person to disappear from the small grassy area. He wanted to be alone when he tried the sheaf toss again. Once the final men had gone inside, carrying a long bench between them, Cormac retrieved Simon's discarded sheaf and pierced it with his pitchfork. He held the handle appropriately and swung it widely before tossing it upward. The sheaf flew toward the tops of the trees and touched the smoothed branch, falling over the other side in a successful toss. He had done it. Cormac still was uncertain of his ability to beat Ian, but perhaps he would have achieved second place had his sheaf not been tampered with. Perhaps he could have shown McEwen and all the people watching that he was not completely and utterly inept. A motion caught his eye near the castle, and he turned to see Marion slip from the kitchen door and make her way toward the stables. It was eerily quiet, no doubt from everyone joining in the great hall to drink to Ian's success. Cormac felt that he too should be there to support his friend, but first he would speak to his secret opponent. He stabbed the pitchfork into the ground with more force than the action warranted and walked toward the stables with determination, shaking out his arm. He slowed when he reached the building and paused in the doorway. Marion stood at Shenna's stall, petting her neck and singing softly. It was difficult to remain angry with her when she was so sweetly engaged with her horse. He wanted to hide in a stall and listen to her for the remainder of the day. She must have felt his presence, for she stopped and looked over her shoulder at him. Do you sing the same way to the spirit in Morag? Her mouth curved into a tentative smile. Only when I need to. Have ye caught sight of her yet? Nay, I keep the bed hangings closed, so I'm certain that keeps her out. Maybe I will yet receive a visit from her. The stables were dim, the cloudy sky limiting the light within the damp walls. Cormac stepped further inside and paused at the empty stall's door beside Shinna. Someone has been trying to keep me from succeeding at these games. Marion looked at him sharply. I promise ye that isna the case. You promise me? How do you ken anything about it? Cormac hoped his tone would not give away that he had already discovered her culpability. Nay, man wants you to lose, Cormac. She paused, her brow bunching thoughtfully. Well, perhaps Simon and Ian might. He suppressed the warmth rising in his chest, his attraction to her badgering him despite his pleas for it to cease and leave him in peace. Ian taught me to toss the sheaf. He lifted his eyebrow, though he could have aided me because he was very confident in his own ability. Or he liked watching me make myself look a fool. But even as Cormac said the words, they did not ring true within him. Ian had been a friend, he had help from the kindness in his heart, and Cormac had felt their camaraderie. He trusted Ian. Marion shook her head and closed her eyes. She dropped her forehead against Shinna's neck, her dark hair meshing with the horse's pale white mane, and sighed quietly. When she lifted her head, she stared into his eyes with a force that would have knocked him back if he hadn't been holding on to the stall door. It was me. Cormac blinked. If Marion intended to be completely honest with him, he could do the same. I ken it. How do you ken? He shook his head. Intuition. Because he felt he knew her well enough to discern that the sorrow in her eyes earlier had been grief. She clearly did not enjoy ruining his chances at becoming her husband. But she'd still done it. It hurt him to think that she would dislike the prospect of him in that role so greatly. It does not matter how. Ye tampered with thunder during the hunt as well. Aye? Aye. 
Cormac stepped forward until he was close enough to speak quietly, to not be overheard, should anyone else choose to join them in the stables. If ye want me out of the games, Marion, ye only had to say so. I would have walked away. I will. He swallowed hard. Walk away. Marion took his hand and he felt the connection ping up to his heart. He hated how his skin reacted to her without his permission, that his heart increased at her nearness. I did those things, but they were no meant for ye, Cormac. I meant them for Simon. Cormac stilled. Simon? Aye, Simon. I will not marry the man, and I have been doing my best to make certain that he will not even be an option any longer. Cormac considered everything he'd seen and heard since arriving at Moreg, and shifted the pieces together until they fit. The way Marion was adamant that anyone could win except Simon. The way Simon had expected to ride thunder, but Kieran had given him another horse. Cormac almost sagged in relief when her words rang truth within him, loud and bold like a church bell on Sunday. Marion did not want Cormac out of the games. She merely wanted for Simon to lose. Perhaps Cormac was not as lost as he'd believed. The flood of joy filling his chest was dammed by an inkling in the back of his mind, warning him to erect a fence around his heart, to guard himself from future pain. Marion might not have chosen to disqualify Cormac, but the games were not over and there was much yet to be done. Regardless, Marion hadn't chosen him. She couldn't choose him. That was up to her father. But one truth bounced about in Cormac's mind until he grasped onto it. The amount of pain he had felt over her alleged tampering. And the sheer relief that swept through him after learning that she had not done so intentionally had proven one thing. Cormac was developing feelings for this woman. That frightened him. If another man was chosen, Cormac would have to watch the woman he cared about marry someone else. The stakes within the games had never been as real and present as they were in that moment. He should have considered how difficult this could feel before agreeing to join the competition in such a cavalier manner. Marion's hand still covered his, her skin cool to the touch. The day of the hunt, there was a misunderstanding, she said. I asked Kieran to give thunder to Simon, but he must have believed I said the opposite. You shouldn't have had that horse, and I felt awful about it. I'm glad to ken you didn't want me hurt. I was worried you were trying to injure me beyond any ability to join future games. Her hand tightened, and you slit my sheaf. I worked hard in mending those holes, he teased. Marion didn't smile, though. I did think it was Simon's. You mended it until it was unrecognisable. Cormac laughed. I did not claim to have any talent. My stitches are not so fine as yours. My stitches are not fine, Cormac. Yours are just terrible. Terrible, aye, but they held it together well enough. They held the sheaf together, but why was that so important? If Marion cared so deeply about this, she could do something about it that was more likely to make a difference. Can you no speak to your father about your feelings now? Why must you go about in this sneaky manner? I'm no certain my father will care at all for what I want. She spoke in a disengaged manner, her voice detached. She was not hurt, nor did she seek pity. She was merely relaying facts. He has always prioritised what is best for the clan. If I didna manage this myself, I could be forced to marry a tyrant. He understood her motivations, but not how she chose to go about it. Maybe we can help one another. Marion dropped his hand and ran her elegant fingers over Shenna's mane. How do you propose that? I have not been able to perform in the games properly yet. Forgive me, Cormac. But... He continued, If we work together, we can make it so the chances are better in mine and Ian's favour. Marion regarded him closely. Ian's as well. Do you no want to win? Win? Win a life with her? 
Cormac could not help the warmth that spread through him when he imagined himself as her husband. I, lass, I want to win. I, lass, I want to win. The words filtered through Marion's mind and her heart hammered in her chest. Cormac wanted to be her husband. The domestic image that presented was so tempting, she wanted to reach for it and clutch it tightly to her chest. Her gaze lifted to Cormac's, to the very real man who stood before her, looking a question at her as though he did not fully understand what was occurring between them. As though the energy that ran between them was the product of fairies, magical and warm and foreign. Marion didn't quite understand it herself. She had never before felt so drawn to any person before, let alone a man. A handsome man. Marion had little say in her future, and that made her developing feelings for Cormac incredibly frightening. Father would choose her husband. If she fell in love with one contender, she would have no choice but to put aside her own once if she was directed to marry another. She would survive such an instance, but her heart would suffer for it. Resolve thickened in her throat, blending down her tense muscles until she was stiff. It hardly matters what we want, she said, her voice as rigid as her body. My father will choose the winner. Cormac's green eyes bored into her, calculations spinning behind them. Instead of pouring your efforts into undermining Simon's abilities in the games, what if we focus our efforts on proving his true character to those who are yet blinded by his charisma? We can show your father how unfit Simon is to rule the clan. That would ensure that he is not chosen, aye? We? When had they become a we? Marion found she liked the feeling that word evoked very much. For the first time in her life of eavesdropping and strategic listening, she was not alone in her scheming. She had a partner, someone to be on her team. Marion. She nodded, redirecting her attention to the topic at hand. Aye, it would. But how do we manage it? We. Again, the word tasted sweet on her lips. Cormac's lips pulled into a smile. I'm certain we can think of something. Do you ken what the next game is to be? The caber toss. Marion chewed on her bottom lip and ran her fingers through Shenna's mane, untangling the coarse hair. After that? I dinna ken. Your father hasna mentioned it to me. He doesna like to say what it is until soon before it's meant to happen. He must have a reason for his secrecy, but I dinna ken what that is yet, which was part of the reason Marion had to retrieve her information by other, less savoury means. She hit upon an idea and looked to Cormac sharply. If he allowed her the use of his chamber to listen into the study, perhaps she could learn of father's plans before he announced them to the whole gathering. Or, with even less risk of being caught in a compromising situation... If Cormac was to learn of the feature in his floor which allowed him to eavesdrop into Father's study, perhaps he would gain enough information to give him a bit of an advantage in the games. After what Marion had done to ruin his chances of succeeding during the first two competitions, it was only fair that she assisted him in the future. But could she trust him? She dropped her hand from Shenna's mane and slid it along the horse's smooth back until she could no longer reach... Cormac had done nothing but prove himself trustworthy, had he not? If she was wrong in her estimation of his character, she would learn soon enough. There might be a way for you to ken what my father has planned, before he announces it to all of Moreg. He stood in front of her, his feet widely planted, and his hands resting behind his back. How is that? There is a place in the floor of your bedchamber where a board has come loose. When you lift the board and it is quiet, you can hear into my father's study. If you're careful, you could learn what is coming and prepare yourself ahead of time. Rain fell in earnest outside, pinging against the ground and creating a curtain of water on the other side of the door. It grew louder with its rising intensity and Marion's secret felt safely guarded. Cormac watched Marion intently, his stone-like face glowing from the lit torch behind her. 
Is that what I caught you doing when I first arrived at Moreg? Her cheeks warmed. Perhaps. A smile tugged at his lips. I was a stranger then. I dinna blame you for keeping your secrets. We all have them. Aye, what are you hiding then, Cormac? His eyes darkened and he stepped closer. He reached over her shoulder to run a hand down Shenna's mane, boxing Marion in against the stall door. Heat emanated from his body, his familiar scent of woods and rain overwhelming her. When Marion stood this close to Cormac, she could believe she was positioned at the base of the fairy tree, the fairies dancing about her and infusing her with their magic. She could believe she had a choice, that her life was her own, that this man could love her, and she would not be relegated to duty and loneliness and upholding her father's honour. That she could be more than currency. Cormac's arm pressed gently into her shoulder, and she leaned back against the gate, the wooden slats digging into her shoulder blades. His lips flickered in amusement. I wondered if your spirit had overtaken you that night I found you on the floor, for I didn't believe your story of falling while you were straightening the rug. Marion scoffed lightly, though she could not dampen her smile. It pulsed through her chest and tingled down to her fingertips. I straighten rugs a good deal. It's no so difficult to believe as you make it sound. Is that so? Cormac ceased rubbing Shenna's mane, and he dropped his hand onto the gate near her arm. If she leaned forward just a little, she could find herself in an embrace with a man which she found extremely enticing. Nay, it isna, she said, her voice wispy, but ye believed me for a moment. Cormac leaned close, his breath tickling the hair at her ear. On the contrary, he whispered, I didna believe a word ye said that night. Marion was robbed of breath. Wedged between the gate and Cormac, she gripped her skirt in both hands and breathed through her nose, happily catching more of his woodsy scent than the smell of horses. The spirit is real, she argued weakly. If you want to call her, you need only sing. I canna sing well, lass. I dinna believe ye. He chuckled, the sound like smooth honey over a hot scone. I'll prove it to ye some day. Why no now? Because I dinna wish to hurt poor Shinna's ears. Och aye, we wouldna want for my horse to find you repulsive, she affected concern, then she wouldna let ye ride her again. Ye believe I will remain at Morag long enough to have that opportunity? She dropped her voice to a whisper. I hope you will. Cormac's gaze fell to her lips and she sucked in a breath. Her heart slammed against her breastbone and she wanted him to lean forward and close the gap. She wanted to feel what it meant to be engulfed in fire, for she was certain kissing Cormac would be akin to bathing in the warmth of flames. Cormac's eyes locked on hers and Marion tilted her chin up. His arm slipped down her back and tightened around her and she could not see any expectations beyond the rain-enclosed stable house, would not allow herself to think of Moreg and what awaited them there. People kissed all the time without any promise of forever. Jenny had kissed Ian on more than one occasion, and still she had married the blacksmith's son. Marion could do the same. Her reputation would suffer for it if they were discovered, but the trick was to not be discovered and with the curtain of rain hiding them away, surely they would be notified if anyone chose to join them. Making the decision had infused her with bravery and courage flowered within her. She could kiss Cormac today, and it wouldn't matter if he did not become her husband, if another man won the competition. She was certain all the men fighting for the role of her husband had kissed other women themselves, surely... She tore her gaze away from his lips and found his attention fixed in her, his eyes dark and focused. He leaned forward and her pulse ticked up, rapidly keeping time with the pinging rain outside. Something wet and leathery caressed the bare side of Marion's neck and she jolted, cringing from the slobber that yet remained from her horse's affectionate kiss. Shenna! She scolded, the gate digging into her back as she pressed herself away from Cormac. He released both her and the gate, stepping back into the dimness. Shock covered his features and he ran a hand over his face. He walked away from her and Marion watched him leave with regret. 
Stupid horse. She turned and ran a hand from Shenna's innocent eyes down to her muzzle. Not stupid, she corrected in a whisper so quiet it was almost silent, but awful timing. The magic held in that moment had now dispelled, and Marion could see the handsome man returning to her. He held out a cloth rag, and she took it to wipe off her wet neck. Thank ye. Cormac kept his expression plain, but his gaze could not seem to meet hers. He watched Shenna, and Marion shook herself from her clouded stupor. What had she been thinking? What if she'd kissed Cormac, but then went on to marry Ian? She was not like Jenny, nor the others. She was different. She could not allow herself to love Cormac or any man. Not yet. Not until he was hers. Cormac's green eyes lifted, and he looked at her regretfully. He turned his attention back on her horse. You're a good protector, Shinna. I value that you're looking after your lady. He bowed to the mare with deference. Marion laughed, and tension eased from her shoulders. She shared a smile with Cormac and could not help the bud of hope blooming inside her, the desire she felt that this man would win the games. I dinna think the rain is bound to slow at all, he said. Nay, it pounded around them harder still, and Marion sighed. She stepped away from Shenna and did her best to smile at Cormac to prove that she was not affected by what had just occurred between them, as much to herself as to him. She ran a final hand over Shenna's neck. Oh, the thing she could not have. Chapter 17 He watched from the shadows, hidden as he was from sight by the emptiness of the corner stall. The rain had snuffed out most of the sunlight, and the torches were too weak and too far from where he waited to throw their light over his form. He was adequately hidden, though he needn't have worried. Marion and Cormac had been so taken with each other they had not even noticed his entrance through the back door of the stables. Which was telling, given that he wasn't a small man. He was used to standing out. The hay-strewn ground had muffled his hurried steps and he hunkered low beside the gate, hidden among the barrels of feet and cacophony of horses braying and rain pounding the earth. He watched Cormac and Marion, displeasure tightening his chest. It mattered not if she cared for this man, surely. McCune would make the final decision and it wouldn't be Cormac. His pride was wounded though. He slid deeper into the shadows, waiting for them to leave him in the building alone. The rain fell, muffling Marion and Cormac's splashing steps out of the stables and toward the castle. He waited until they were gone before lifting a brush from the hook on the wall and crossing the room toward Thunder. He rubbed down the horse's side and the animal nickered. Satisfaction pulsed through him. He had always liked to break the wild ones. They would eventually succumb to his commands and believe him the master. Surely the games would be no different. Any situation could be manipulated to provide the outcome he desired. Kilgannon was proof of this. All he had to do was mention it to McEwen, and the chief provided them money to dig them out of the hole the cards had made. Though... By the look of what he had come upon a moment ago in the stables, Marion had already been manipulated to believe she could have feelings for Cormac. Her father would have a different idea of what made a good chief, though. McEwen wanted a Jacobite, someone who would carry on his work and further their important cause. He drew in a musty breath and exhaled through his nose. He'd always been against McEwen's obsession with the Jacobites for obvious reasons, they would never win. All would be lost, their money and homes and dignity, surely, once they were discovered as traitors. But he did not need to fight for the young pretender. He only needed McEwen to believe that Kilgan and McEwen's were true Jacobites. Not that he was avidly against putting James back on the throne. Years ago it was certainly a valid fight. But now McEwen was clinging to ideals that were not reasonable for this modern age. Where were their men? Their firepower? Where was their bloody prince who was determined to retake his father's rightful throne? Gone, across the ocean, allowing others to fight his battles for him. 
He spat on the ground. He refused to give his life for a cause that was destined to fail. It was not difficult to discern McEwen's strong political leanings or the way he still supported the Jacobite cause. And he intended to use this information to remove Cormac from the competition altogether. Chapter 18 Cormac rose with the sun and slid from his warm bed, the frigid air driving tingling chills down his skin. He would almost believe Marion's spectre to have passed over him for the cold that met his bare legs, but the chill did not recede. It only grew colder as he crossed to the window. He looked out over the rolling, rising hills leading into Glen Ellen and the forest stretching to the side away from view. Orange light inched up from the horizon, melding with the pale blue of the sky above and bleeding down over the loch, the water mirroring the burning orange as though fire poured from the banks on the far side. No movement on the ground below marred the view, and Cormac decided from the abandoned grass in the early hours that it was a good time for him to practice tossing the caber a few more times before the games began later that day. He hadn't done terribly in his attempts to throw the caber thus far, but he hadn't performed especially well either. Kieran had given him a few pointers during his practice the day before, though it had lightly rained on them. Cormac hoped that the clear sky today meant his aim would prove truer than it did yesterday. He wanted to toss the caber with precision to prove to McEwen he was still worthy of consideration. And, more than that to prove to Marion he intended to fight for the honour of becoming her husband. Marion had remained distant from him since their near kiss a few days before, and Cormac didn't know if he should be angry with Shenna or grateful she interrupted them. He'd never before wished to kiss a lass so deeply, but their situation was unique. He was not the only man vying for her hand, and that complicated things. It did not matter if Marion returned his feelings, which he imagined she did, from the way she had looked up at him with hooded eyes and parted lips while they were in the stables, if McEwen did not choose Cormac as his successor. Furthermore, Cormac needed to ask himself if the role of chief was something he truly wanted, if it was something he believed himself capable of succeeding at. He had yet to return Elin to her happier self, to provide a safe life that allowed her to smile freely again. If he could not accomplish so simple a task as that for the person he loved most on this earth, how could he provide for and protect an entire clan? Cormac shook himself and stretched, raising his arms high above his head and turning to retrieve his plaid. A column of light lining the doorway caught his eye and he froze, his gaze catching on the door. It was open. Cormac swallowed. Unease tightened his muscles and he turned to do a quick sweep of the room. He was alone, which was a blessed thing, for he was standing in nothing but his long shirt and stockings. He picked up the dirk that was resting on his trunk and crossed to the open door. He wouldn't usually be this cautious, but he had a bad feeling about the state of his door. He was always careful to secure the bolt and pull the string in, so no one should have been able to open the door from the outside once he was asleep. Or had he been careless last night? He'd remained out longer than he usually did, sitting at a table in the great hall and listening to the men tell stories that were likely more fabrication than truth. Truly, no man of Cormac's acquaintance had even seen a Kelpie, yet the chief claimed his horse bore that magic. Cormac had laughed when he heard the tale, but perhaps he was wrong to dismiss the notion so fully. He was beginning to believe in the magic of fairies after spending so much time in Marion's company, that was certain. Cormac reached for the iron handle and tugged, but the door was oddly heavy. He looked to the hinges, but nothing appeared wrong. He glanced up and noticed a rock sitting on top of the door, resting between the wall and the door above him, as though it floated in the hand-width gap. He stopped tugging at the door before the rock could fall from its carefully placed perch. Cold fear ran through him, prickling his insides until he shivered. He shook himself into action. 
He needed to remove the rock before anyone awoke and walked past his door, but he didn't want it to fall and alert the entire castle to its presence. He glanced around his room for something to use. His trunk? No, he could not guarantee the rock would fall into so narrow a space. He looked up at the bed. That was it, the blankets. Cormac made quick work of removing the blankets and pillows from his bed and forming a nest-like area on the floor beside the door. He sucked in a quiet breath, hoping it would go according to plan, and pulled the door open while sliding the nest into the open area with his toe. The rock fell from its perch like a wingless bird and plopped onto the blankets before bouncing off and rolling across the floor. Its heavy thud was cushioned adequately to his relief. It would likely not have been heard from any nearby bedchambers, and if Marion was correct and McEwen's study was situated below him, then it was likely empty so early in the morning. Cormac gathered the blankets and pillows from the floor and tossed them onto his bed. He pushed the door closed and latched it. His fingers froze near the hole. The string had not been pulled through toward the interior of the room. Anyone walking past could have tugged the string and let themselves in which presented the question, had he forgotten to pull the string through or had someone managed to retrieve the string through the hole while Cormac had been asleep? His stomach felt as heavy as the rock nestled on his floor. He shifted on his feet and moved away from the door, considering the situation while he laid out his plaid and proceeded to fashion his kilt around his waist. The rock taunted him, standing out in his simple chamber with its rough edges on the navy rug. The last thing Cormac needed at this precarious point in the games was to be caught with a large rock and questioned about its purpose in his room. He didn't wish to point fingers, particularly when he was unaware where he ought to point them. Until he was certain he knew who it was that wanted to hurt him, to potentially end his life, he would keep quiet about the rock and keep it hidden until he could take it outside. He lifted it from the rug and deposited it at the bottom of his trunk, using his things to cover it. It was just larger than his head, and he could not imagine the damage it would have done had it fallen upon him. He closed the lid of the trunk with a little satisfaction. Having successfully removed the rock from its resting place and hidden it away, he could now watch the men and women. Marion had proved by her scheming earlier that women could not be discounted. Around him, for any indication, they were surprised to find him unharmed. Surely whoever had attempted to hurt him this way would be confused or frustrated by his healthy existence. Cormac let himself from the room and down the corridor toward Elan's chamber. The careful rigging of the rock proved unequivocally that someone had intended to harm him and they had no qualms about the malintention of their act being discovered. Surely the rock would have made a loud noise after hitting him and the surrounding bedchambers would have become aware. No one could have explained the purpose of a large rock in the corridor or the dead man from the impact. Whoever it was wanted him severely injured or worse. Elin's door was closed, but not locked, and he let himself in, grateful and frustrated in equal measure to find the room empty and Elin missing. She'd never been one for bothering with chaperones or informing Cormac of her destinations. In Gilmuir, he'd often find their house empty and discover her hours later returning from a lengthy ramble. But her habit of unaccompanied walks had landed her in a spot of trouble with Gregor, had she not learned her lesson then? Cormac would be less inclined to worry if not for Simon's unsavoury presence in the castle and the very point that someone had possibly just tried to kill him. His body was antsy with the need to discuss the situation with someone. No, not someone. He wanted to speak to Marion and learn her opinions of it. But he couldn't very well barge into her chamber while she slept, especially not when she shared a room with Isabel. He closed Elin's door and took himself down the stairs, his breathing staggered and strange. The kitchens were bustling with the maid's preparation for the morning meal, but Cormac slipped through the room and outside before he could be waylaid. Surely Elin was somewhere near. He wanted to assure himself she was safe. If nothing else, he knew his sister was handy with a knife, though he didn't like the idea of her needing to defend herself. Cormac had positioned himself before the caber, 
and leaned to pick it up when the sound of women's laughter lifted on the breeze, catching his attention. He rose immediately and followed the sound until he found Elin gathering eggs with Isabel. Relief slid down his body, loosening the tense muscles bunched within him. He could not help but notice he would have found Marion alone had he knocked on her bedroom door. What is it? Elin asked, setting an egg gently in Isabel's basket. You look like you've seen a spirit. He nearly could have. He had almost become a spirit himself. If the rock had hit its mark, Cormac could have haunted the great halls of Morag, terrorising the person who killed him and keeping watch over his sister. He was rather grateful that wasn't the case. I went to your room this morning and you were no there. I didn't like finding you missing. Elin hitched an eyebrow. Are ye to be my father now too? Protective brother is na enough for ye any longer. She spoke with a playful edge, but Cormac could still detect the bite in her words. He had never meant to be an overwhelming presence in her life, and the snarky response caught him by surprise. He'd only intended to make certain she knew she was safe and loved, that she had someone watching out for her. But Cormac could see from the set of her shoulders and the lift of her chin that his independent sister would only draw further away from him if he didn't recede first. He needed to tread carefully before Elin slipped further out of reach. He nodded once. I'll be tossing the caber if you have need of me. Elin huffed quietly. She cleared her throat. I will be helping Isabel alter her gown for the wedding. Cormac bowed to them both, and Isabel shot him an apologetic smile. He returned it in order to reassure her. The women had been laughing before he came upon them, and he had ruined their mirth by turning Elin's mood sour. He only hoped his sister would one day see his attention in the way it was intended. Cormac watched the women walk back toward Morag. The wind picked up, blowing through his hair and whipping past his ears. He didn't allow himself to consider how this might affect his caber throws later in the day, and instead walked to the water's edge. The sky's orange had dimmed to dark yellow, still reflecting over the loch and stretching around the banks near Dulnain. The house across the loch was motionless, squat and orderly in its square exterior and evenly positioned windows. It was a stark contrast to the massive castle behind him with its imposing grey exterior and the rugged landscape surrounding it. It would be a useful thing to have an ally so close and a danger for an enemy to be in such a position. Would the inhabitants of Morag feel the need to watch over their shoulders less if they were peaceful with the Duncans who lived at Dulnain? Furthermore, would McEwen expect Cormac to mend the feud if he was chosen as the victor of the games? Cormac had been told Miles Duncan wanted peace. Perhaps the McEwens needed only to extend the offer to negotiate again. He could recommend a plan to McEwen, and perhaps that would help make up for his lack of success at the hunt and the sheaf toss. If it allowed McEwen to view him as a reasonable choice once again, it would be worth it. It was risky to approach the chief with an idea on how he should proceed with his own affairs, but Cormac needed to do something to set himself apart. He only hoped it would not miss the mark. Chapter 19 Alexander McEwen left his sleeping wife abed and pulled on his trues, dressing quickly in order to attend to his business before the rest of the castle awoke. He'd heard a muffled thud on the floor above him earlier, so he knew he was not the only soul rising with the sun. Hope had peaked its glorious head from the burrows when a letter arrived yesterday at the fairy tree, warning cryptically they were closer than ever to receiving their king on Scottish soil. Surely that meant funding had come through, that the money McEwen had been gathering over the last few years would soon be put to use. Things were moving forward at Morag, albeit slowly, Ian had recruited Hugh to their cause, something that had been a long time in the making. Hugh's loyalty to the clan aided him in agreeing to help without hesitation, and McEwen counted on the rest of his men acting in a similar manner. Now it would not matter that Blue Bonnet had been opening and reading some of their correspondence, a fact that irritated McEwen, yet he could understand. 
With Hugh among their ranks, McEwen no longer needed a man to go between them and Edinburgh. He could cut Blue Bonnet out completely. McEwen closed the bedroom door behind him and sat at his desk in the study. After pulling out the necessary implements to draft a letter, he turned to watch the sunrise as he determined how best to phrase it. He would like to have gone down to Edinburgh and spoken to Henry himself, but there was no time, not with the games and Brian in residence. It would be foolish of him to leave his castle while his brother was near. The man was far too desperate lately and in need of money. There was no telling what he would steal or contrive to get what he wanted. Their history and McEwen's many missing trinkets after Brian's visits had proven just how dangerous he could be when he was low on funds. McEwen tapped the end of his quill against the desk. He could not leave Moreg until he was taking Brian with him to fight, but he could bring Henry here. He wrote out an invitation to attend Isabel and Kieran's wedding celebration. Henry would have known Kieran's father, though it might be better if he pretended to be passing through and was invited to remain. Henry was too involved with the Jacobite efforts to go unnoticed, and his presence at Moreg, if the Black Watch heard of it, would mean McEwen's secret political endeavours would be a secret no longer. If he was going to sacrifice his life and his men, he would not do so until he was fully informed of the Bonnie Prince's arrival date and the military plan. A light knock sounded at the door and it opened. Hugh looked inside and McEwen waved him forward. Come, sit. Hugh obeyed. Did you hear anything last night? Your brother didna stay in the hall for long. Simon did, but he wasna speaking much. He didna seem happy. McEwen signed his name with a flourish and set down his pen. Nay, he wouldna be. He hasna liked being on equal footing with Ian or Cormac. He will win the caber today, I am sure, and then he will cease moping. One can only hope. I need you to run this letter to Edinburgh. Can I trust you? Hugh's eyes widened, but he immediately nodded. Aye, you can trust me. I thought so. Hugh seemed to hesitate, his gaze flicking between the orange glow of the sunrise and McEwen. Do you no wish to use Blue Bonnet any longer? No, if we have another option. I can't be sure he has our best interest in mind. I dinna trust him. He does not trust ye either, or he would not be afraid of coming to Moreg. Aye, McEwen said, appraising Hugh with approval. Blue Bonnet didn't trust McEwen either, but they each had something the other could use, and that had formed their ill-suited bond. McEwen sighed and ran a hand over his face. We canna announce our intent to join the cause until we have confirmation of the Bonnie Prince's impending arrival. You dunna trust the men? McEwen glanced up sharply. I trust McEwen's, aye. But many of our men had fathers die at Glen Shiel or hanged for treason. I canna ask them to join until I am certain. Once we ken the prince is truly coming, we will do what we must to secure the forces. When word reaches Brillug and the Redcoats that we're Jacobites, they'll be here to investigate. Do they know already, can it? Aye, it isn't a secret that I fought in 19. Why do you think the Redcoats followed Kieran here last month? To watch ye? Aye. He rubbed a hand over his grey beard. I will not be taken so close to my time to fight. Nay, I did not wait so long for that. His rightful king deserved better than that. Ian told me reports of unrest near the southern border came in. McEwen swallowed his displeasure. He didn't like the idea of his information being passed from one man to the next. Bringing Hugh into their confidence was difficult for him, but he understood the importance of doing so. He suppressed his irritation, thinking instead of the Jacobite rosters littered with markings of deceased. They need more men. Too many who were once loyal to the cause have now grown old or died. What can we do? McEwen folded and sealed the missive. He tapped it lightly. You can take this to Edinburgh. I could return swiftly if I could pass down through Duncan lands. 
you had better no do so until we have mended the strife. Do you have a plan for that? Aye, McEwen said, though he didn't yet know how to accomplish it. He knew he needed to speak to the Duncan chief, but not how to fix the feud. Once his people were friendly with the Duncans again, it would make journeys to Edinburgh much quicker. When Miles had mentioned he was not free to marry, he ruined McEwen's only plans. He lifted the letter and tapped the corner on the desk. The very reason he wanted peace was for access to the road down to Edinburgh. He wanted to facilitate a relationship that would make it possible to call on the Duncans to join the fight. If he could bring two clans to battle, he would find that effort sufficient. He need only convince the Duncans that the Jacobites stood on the winning side. More than that, when it became necessary to mobilise his troops, time would be essential. Every minute they spared would get them farther from the Redcoats and closer to their own men. Finding a way to have the Duncans on their side was a priority, and McEwen hated that he was at a loss for how to accomplish it. You need to take a man wi' ye, McEwen said. He rubbed his beard, but Ian canna go now that he's competing. I can take young Rupert wi' me. Rory, leave Rupert and take Rory. McEwen trusted them both, but Rory was stronger and more capable of defence. With two of his men travelling alone, McEwen needed to send someone who could adequately defend them both. Though he could not deny that young Rupert's improvement over the previous few months was impressive. Kieran was a blessed man for taking on such a chore, and McEwen would have been glad to have the man compete for the role of next chief if it had been possible. McEwen was antsy for the impending battles that could very well sit around the corner from them, for he'd waited so long to reinstate a Stuart on the throne. He only hoped he lived through the battles to see it done. If he did not survive, though, it would be imperative that he made his choice for Marion's husband prior to the battles, which, given the letter he received, sounded as though it could be much sooner than he'd anticipated. He was no closer to choosing his replacement since the games began, and at the rate they were going he would not be ready to select a man in time. He needed to quicken the process. Today was to be the caber toss, then the foot race, and perhaps the stone put. He told Catherine he had all the time in the world, and at the time he'd believed that to be so, but he was wrong to be so lackadaisical in his approach. He needed to continue to test the men in more ways than strength, to watch how they approached the battle for the title of chief. A knock sounded on the door, and Hugh looked at him swiftly. Enter, McEwen called, careful not to yell loud enough to wake his wife. The door opened and Cormac stood in the space, his gaze determined, his mouth set in a grim line. Ah, McEwen said, leaning back and folding his hands beneath his chest. Exactly who I was hoping to see. When Cormac heard the voices within McEwen's study, he nearly took himself up to his bedchamber and listened through Marion's eavesdropping hole in the floor. But that would not further him in the eyes of the chief at all, so he suppressed the temptation and knocked instead. He did not judge Marion's choices in eavesdropping, especially when she was unable to receive the information in a straightforward manner. But Cormac had the ability to hold conversations with the chief and felt he would be given a fair amount of information if he proved himself trustworthy. That was something McEwen would likely never allow his daughter. Hugh stood and nodded once to McEwen before he moved toward the doorway and out into the corridor. He closed the door behind him. I didn't ken if I would find ye awake, Cormac said, lowering himself onto the chair Hugh had vacated. The wooden seat was still warm. I can asleep much of late, to be truthful. There is far too much in my mind for that. Aye. It is difficult to go anywhere within Moreg's walls and not hear of the strife between the clans or the havoc the Redcoats are wreaking in Brilug. McEwen swore. You didn't come here to talk of that, I hope. I did, Cormac said. Nerves fluttered in his belly and he hoped he did not appear as anxious as he felt. If he approached this the wrong way, would McEwen find him an interloper? someone who believed he knew better than the chief. Oh? 
McEwen's thick eyebrows rose. I have been thinking on the feud. I wondered if ye invited the Duncans to the feast to celebrate Isabel and Kieran's wedding. If they would see your willingness to trust them and open the conversation about reconciliation once again. If nothing else, surely they would be willing to discuss what could be done. McEwen nodded slowly. We did that already, and they did not leave here on good terms. The following morning saw a duel in our land, and the Duncans did not come out victorious. That is no something they are likely to forget so easily. He didn't appear to agree with Cormac's plan, but his face was thoughtful. That must be a good sign. I've been told of the feast and the duel. Who was invited? Miles Duncan. He is the laird of Dalnain, and he brought some of his men. He laughed softly, and his mother. Cormac mulled this over. It sounded as though inviting Miles was not enough. Perhaps that was the case. Miles might not have the power to affect the magnitude of change McEwen was hoping for. Have ye considered not just inviting the people of Dalnain, but also their chief? McEwen's eyebrows rose. He watched Cormac through contemplative eyes, his fingers curling around the arms of his chair. Ye may have the makings of a chief yet, Cormac. Pride swelled within his chest, but Cormac did his best to appear unaffected by the praise. He didn't wish to lower himself in McEwen's esteem directly after he was raised in it. I invited Ivor Duncan, the clan chief, to discuss possibilities for dissolving the discord between our clans. He will arrive next month. Too late for the wedding, I fear. Though I do like to conduct business during events, it brings far less attention to them. He paused, thoughtful, though I have yet to determine how that will end the feud or what I might suggest to him. If ye invite Miles Duncan to the wedding feast, perhaps he will be able to prepare ye for receiving his chief better. He can tell ye what to expect. And we'd be better prepared to meet with Ivor. The man is Miles' brother-in-law after all. McEwen rubbed his jaw. Well done, Cormac. I see your father's tactical tendencies in ye, just as I'd hoped. Cormac froze. All he'd known of his father was the man's affinity for farming. His father had been a logical man and quite brilliant. Cormac had always thought so. But he was unfamiliar with his father's military prowess. The compliment had the effect of puffing his chest and driving grief into his heart simultaneously. It was difficult to reconcile the man McEwen knew with the father Cormac had, but equally easy to believe. Forgive me for asking, but how do you ken my father so well, when we lived such a great distance away? Did he never tell you? McEwen waited a moment, but when Cormac shook his head, he proceeded. I gave him the land he farmed, after we fought side by side at Glenshiel, I kenned I needed a man like your father on my side. Cormac could believe such a thing. His father had always been a good man, called upon by neighbours and friends who found themselves in need of trusted assistance. He was the man Cormac aspired to become. When his father had become sick and could no longer work the fields, Cormac had taken over his burdens one at a time, though it had been difficult to convince his father it was necessary. That life, while important at one time, had never given Cormac pleasure or happiness. His spirit was lifted and rejuvenated by the bustling atmosphere of Moreg, by the brotherhood among the men, and how quickly they had allowed Cormac into their fold by the deeply rooted feeling of belonging. Cormac loved people and he loved Moreg, and he loved the woman whose hand he was fighting for. His heart stuttered and he shook himself. Now was not the time to dwell on that revelation. McEwen watched him closely, and he knew he needed to be on guard at all times around this man. He was under review. Then our tenancy was not given to us from my grandfather. Nay, why do you think you had the biggest plot in the area? I wanted your father to be my tax man, but he didn't want to live so far from your mother's family. He settled for a tenancy near the southern border of our territory, and it served its own purpose well enough. Served its purpose? A purpose somehow wrapped into father's yearly visits to Moreg, undoubtedly. 
"'Tis why he came to see you every year. McEwen's steely eyes were calculating, as though he was deciding whether or not to trust Cormac. It pinned him to his seat and the air grew thick. When the chief spoke, his voice was deep and measured. Your father and I had similar ideals. He kept me abreast of the state of the people down south, and I did the same for him regarding the information I was privy to. Then father was a spy for the chief. The thought turned sour. He would inform on his own friends, his neighbours. Your father promised to return to my side and fight should the need arise, McEwen continued. Tell me, Cormac, would you do the same? Fight? Would he? Cormac held McEwen's gaze and considered the question. It would depend entirely on what they were fighting for, but he could not allow McEwen to believe his fealty was in question or he would jeopardise his potential with Marion. If it came down to protecting Marion and Elin, Cormac would be on the front lines without hesitation. He sat up. I would fight for my people and to protect those I love. A slow smile spread over McEwen's face and he nodded slowly. I think I have not taken your measure properly yet, Cormac. I'm eager to see your display in the caber toss later today. I am ready, sir. Cormac rose to leave, understanding the signal that their conversation was at an end. Cormac? He stopped at the door and turned to face the chief. Yes? You might want to prepare for the gilly Callum. We will be doing that tonight. Sword dancing, Cormac smiled. Now this was something he had experience in. Before I forget, be on the lookout for decent rocks for the stone put. Cormac's stomach clenched. Rocks exactly like the one that had been placed above his door last night. Aye, I will see to it. Have ye asked anyone else to look for them? Aye, Hugh. Hugh, the man standing on the other side of the door now. He was clearly close to McEwen, for they'd been speaking alone when Cormac arrived, but he was also close to Simon. Could they have been in league with one another to harm Cormac? Hugh hadn't appeared surprised to find Cormac alive when he'd knocked on the door, but his attention had admittedly been on the chief. Cormac let himself from the room, grateful to find Hugh absent from his usual place outside of McEwen's door. He'd begun to think of Hugh as a friend, as part of the Brotherhood, who had openly welcomed him into their ranks. Could he truly have miscalculated their relationship so badly? If that was the case for Hugh, what if Kieran, Rory or Rupert, or even Ian, his rival for Marion's hand? Cormac thought of the rock perilously perched to end his life, and he straightened his shoulders. He might have miscalculated, but he would do so no longer. He would need to warn his sister. Chapter 20 The number of Morag's inhabitants was great, and that meant a decent crowd had formed for each of the games. Marion stood at the top of the rise near the castle and waited for Cormac to come down from the glen, where he'd been practising for the competition. Kieran had carried the caber from the glen minutes before, so Cormac should not be too long behind him, surely. She watched eagerly, waiting near the castle wall, and hoped she appeared more patient than she felt. She hadn't been able to meet with Cormac alone since the near kiss in the stables, and she had not been able to extricate him from her head. Her feelings undoubtedly ran deeper than she'd allowed herself to admit before now, which was terrifying. Cormac came into view, and Marion's heart kicked into a gallop. He glanced up and noticed her, his eyebrows smoothing out and the concentration slipping from his features. She gave him a tentative smile, her nerves pulsing and causing her fingers to shake. It was an altogether odd feeling for her, for Marion was not known for her timidity. When Cormac reached her, she stepped forward and lowered her voice. They were alone, as most everyone else had already gathered below them on the stretch of lawn, mingling in this rare break away from their duties. I wanted to ask if ye had any ideas for our plan. Anything we might do to help prove that Simon isn't meant to lead. This is a good opportunity. 
while the whole of Moreg is gathered in one place. He turned and surveyed the gathering, the people grouped around a large clearing. Kieran stood in the middle now, creating the line for the men to stand behind when they threw the caber. His eyes narrowed and he looked to the loch. It seems odd to allow everyone to gather in plain sight before Moreg. Has your father considered how dangerous this could be? Marion scoffed lightly. He considers everything. She looked at the gathering and noted the tactical error Cormac had pointed out. But I do wonder if it is less a concern for him because of the lack of attacks we've had of late. Perhaps, or this accounts for his unwillingness to provide a schedule for the games. If no one kens when the game will happen, they can plan an attack. That would certainly explain her father's behaviour. Marion stepped closer, breathing in Cormac's scent and wishing she could reach out and take his hand. What of Simon? Cormac looked down into her eyes, his green ones sparkling in the sunlight. I had an idea, but this is far too public for such a discussion. Anyone could leave the castle for the games and walk directly past us. If someone left the castle, we would likely see them, she argued. True. He smiled briefly in acquiescence and lowered his voice, a serious demeanour slipping over his features. There was a situation this morning that I need to discuss with you later. I've yet to determine who it was that wished to harm me. Harm you? Marion clutched his forearm. But I can only imagine it was Simon. He looked away as though unsure of himself, but his forearm clenched beneath her grip. She dropped her hand, aware that the crowd below could see them now and the conclusions they would gather from such an image. You're unsure? It could have been someone else. Perhaps. I have a reason to believe it could have been another man, but I cannot deny Simon as the obvious person who would want me dead. Dead? Marion fought for breath, her chest rising and falling in shallow spurts, her fingers dug into her skirt, clenching tightly to keep them at her sides. It was upsetting how easily she could believe her cousin capable of such nefarious intent. Cormac's hand reached up as though he meant to comfort her, but he pulled it away. They were in much too public a location for such tender condolences. If I can prove it was Simon who tried to have me hurt, would that no be enough to prove to your father Simon is unfit to lead the clan? Would it? She believed so, and it would be far easier to accomplish than any plan marrying could contrive. Aye, I canna think my father would look kindly on murder, even if it is only attempted. This is not a war. Ye are no the opposition here. His lips tipped into a warm, endearing smile. When it comes to ye, Marion, I am certainly the opposition. Warmth bled up into her cheeks and she glanced down at the marshy grass below their feet. You need to be in place. They'll be starting soon. She lifted her gaze. I wish I had something to give you for good fortune. If my fairies returned to the tree, I could ask them for help. Dinna fash, lass. I have luck. He tapped the blue ribbon tied beneath his kilt pin on his shoulder. I have ye with me during every game. She sucked in a quiet breath of surprise. The ribbon was dark and blended with his tartan, so she hadn't noticed it this morning. He seemed to misjudge her silence for hesitance. I will return it to ye if you wish. Marion shook her head. She liked that he wore a token from her, that he would carry a piece of her while he competed for her hand, even if it was mistaken for something else originally. Surely Cormac hadn't known it was hers when he originally found it. She brushed over the smooth satin of the ribbon with her fingertips. It is yours, Cormac McEwen. Now be off with you and win that game. He nodded and stepped backwards, walking a few steps away and holding her gaze before he turned and lopped down the rest of the hill toward the gathering. Marion stayed behind, watching him leave as she caught her breath. She glanced to the people waiting to begin the caber toss and found Simon glowering at her. His anger was like a force of dark magic, piercing her cocoon of warmth and deflating it until it shriveled. 
Her body instinctively took a step back, but she did not lower her chin. She flicked her gaze away dismissively and walked down toward the crowd. He could not control her and she would not allow him to know how deeply he frightened her. The crowd was called to order and Father moved to the centre of the field. He announced the rules of the caber toss, that each man was to lift the enormous smooth-down log and flip it. The caber that landed the straightest would win. A competition designed to celebrate accuracy more than strength, though physical ability certainly played a large role in each man's success. Marion slipped through the crowd to stand beside Isabel and Elin. Father had removed to his place at the edge of the people, opposite where she stood now. Ian heaved the caber up into the air and walked toward the throw line while he found a way to balance the enormous log horizontally. Do you have a favourite? Isabel asked quietly. Yes, Marion had a favourite contender, but she would not tempt fate by speaking his name aloud. It does not matter much, does it? Isabel's sorrow was deeply rooted in a connection they once shared before she found a way to marry Kieran. She took Marion's hand and squeezed softly. Isabel said nothing, but she supported Marion in her own quiet way, in a language they spoke fluently. Her empathy reached Marion's heart and embraced her, healing the cocoon Simon had destroyed minutes before. Kieran stood near the grouped contenders with old Rupert, his arms crossed over his broad chest. They watched Ian toss the caber end over end until it landed flat on the ground. Then Kieran and Rupert took stones to mark the caber's location before removing it for the next man. Decent throw, someone said behind them. Ian took his place beside Cormac and Simon again and seeing the men together tightened Marion's gut. She couldn't focus well. Cormac's words repeated in her mind on a loop that someone, Simon most likely, had tried to hurt him, had tried to kill him. The stakes of the games had grown too costly for her liking. Are you unwell, Mary? Isabel asked, leaning close and lowering her voice. Marion tore her gaze away from the contenders and realised her body had been swaying, her vision blurry. Had she stood too straight-legged for too long? Mother had taught her not to keep her legs straight when standing for long periods of time or it would make her grow faint. Marion was being careless in her concern. She was worried, not ill. Nay, I'm no unwell, merely distracted. Isabel saw through her dismissal is it the games that are bothering ye? Indeed, the games were wearing on her and they had hardly finished more than two competitions thus far. How long did Father intend to draw them out? If Cormac's safety was in jeopardy, they could not go on for much longer. Aye, she said. I will be glad when they are finished. Isabel remained quiet, but drew her arm around Marion's waist and embraced her. Cheers drew up around them and Simon retrieved the caber to take his turn. He lifted it into the air effortlessly and threw it in a manner that looked exactly like Ian. Their tosses were indistinguishable from where Marion stood. Cormac moved to take his turn once Simon's markers were placed and Marion looked to Elin. She stood silently on the other side of Isabel, her face a mask of stone. It was unclear if she was concerned for her brother or pleased, if she was glad to watch him compete or completely put out. The woman did not show her hand easily. Cormac balanced the caber and stepped forward before launching it into the air. To Marion's eye, the three men completed identical throws and their cabers landed quite close to one another. How Kieran and Rupert were meant to gauge accuracy and choose a winner from the markers they had placed was beyond her comprehension. The contenders stepped back and stood in a line while Kieran and Rupert looked to each marker on the grass and conferred quietly together. The crowd was abuzz with quiet conversation, watching the men analyse each throw. Kieran nodded to something Rupert said and they both lifted their gazes toward Father. He dipped his head in approval and Kieran stepped forward and whistled loudly to gather everyone's attention. Rupert shouted, it was vera close, but the straightest caber was thrown by Cormac. Cheers and shouts went up around Marion, lifting the sounds along with her heart. Cormac's gaze sought hers immediately, a pleased expression lighting his bright eyes. 
she had not interfered with the games, and as a result, he had won. He was likely thinking he could have stood a chance of winning either of the other competitions had she not interfered in those, and she silently agreed. The crowd moved forward, filling in the empty space on the field between them, and Cormac was lost to her sight. She stepped back to allow others to pass, and Elin stepped back with her. Isabel squeezed her hand once more, but she was clearly distracted while searching for Kieran. You may go, Marion said. Isabel glanced up guiltily. You dinna want to come with me? Nay, you go on. Isabel slipped free and threw the groupings of people toward her soon-to-be husband. Marion leaned toward Elin. You dinna wish to congratulate your brother? She laughed, though the sound held little mirth. I'm not sure he needs to be congratulated. Condolences, perhaps. Marion shot her a wry smile. I will na be offended by that. Elin's green eyes flicked to her swiftly. Och, it has naething to do with ye. She scrunched her nose. I dinna wish for him to become chief. That was a minor relief that Elin did not harbour ill feelings towards Marion. Did Cormac know his sister felt this way? Why no? The crowd had thinned around them and Marion could see Cormac in conversation with Ian and young Rupert on the far end of the field. Elin watched him with evident affection, the hard-fought walls over her emotions cracking and crumbling when she looked at him. Elin was a tough woman, but Cormac was certainly a weakness of hers. The love between the siblings was evidence they were the only family each of them had yet remaining on earth. Marion had never had a brother or sister, and she was envious of the relationship between them. Isabel and Kieran had filled those roles in her life, and she was grateful for their friendship and affection, but she would never understand the relationship between Cormac and his sister. She hoped she never had to survive without her parents as they both had done. Elin breathed out a quiet sigh. It is selfish, really. If Cormac becomes chief, he will remain here always, and I will miss him if he does. Ye dinna wish to remain with him? There is room enough for yet more egg. She glanced up to the castle and shook her head. Nay, I have a life in Gilmure. I never intended to remain here forever. But you'll stay as long as your brother competes. Aye, I dinna like what he is doing, but I will always support him. Does he ken your plans? Nay, she smiled softly. I dunna wish to influence him. I want my brother to be happy. Was it fair that Marion felt inordinate relief at this admission? She didn't want Cormac to know either. If he realised that by marrying Marion he was sacrificing a life near his sister, would he remove himself from the competition? What do you plan to do in Gilmuir? Marion asked. Elin paused. She chewed in her lower lip, her eyes darting away as though she was determining whether or not she could trust Marion. She must have decided that she could, for she spoke deliberately. I have a friend who would take me in. Anna Lundy, Marion said, recalling the woman from her visit the year before. Elin's eyebrows lifted. Aye, the vera one. You'll ken why I miss her. Indeed. Anna was not at Morag for very long during her visit, but she was kind and entertaining. They had spent a few weeks together, and Marion liked her very much. She must be a dear friend if you wish to leave your brother to live with her. It is more than her friendship I miss. Elin softened her voice. I was learning her mother's craft before Cormac was summoned to Morag. I should like to complete my training. What sort of training? Marion? Mother said, coming to stop beside her, her hands folded gently before her. She gave Elin a soft nod of greeting before turning her attention back to her daughter. Your father wants you to play after dinner tonight. I didn't have anything prepared. Mother smiled indulgently. You'll be grand. Marion lifted an eyebrow. But I would be grander if I'd practised today. Then do so now. Mother said with equal spirit, You have time. Drat. She wasn't wrong. Marion smiled apologetically at Elin. I will see you tonight at dinner. Elin nodded and dipped her head in a curtsy to them both. Marion returned the curtsy, then walked toward the castle in step with her mother. Wind whipped her hair, threatening to steal it from its pins. 
A lock trailed over the back of her neck and tickled her skin, and she rubbed away the feeling while she picked careful steps through the boggy grass. Are you pleased with the games today? Mother asked. Marion knew that tone. She had heard it before whenever her mother had attempted to extract information from her. Madame McEwen was a graceful force to be reckoned with, blessed with a strength of will more secure than the walls of Moreg, but she could not hide her curiosity from her daughter. Aye, Marion said. It is clear that father has chosen three men of comparable talents. They have each been victorious once. I suppose that is something to note. I only thought ye would be pleased to see Cormac do well. Marion sought a neutral response. She didn't wish to keep her feelings from her mother, but if she admitted them, she was afraid that information would be accidentally passed on to her father. I am pleased whenever he or Ian outshine my cousin. Her mother tilted her head, lifting her dark eyebrows slightly. She did not appear as though she believed Marion's diplomatic answer to be entirely true. Marion tried to change the course of the conversation. Why does father wish for me to play tonight? I thought he wanted me to prepare a song for Isabel's wedding feast. You'll play then too, I'm sure. They had nearly reached the castle, the giant edifice blocking the wind and giving them some reprieve. There have been whispers regarding the men competing and who would make the best chief. This performance could be an attempt to redirect the conversations onto the men's merits as your husband. And who deserves to wed ye, Mary? Ye best wear your ruby gown tonight. Swathe herself in rich colours to remind the inhabitants of Moreg that she, too, was up for a prize. Her stomach flipped at the idea of being put on display and shown as an award. It was revolting. I will send my maid to help ye with your hair. Why? Marion asked quietly, pausing just before the door. It was bad enough her father wanted to use her this way, but her mother was complicit. Why must I parade myself in such a degrading way? Is it no enough that I am sacrificing for the clan? Mother's eyes could be as hard and unyielding as father's when she wanted them to, and Marion had tensed in expectation of such. But mother looked at her softly, and some of the fight drained out of Marion at the response. Dinna tell me you've lost hope yet, Mother said. I didna miss the way you were speaking with Cormac before the caber toss. Voices indicated a group of people approaching the castle, and Marion opened the door and held it for her mother. I cannot allow myself to hope, Mother. They moved inside and her mother stopped her, resting her hand against Marion's cheek and lowering her voice as the door closed, giving them a few more minutes of peace. Nay, Mary, you can afford not to hope. Her eyes were sad and lines formed between her dark eyebrows. When you're faced with trials and you dinna believe you will come through them victorious, hope is the guiding force that will help you put one foot before the other. Hope will lead you to the light. And if there is nae light to be led to, there's always light, love. You only need to ken where to look for it. She pulled Marion into an embrace. The door opened and the group that had been coming up the hill filed inside, their voices silencing upon entering the room. Mother released Marion and stepped back, smiling kindly to Mrs Christie and a handful of others. A good showing today, aye? I think my husband has a difficult choice ahead of him. The conversation broke out again. Mother had always been good at navigating uncomfortable social situations. She had the ability to put others at ease with her gentle smile and easy manner. It was a skill Marion wished she could learn, but knew was an innate part of who her mother was. The others walked on and Mother turned and gave Marion a piercing look. If ye have a preference, Mary, tell your father. He does love ye. It would serve no purpose. Mother's faith was sweet, but Father would always put the clan first. Always though perhaps that was the answer. Perhaps she could find a way to sway father toward Cormac, because he would be the best choice for the clan, never mind that she was falling for him. If father didn't learn of her feelings, then he might listen to what she had to say and not cast her off as a lovelorn lass. She needed time to think. Thank you, mother. I will give it some thought. The stairwell was cold and she trudged upstairs to her chamber to practice her clarsach. 
Her plan would mean distancing herself further from Cormac for the time being, so she would not give herself away. But surely he would understand if she explained it to him. When she reached the floor her bedchamber was on, Marion caught sight of a man slipping out of Cormac's room and froze. It wasn't Cormac. He closed the door behind himself quietly and tugged the string to set the bolt in place. Marion retreated a step and flattened herself against the wall inside the stairwell. He was clearly not supposed to be in there or he would not have gone to such great effort to close the door quietly. Her heart hammered, her pulse pounding in her ears and she closed her eyes to allow herself five seconds to feel the fear, apprehension and concern swirling within her. One, two, three, four, five... Marion's eyes flicked open and she walked from the stairwell as though she meant to go to her room, as though she had not stepped from the stairwell moments earlier and retreated to do the same again. She passed the man she'd known her whole life in the corridor. The caper toss was exciting today, eh? She asked, hoping her voice did not betray her unease. His smile was friendly, his motions natural, as though he had not slipped out of Cormac's bedchamber a moment before. Aye, that it was, Marion. She made it to her room and looked back over her shoulder to find him disappearing down the stairs. She bit her lip and fought the desire to chase after him. What had Ian been doing in Cormac's room? Chapter 21 the general merriment and rumble of delighted voices could be heard echoing down the corridors long before Cormac reached the entrance to the great hall. He stepped inside the room, his attention immediately arrested by Marion taking her seat at the head table. She was always effortlessly beautiful, but today she seemed to have taken extra care to stand out. Her deep red gown was striking against her pale skin. Her raven hair swept away from her face and piled high, a thick curl trailing around her neck. She hadn't yet noticed him and he could have stood in the shadows of the entrance forever and watched her quietly speak to her mother. A woman cleared her throat behind him and Cormac startled. He smiled and stepped aside to allow her to pass him in the doorway. When he looked back at the head table, he noticed Simon sitting beside McEwen, an empty chair on his other side. There was another empty seat beside Marion, and it occurred to Cormac that the competitors were sitting with the family tonight. It was likely only because of the planned sword dance, but they had not sat at that table since the initial feast, and Cormac was pleased for any opportunity to spend at Marion's side. Unless Ian reached her first and claimed the seat, Cormac set off across the room. He caught Simon's eye and the man's glower turned harder. He hadn't seemed the least bit surprised to find Cormac whole and well today, only angered by it. No one had appeared surprised. Whoever had gone to the trouble to balance the rock above his door had done a masterful job of hiding their emotions upon seeing him today unless that was what Simon was currently doing, openly remaining angry that Cormac walked unscathed. He passed the table where he would typically sit with Kieran, Isabel and Elin. Rory and Hugh still appeared to be missing. He patted his sister on the back as he walked by, then smiled when young Rupert took the seat beside her. She shot a look of suppressed irritation at Cormac, then leaned over and said something to Rupert. She was too kind and was bound to break the lad's heart. Ian entered the hall and Cormac quickened his steps toward the head table. He watched Ian come to the same conclusion as he did about where they were meant to sit. Had McEwen warned him about the gilly callum as well? Cormac slowed his steps as he rounded the table. Marion was even more breathtaking in close proximity. Her ruby earrings matched her gown as though they were drawn from the same dye and a striking pendant dangled at her throat. Good evening. She glanced up and her pale blue eyes pierced him. She looked relieved to find him there and Cormac wanted to reassure her. He'd yet to speak to her since mentioning he had been put in danger that morning. He bowed. Good evening, Madame McEwen. Marion's mother dipped her head. Good evening. I expect you're prepared for tonight. Aye, as prepared as I can be. She gestured to the vacant chair beside Marion. Please eat. 
The noise in the hall rose as women continued to carry food to the long tables, and clinking punctuated the air as plates and cups were filled and emptied again. Cormac took his seat beside Marion, but his appetite was lacking. He hadn't been able to remove the vulnerable feeling of knowing someone had opened his door while he'd been asleep. Mrs Christie and her daughter approached the table with bundles in their arms. Cormac watched the older woman kneel and unwrap her bundle, revealing gleaming, freshly polished swords. It took them only a few moments to set three pairs of swords on the stone floor before the head table. The metal scraped against the stone and the din in the room lowered as people took notice of the Christie women and what they were doing. The volume in the hall rose again with whispers of anticipation for the sword dance. The Christies took their seats at the table to eat and nodded a confirmation to those who were near. Father must have asked them to polish the swords for you, Marion said. I dunna think they looked so clean yesterday. Do you ken we were to dance this evening? Nay, but I am eager to see it. Her lips curved into a delicious smile and her eyes sparkled. Cormac dragged his fork around his plate, his stomach uneasy. He wasn't nervous to compete. His mind was too occupied with how he might determine if it was Simon who was planning his demise and the next way he would attempt to go about it. He didn't wish to give Marion more reason to worry, however. He dipped his head as if he meant to impart a secret. My skills are not what they once were, but I practised a wee bit before dinner and I think I can provide a decent showing. You practised? Marion asked, her fork suspended before her mouth. You kenned you would be dancing? Aye. She popped the bite in her mouth and chewed. Leaning toward him slightly, she lowered her voice. You've been listening then. Have you learned anything else? It took Cormac a moment to realise that Marion referred to eavesdropping through his floor into McEwen's study. She believed that he came by the information that way. Nay, lass, I have na done so. Your father told me about the gilly Callum himself. Why? I dunna ken, but he wished me warned. He also told me to look for good rocks for the stone put. Marion sat back until her shoulders were flush with the carved back of her chair and chewed on her lip. Why would he warn you unless he wished to give you an advantage? She looked at him and tilted her head to the side. Have you become his favourite? Cormac hoped that was the case, but how was he to know? McEwen had not revealed anything beyond those two hints about the next few games, and even then he might have done the same for the other two competitors. I have been trying to find ways to make myself appear a good choice to your father. Marion's warm blue gaze melted his reserve, and he faced her fully, uncaring if others noticed. Of the two men who might want him dead, Simon sat at the far end of their table, and Hugh was still absent from the room. Neither of them were paying him any mind now. Marion's expression grew serious, a soft line forming between her sleek eyebrows. We need to speak of what you said earlier, before the caber toss. Aye. Though he wanted to spare her the concern, he couldn't keep this from her, not when he needed her help and advice. If not now, when? He lowered his voice until it was nearly imperceptible. Can you meet me somewhere? Perhaps at dawn. I have noticed the castle is quiet so early in the morning. If you can sneak past the kitchen, you'll nae be caught. I can, she swallowed. The fairy tree. Aye. She'd known the place he had been considering. It was far enough away to give them privacy, yet near enough to remain a safe option. More than that, he was yet convinced it held some magic, and he could use all the help he could get. The air in the room grew thick with excitement. Plates were emptied and bellies filled when McEwen stood, his presence commanding the silence and attention from the room. He looked to where old Rupert sat beside Mrs Christie and the man stood and left the room. Now we have a treat for you all. McEwen swept his arm toward the swords laid out before his table. The gilly Callum. Old Rupert returned a moment later with his pipes and blew a note to the delight of the room. Marion slid her hand over on the table as though she meant to take Cormac's, but he rose along with Ian and Simon. He tapped the ribbon at his chest and hoped she knew what it meant to him. The warmth in her gaze said she did. 
The men circled the table and lined up behind the crossed swords lying on the floor, facing the chief. Cormac was directly before Marion, and he was glad he would be facing away from her when it was time to dance, for her steady gaze was sure to make him nervous. McEwen's hand rose, commanding silence in the room. Before the dance, my daughter is going to favour us with a song. Marion looked at her father sharply. Had she known she was meant to perform this evening? It was no wonder she was exceptionally painted this evening in her ruby gown and glossy, intricately styled raven hair. The gems at her ears and throat boasted of her wealth, but they were not the most admirable thing about her tonight. No, she did not need gems to shine. Marion stared hard at her father and Cormac realised at once this entire situation was orchestrated to remind the men who competed of the prize. Whispers had grown increasingly over the last week in regards to which man deserved to win the role of chief, and McEwen undoubtedly wanted to redirect those conversations to centre on Marion, on who would deserve to wed her. She was being put on display, a sheep on a dais to be examined and desired prior to the bidding. Her gaze was firm, a burning fire, but her father did not retreat. Her chin gave a quick, firm dip, and she moved gracefully around the table toward the waiting Clarsac. She settled herself in the chair, and her delicate fingers landed on the strings. Marion leaned the instrument back against her shoulder, and the room was thick with silence for a few heartbeats before she moved into the song. The competitors turned to face her, standing as three pillars before the head table with their backs to the chief. Cormac faced the entire gathered inhabitants of Moreg, though he saw none but Marion. Her fingers bent and pulled the strings of her harp in a smooth, rapid motion, like water rolling over a pebbled bed. The sound was a sweet melody, touching his heart and infusing him with the sense of mythos. Surely the fairies were about her now, helping to pull the strings. No mortal creature could create such mastery. Cormac had heard her practice the harp through the thick castle walls, but this was something else. It was pure, the seamless song ebbing and flowing in a sweet rhythm. Her chin dipped and her eyelids were lowered, as though she pulled the strings by intuition alone. She was a picture of serenity as her music continued to fill the great hall. The inhabitants were still, not a person in the room willing to mar the magic wrought by Marion's strings. When she completed the song, her fingers lingered at the strings and she lifted her head. A beat of pregnant silence weighed over the room, as though the spectators held the collective breath. Marion set the clarsac flat on the floor and dropped her hands in her lap, and the room erupted in a volley of applause. She stood her chin lifted in pride, and McEwen fairly radiated satisfaction. Marion's ruby gown and impeccable appearance were immaculate, but her confidence and general bearing made her stunning. She was the prize McEwen wanted her to appear. She retook her seat beside her mother, and McEwen glowed with pleasure from the performance. He looked up to where old Rupert stood poised with his bagpipes. It is time for the gilly Callum. The familiar song began slowly on the pipes, filling the cavernous room. The men all stood before their swords and began at the same time. Their legs moved in rhythm with a steady, slow tempo, jumping from square to square in measured leaps. Feet around the room began to stomp in time with the pipes, and hands hit the tables until the room was full of the steady rhythmic beat. Cormac had been taught the dance, but it ran through every Scotsman's blood. As the tempo increased by degrees, the pounding in the room accompanied it, and it was impossible to tell if the speeding was led from the pipes or the crowd as he scaled up in synchrony. The energy in the room fairly vibrated through Cormac, and he executed the well-known steps flawlessly as they moved closer to the blades with the increase in tempo. Rupert stomped his foot along with the music pouring from his pipes, and Cormac couldn't hide his grin. Ian kicked a sword beside him, and the sound jarred him momentarily, but he remained on beat, continuing the dance. Ian stepped back, laughing, and began to clap along with the music in good humour. Cormac caught a smile on his face. It was difficult to feel the stress of the competition in the midst of a sword dance. Cormac soaked in the familiarity, allowing it to run through him and soothe his grief. For this moment he could push aside the pressure of the games. 
He was Elin's final remaining relative, and she was the only person in the room who understood the significance of this dance for Cormac. He recalled when his father had taught him the steps as a lad, how he'd patiently shown Cormac what to do and helped him achieve greatness. He was a gentle teacher and a kind soul. Cormac's feet moved through the familiar steps and he considered what his father would do if he were beside him now. What would he advise Cormac to do in regards to the chief's Jacobite sentiments? Father had kept his political beliefs a secret during Cormac's lifetime, undoubtedly to protect the family he loved dearly. Would he have been proud for Cormac to fall under the wing of a Jacobite, or would he have rebelled against it? Cormac sought Elin in the crowd, and her eyes shone with pulled tears. He wanted to leap over the table and pull her into an embrace, to share in their grief over the loss of their beloved parents and the raw feelings this competition evoked, but there would be time enough for that later. It was enough to share in this with her, to look across the room and know he was not alone in his grief. The sound of metal sliding on the stone hit Cormac's ears and he glanced at Simon, but the man continued to dance. Ian still stood between them, his foot stomping along with the rest of the room. Sweat beaded on Cormac's brow, the tempo increasing ever more and his feet along with it. Another scrape of sword and stone rent the merriment and Cormac looked again to Simon, who continued to dance. His cheeks were ruddy and sweat ran down his temples, but he pretended not to hear or feel the sword and continued to dance. The man was bloody cheating. Cormac fought the temptation to look at Simon's swords and gauge how off-centre they were, focusing on the ever-increasing speed. He bent his focus to the task, catching sight of Marion on each rotation around the swords. He was so close to her table, he could see her nervous concentration. He could also see McEwen, and if Cormac was close enough to hear the scrape of Simon's sword over the pounding and pipes, surely McEwen could hear it as well. Cormac heard another scrape before he realised that his shoe had collided with the sharp sword. A brief moment's temptation made him hesitate. If Simon could pretend he hadn't touched his sword, Cormac could as well. But he was a man of honour, even if Simon wasn't. Cormac stopped dancing and stepped back, his chest heaving as his lungs clawed for breath. Ian clapped him on the back and Simon stepped back. They all bowed together to McEwen, then turned and bowed to the crowd. McEwen stood and waited for the noise to lessen. Our winner tonight is Simon. He glanced at Cormac. If he was aware of Simon's cheating, then he made no move to pardon his choice. If he wanted to produce a reaction from Cormac, the clear winner, then he would be disappointed. Cormac turned to find his sister, but the space where she had been sitting beside Isabel was now empty. He swept his gaze over the celebration, looking for her among the crowd, but she was gone. He bit down his worry and returned his attention to the head table. Marion's eyes were spitting fire, looking between Simon and her father. It was enough for Cormac to know he deserved the win and to know that he was not the only person who noticed as much. He didn't wish to give Simon any further reason to want him dead. Anyone sitting beyond the front tables was likely too far away to have seen what truly happened and it hurt his pride that he looked less competent when he truly performed the best. But he would prefer injured pride to physical harm. McEwen stepped around the table and leaned in, lowering his voice so only Cormac could hear. Well done, lad. Approval radiated from him. What could that possibly mean? He walked away and Simon looked from Cormac to McEwen, though he was too far to have overheard. Well done, lad. Cormac couldn't make sense of it. Well done for being the true winner. Well done for not hitting Simon in the face for cheating his way to victory. What was he proud of? Cormac wasn't sure, but he would do his best to find out. Chapter 22 Elin slipped outside, and the cold air immediately shocked her body with a volley of shivers. But it wasn't enough. She wanted to be cold until she was numb, until she could no longer feel... She closed the door and shut out the distant sounds of merriment behind her. 
The moon shone over the dark sky, littered by sparkling stars, and Elin wished she could travel away through the moonbeams and be anywhere but here. Watching her brother dance the Gilly Callum had immediately placed Elin in her childhood, laughing and clapping with mother as she counted the rhythm while father taught Cormac the dance. Elin started toward the loch. When they were children, she had come upon Cormac practising over cross sticks near the loch in Gilmuir, and he taught her what he knew. She'd mimicked his motions easily, but she'd had to lift her skirts high in order to see the sticks marking the X on the ground like swords. She recalled wishing that she too could wear a kilt, for it would make it easier to dance and see her feet, that maybe with a kilt she could be better than Cormac. That flood of memories had washed over her during the competition in the Great Hall, seeping through her body like heavy, weighted grief and weeping from her. She loved Cormac so dearly that it hurt to consider leaving Moreg, as she told Marion she intended to do. But what choice did she have? McEwen clearly liked Cormac, and Cormac was very much taken with Marion, even if he tried to hide that from Elin. He would undoubtedly remain, and Elin would return to Gilmuir. They would seldom see one another in the future, and their children, were she to have any, wouldn't know each other well. Her heart squeezed and she picked up her pace, quickening toward the shiny black water. She wanted to not feel. The grounds were empty save for the distant braise of animals and answering howls from the cows near the castle. Swishing wind moved the grass near her feet and rustled the leaves overhead. She slipped into the trees following the banks of the loch further away from Morag. If anyone chose to leave the castle at this time of night, she did not want them to see her. Elin paused when she reached a bank shrouded in shadows from overhead branches and stripped away her gown, petticoat and farthingale, hanging them from a low branch to keep them off the dirt. She was barefoot and leaned over to dip a toe in the frigid water with satisfaction. It would soon numb her completely. With practice grace, Elin inhaled a full breath into her lungs, then dove into the loch, her pent-up tears mixing with the cold water and running away from her in a muddle of shocking icy water. Elin swam and prayed no one would see her, her desire to swim, to work her muscles and allow the cold to remove her feeling was deep and tender, and she smoothly arced her arms through the water and carried herself quietly over the surface. The gathering was going strong and would distract Moreg's inhabitants for a while, or so she hoped. She didn't want to be caught and bring shame upon Cormac, but she had needed this. She hadn't swum in ages, seldom finding a good moment to do so after Anna grew too weary of being discovered and ceased accompanying her. Elin pushed away thoughts of her old home and swam harder. Her feet numbed from the cold and she couldn't feel the tips of her fingers. She pushed through the water and fought the desire to give up and return to her clothing in the shoreline. The cold pierced her completely, soaking through her body until it numbed her heart. It pushed away grief-filled images of home, of childhood, of her brother dancing in Morag's great hall only minutes before. She reached the opposite side of the loch and lifted her head from the water, her chest heaving. She was so cold. She needed to hurry before she lost feeling so completely that she could not swim the entire width of the loch to the McEwen side. She turned to swim back, exercising her poorly neglected muscles and keeping her head under water. She lifted it periodically for a breath and pushed on, glad to be doing this after so many weeks of restraining herself. Darkness closed in on all sides, and Elin lifted her face to inhale another breath when a frightened shout rent the sky and startled her. She sucked in her surprise and took in a breath of murky water, coughing and choking on the unexpected filthy drink. She kicked her legs beneath her to rise from the water enough to regain her composure and made out a shape not far from her. A boat... Elin wiped water from her eyes, doing her best to remain quiet in case the shape sitting in the boat had yet to notice her, though the shout earlier likely meant that she was too late for that. It was a man sitting alone, moonlight poured over his startled wide eyes, and he leaned dangerously forward over the edge of his boat. You better stop there, or you'll be joining me in here, she said. 
The man reached toward her. Come, let me help you from the water. I have plenty of room. Elin knew men, and she was aware that they seldom had pure intentions when they offered to help. Her brother was the exception. I dinna need your help. You wish to remain in the water? Aye. You canna. You must be frozen. Only a wee bit. She shivered, her teeth chattering, and his boat looked much warmer than the water currently numbing her treading feet. But she could not trust a man she didn't know, and she could not have it known at Moreg that she swam. Cormac would certainly be shamed for such a thing. The man looked at her earnestly, his eyes soft in the darkness. Could she ask him to keep her secret and row her to shore? He didn't look familiar, so she assumed he wasn't from Moreg. She looked over her shoulder and the banks were not too far. She must have been halfway across the narrow loch when she came upon the man in the boat. She had come this far. She could surely swim the remainder of the way faster than it would take to climb into this boat and allow the man to help her, if his intentions were so pure. If you dinna mind, I'll be on my way. Wait. She kicked harder, keeping her head above water. I. Why are you here? Tis my home for now. He looked confused. Perhaps he'd meant the loch and not why she was at Moreg, though she would prefer not to explain why she was swimming in the dark. Can I have your name? He asked softly. His voice was pleasing, and though she couldn't easily make out his features, she could see that he was handsome, that his face appeared kind. But still she needed to guard her family's name and reputation, Nay, why no? I dinna ken who you are. I dinna have designs on you, lass. I'm no unavailable man. Then why do you wish to ken my name? He scoffed lightly. Because you dinna seem real. She laughed, the sound ripping from her chest with force, as though breaking free of its own accord. She hadn't laughed, not truly in ages. It felt sore and freeing. I'm no real. I'm a spirit. A smile flickered over his lips. Aye, you are that. Please allow me to help you out of the water. Now she must keep her distance even more. If she could discern the man's smile in the moonlight, he would certainly be able to see her dripping form in nothing but her stays and shift were she to climb into his boat. Nay, I want to stay in the water. Besides, his kind smile aside, she didn't know the man. She couldn't trust him. Why are ye out here alone at night? I needed to think, he said. Do ye do this often? Aye, when I need to think. She scoffed and her teeth chattered together. She was running out of time, but curiosity had the better of her. What needs thinking on so badly that you'll risk freezing on a loch? You're one to speak. He laughed but sobered quickly. His warm voice did nothing to heat her freezing limbs, but it warmed her chest. My mother is sick. Two doctors have come and provided tonics and services, but they canna help her. Nathan has improved her health. Elan's heart reached out to him. Her father had slowly wasted away until illness took over completely and stole him from this life. She had done all she could, but she hadn't been able to help him. Elin had spent many nights during that year on her own loch in Gilmuir, swimming until she could feel nothing but the burn in her lungs and the ache in her muscles. But perhaps she knew enough now to help this man. What are your mother's symptoms? If he found the question odd, he didn't show it. She has no appetite. She canna remain awake, and her strength has fled. That could be many things. Aye, but she has lately begun to feel a fluttering in the region of her heart, and it worries me. Elin recalled a similar illness in her neighbour back in Gilmuir, and he also suffered from a fluttering near his heart. It could be worth trying a similar tonic. Have you tried the ash of an ash tree with lime? Nay, the doctors suggested potash or soda. She nodded and kicked harder, moving her arms to keep herself warm. I would have considered those as well. They didna help. Nay. Then you ought to try this. Dissolve the lime and ashes in water and give your mother a teaspoon of the mixture in a teacup of water and milk. How often? 
twice a day. I have seen something similar to what you described, but it took a few weeks of dosing the tonic before it took effect. How do you ken this? I learned it from a healing woman. She is renowned where I come from, and I studied under her for a few years. He paused for a beat, then sighed, the weight of his burdens dispelling through his breath. I will remain diligent if it does not work straight away. He looked intrigued. How can I repay your kindness? Row away so I can return to my swim. Vera well. Consider it done. And please do not tell anyone that you saw me here. He chuckled. That I saw a selkie in the middle of the loch? Thou would not believe me if I did. Elin smiled. A selkie? Surely her skin was too bright and her hair too red to give the illusion of a seal woman. She swam backwards, watching him take his oars in hand. She needed to return to shore before her teeth chattered so hard they broke. The man began to row away, and Elin took off toward Morag's banks. Glad for the overreaching trees that would cover her in darkness, she climbed up the slippery, muddy bank and dressed again quickly, water running down her legs and pulling at her bare feet. She turned for Morag, but looked out over the loch, unable to locate the boat upon the water. She could not remove the man's striking eyes from her mind and believed that perhaps he was one of the kind ones. A man who would float in the cold to remove himself from the fear percolating in a sick room was someone she understood quite well. It occurred to her that she would never know if the tea concoction helped his mother or not. She would pray that it did. Chapter 23 The following morning Marion awoke before the sun had greeted the castle and dressed quietly to sneak from Moreg and meet Cormac at the fairy tree. She stepped softly past the slumbering Isabel, slipped through the door and gently pushed it closed behind her. Marion turned and startled when Ian passed her door. He looked fatigued, dark circles pulling beneath his eyes and exhaustion lining his mouth. You're awake early, she said. We're to race now, he yawned and turned back to give her a tired smile. I was sent to fetch the others. You're racing now? Aye, but nearly everyone is asleep. Ian's lips pressed together in a firm line. There were reports of unrest near Brillug, and someone saw the watch not far from here last night. It is isn't wise to gather everyone outside of the castle today. She nodded, but fear sprouted within her. She would likely have known this already if Cormac's room was empty and she had been able to listen freely into the study. She would have known if he was willing to listen at all, but he hadn't seemed the least inclined to do so. I wish to come. I will see you outside. Vera well. Ian moved on to knock on Cormac's door. Marion returned to her room to retrieve her arisade and Isabel sat up. There's to be a race. Marion explained. Isabel rubbed at her eyes. I ought to deal with the chickens quickly then. I dunna want to miss it. I dunna think they want spectators. It is unsafe outside. Isabel looked at her through narrowed eyes. Aye, and why are you bundling up as if you're meant to face a mighty tempest? Because I am going to spectate, regardless of what my father wants. Marion was still angry at him for the spectacle he created of her the evening before. She'd acquiesced because she was bound by duty, but her eyes had burned with anger, and from her father's expression, she could see he'd known it. He knew how furious she was, yet he did not retreat. Unfeeling man. Isabel laughed quietly. You're in a mood, Mary. Wait a moment and I'll come with you. Marion took more time to secure her hair away from her face while Isabel dressed, and they soon went down together. The sun had peeked over the tops of the distant trees, and Marion helped Isabel gather the eggs and return the basket to the kitchen, snagging oatcakes from the work table and chewing them on their way to Glen Ellen. The games typically consisted of a foot race up a hill, and there was no other area near Morag good for such a race. They rounded the castle and found the men gathered there. The competitors stood in a line with Father and Uncle Brian to the side. 
You'll run to those trees there and circle the one Kieran marked with a neckcloth. The first man to cross this line, he pointed to a long, jagged stick lying on the ground, is the victor. Kieran walked toward them, returning from hanging the neckcloth in the tree. The men lined up before the starting line and Cormac shot Marion an apologetic smile. She tried to look understanding. Neither of them could have predicted father would hold another competition so soon or so early in the morning. Kieran approached and stood beside Isabel and father turned. His gaze paused on Marion and gave her a hard searching look which she matched with fervour. She had not retreated last night and she would not retreat here either. Besides, she was perfectly safe beside the castle when surrounded by father, Uncle Brian and Kieran. I must begin the race. Kieran said softly and bent to kiss Isabel on the top of the head. He stepped forward. Ready, men? They each moved into preparatory stance, bouncing on the balls of their heels. Kieran lifted his hand in the air. Begin, he shouted, bringing his hand down swiftly, and the men took off in unison. Breath whooshed from Marion in a rush, and she clasped her hands tightly, watching them run nearly together. Ian had pulled slightly ahead by the time they reached the tree line, but the men were all close when they disappeared from sight. A few moments of quiet passed among the small group of spectators. Marion tightened her arisade against the oncoming winter chill and shifted closer to Isabel. The wedding was swiftly approaching and Marion was worried it would alter things between her and her friend, that she would see far less of Isabel after that. Perhaps not immediately, but Isabel would be having children soon and be too busy tending to them to give her attention elsewhere. It was an understandable change in life, but it saddened her that things would change. She wrapped her hand around Isabel's arm and squeezed in a surge of affection. A warm look passed between Kieran and Isabel and Marion paused. She'd seen that look on Cormac's face and now placed it as yearning. It shot fire through her core, resolve quick on its heels. Why was she hiding her feelings for the man when it had the potential to help? She would speak to her father today. Uncle Brian scoffed loudly, ripping her from her thoughts. Surely we can all agree that strength is far more important than speed. Father waited a moment as though he was weighing his response. Each competition teaches me something about the men, brother especially the sword dance and Simon's obvious cheating. Father must have seen that when it was loud and obvious, despite the noise from the pipes and the pounding. Ah, dunna see why speed could matter when it comes to choosing a chief, Uncle Brian said, a gleam in his eye. I could beat you in a foot race today, but that doesn't mean I would make a better chief than ye. Though it was abundantly clear to Marion, her uncle did believe he would be better in that position. Father must have thought the same thing, he glared. Dinna press me, Brian. Uncle Brian puffed his chest but said no more in the matter. The men appeared in the distance and Marion dropped Isabel's arm and took a step forward, straining to see who was in the lead. Two men ran side by side, but neither of them were Cormac. Her stomach tightened until he appeared a moment later, pumping his legs to catch up. Doesn't it look like it'll be too hard to make a decision, brother? Uncle Brian grinned. There are two clear leaders in the games. Father watched the race and didn't bother to respond to Brian. The small group of spectators were silent, each set of eyes trained on the men running. Cormac gained speed over the field, slowly catching up to Ian and Simon until the three of them were running together. The men grew close enough to see clearly and it was obvious from the mud smeared over the side of Cormac's body that he must have fallen after they went out of sight. His hair was rumpled from the wind, and his face was splattered with dark brown spots. Cormac ran faster, flying past the others and crossing over the stick just before the other men. Marion couldn't temper her smile. She didn't approach him, but turned to Isabel. Should we leave now? Isabel eyed her. You dinna wish to compliment the winner? Simon went to stand near his father, his chest heaving and hands resting on his waist. She was tempted to congratulate Cormac, but Simon looked angry and it was better not to provoke him. Nay, I can do so later. They left the group and headed back toward Morag. 
The sun had risen high enough to shine over the loch and glow orange light across Morag's grey stone walls. Sheep complained and cows responded to them in the animal pens. It was cold but sunny, a lovely day for a walk to the fairy tree. Marion wouldn't be able to go unless she snuck away, though. Not if there were reports of unrest close enough to frighten her father into keeping everyone indoors. She looked to Dulnain across the loch, was miles aware of the danger. She glanced over her shoulder and found the men making their way back toward Morag. Cormac was limping. Marion watched him do his best to cover the limp, despite a clear hitch in his step. He was hurt? She slowed and Isabel did so alongside her. Did you notice Cormac limping? Nay. Isabel glanced back at him. From the state of his appearance, it's clear he fell. Aye, not a good fall either if the amount of mud is any indication. Marion hesitated. She didn't want to immediately assume Neferis' intentions were to blame, for Cormac certainly could have tripped over a tree root or a rock or a dip in the uneven ground. But given Simon's propensity for cheating, it was hard not to at least wonder if he had something to do with Cormac's state of disarray. She stopped walking. It was time to put an end to Simon's unfair play in the games. Marion had planned to go back to her room and develop an argument before speaking to her father, but she couldn't put it off any longer. I need to speak with my father. Isabel nodded and left her to walk beside Kieran. Marion approached her father, who was walking with Brian and Simon. Brian smirked down at her. The lass canna take the excitement, can she? It has been a struggle, she agreed with no emotion, though not for the reason he believed. Pivoting away from her uncle, she held her father's gaze. I was hoping to speak with ye. He glanced above her head, his face impassive. Of course, lass. The men remained behind, and Marion followed her father up the stairs to his study. Each step closer to the room frustrated her further. Why had father allowed Simon to win the sword dance when he'd clearly kicked his swords? Twice? Why had he allowed Simon's outrageous number of fouls from the first hunt to go uncontested? Why did he not include her in any of the plans for the games when this was her future he was meddling with and the future of her children, his posterity? The door closed behind her with a deafening thud and no man stood on the other side of the door to listen in. Where was Hugh anyway? Marion cleared her throat. Regardless of how the conversation turned, she would keep her head tall. Simon cheated. Father moved around his desk without an inkling of haste. And nay, lass, he didna, no really. Her heart hammered in her chest, but she was determined to be heard and did not intend to back down. You must have noticed that he did so at both the hunt and the sword dance. He couldn't have shoot so many birds in so short a time, and he kicked the swords twice before Cormac did so. It was plainly obvious for the swords weren't even straight once he'd finished. Marion stood behind the chair opposite his desk and rested her hands on the top of its back. Her fingers curled around the wood and pressed into it while her father watched her closely. He rubbed a hand over his grey beard. It is a heavy thing to place such an accusation on a man. Have ye considered that if ye heard the swords as ye think, then Cormac heard them as well? Yet he didna make any accusations. He wouldna. He is a man of honour. He is na lacking in morality. Father rose from his seat and towered over her, the width of the desk the only space between them. How do you ken that he is a man of honour? Marion had found herself in situations with each of the gentlemen alone, and only one of them made her feel as though tiny insects crawled all over her body. In the other's presence, she felt completely safe. It was not a foolproof assessment, but it was all she had. If she trusted her instincts, she could unequivocally declare that Cormac was a trustworthy man of honour. A canna. Cormac is a type of man you'd wish for chief. Father was quiet, watching her. You have kenned your whole life that I would choose your husband, Marion. It is now we thing to select the man who will next govern our people. The Crown cares not for us. The government does not put food on our tables while we are in a drought or send aid to the sick. That is my responsibility, and I will choose the best man for my people to carry on that responsibility adequately. 
You think Simon would care about sending aid to the sick or food to the poor? You think Simon would care for anything more than cards and whiskey and losing the legacy you've built? She released the chair and threw her arms to her sides. This will all collapse around me after you're gone and I'll be able to do nothing to save it. I didn't say Simon was my choice, lass, father said, his voice dangerously low, but I did say you need to trust in my decision. You need to remember there is more at stake here than your life or the state of Moreg. There are bigger things at play. Bigger things like Britain's rightful king. Marion's mother confirmed this after Marion found the leather ledger a few months ago, and she had since heard snippets of conversation here and there through her eavesdropping hole in the ceiling. She knew her father was a Jacobite, but until this moment, she hadn't let him know she was aware. Anger flashed over his face. How do you ken that? She needed to tread carefully, or she would end up tossing her mother to the wolves. I am not blind, father. His breathing grew ragged, a rare occurrence. He was always calm and collected, always in control. Fear snaked through her belly. Had she gone too far? She forced herself to hold her ground. You know to speak of things you dinna ken anything about. I was only saying... Marion, he growled, ye will obey me. You will marry the man I choose. You will do what you must to protect your clan and your countrymen. Countrymen? All this time she believed she was doing her duty to protect the McEwans. But this went farther than Castle Morag, didn't it? This was real and dangerous. Just how close were they to war? Simon did not cheat, he repeated, his steel gaze steady. This competition is warfare, and Simon was strategic in his choices. Marion suppressed her answering scoff. He kicked the sword. You can call it strategy if you wish, but we're still in Scotland, and I thought we still cared about duty and honour. It is no about whether or no Simon cheated. I care only for how he chose to play the competition. Father shook his head. You dinna understand everything, lass. I ken far more than you do in this matter, and I'm asking ye to trust me. Trust? How could she trust a man who didn't tell her anything? Love for her was nestled somewhere in his eyes, amidst his love for Scotland and his clan. He did care about her. He was not a monster. And though they didn't often agree, she knew he cared about her on some level. But she could not trust him if he would still consider Simon. If she told him Simon made her worry for her safety, would that have any sway in the matter? He continued, My marriage with your mother wasn't a love match, but that changed over time. I do love her, and she loves me. Aye, she whispered, but I cannot fall in love with a man who causes me to fear for my safety. You speak of Simon still. Has something happened to give you cause to fear him? How could she describe the innate nature of her fear? How ingrained and unexplainable it was? Her father was a strong man of power. He would never understand the vulnerability she felt with naught but her small blade and quick wit to defend herself against brute strength. Telling father of Simon's brusque manner was not going to aid her here, but she had to try. She swallowed. He's done nothing irreparable, but he is a devious man. He is not afraid to use his strength to take what he wants. He's laid a hand on you? Not in the way her father imagined. She struggled with what to say, how to adequately explain that Simon taking her roughly by the arm was only a precursor to a life shackled to a brutish pig. Marion nodded. Her father had always been good at reading her, but she could see he was sceptical. His face was a mask of stone. His eyes flicked between hers, his nostrils flaring slightly, though that could indicate his irritation with the conversation, not necessarily with Simon. And the other contenders? Have they laid a hand on you? Marion thought of Cormac's gentle touches in the corridor and the stables, and her heart jumped. She tried to cover her reaction before father noticed. I trust Ian, and I believe Cormac, to be honourable. Father turned his attention to his desk. Marion accepted her dismissal. If nothing else, she could hope that the seed of information she'd planted would grow until Father agreed that Simon didn't deserve to lead the clan. She swallowed. How much longer is this going to last? The clock ticked loudly in the quiet room. 
it'll be over soon. Marion nodded. I do hope that is the case. Chapter 24 Cormac set the freshly filled bucket on the ground beside the well and scooped the chilled water over the crusted mud on his leg. He did his best to wash it off before moving to his clothing. He would need to beat the dirt from his plaid later, but for now he removed it as best he could. He had been spitting fire when Simon tripped him, but his anger had cooled now with the help of time and distance. Ian sat on the edge of the well and folded his arms over his chest. He looked from Cormac's mud-splattered face to his feet. You did not trip, did you? Of course no. A grin stretched over Ian's mouth and he shook his head. And still you won? Cormac's answering smile was wide. That did feel grand. Though it could have also served to paint a larger target upon his back, he chose not to worry about that yet. He still needed to prove Simon was the man who had tried to have him killed. The castle door swung open and Marion shot outside, slamming it behind her. Her brow was puckered, her eyes angry. She noticed them near the well and crossed toward them, her chest heaving in apparent indignation. Did you hurt yourself? Nay. Nee. I saw you limping. Marion shifted her focus to Ian and he straightened his back. Did Cormac hurt himself? Hurt himself? Nay. Nee. Tis Nathan. He'll be well. Ian had no knowledge of whether or not Cormac was truly injured, of course, but Cormac was glad his friend had backed up his claim. He didn't wish for Marion to become so enraged and defensive on his behalf, not at this stage in the games. Cormac was beginning to wonder. If it was Simon who set out to hurt him, then why was the man not also trying to hurt Ian and his chances in the games as well? It was important not to discount Hugh yet, not when Cormac was unclear about the motivation behind the rock above his door. Marion's chin raised, and the power in her icy blue eyes created a palpable force. You can't treat me as though I can Nathan, you daft loons. I can what I saw, and that limp was no Nathan. I only need a few hours to rest it, and I'll feel grand, Cormac soothed. She didn't appear properly placated. He should have known better than to try and fool this woman. You were tripped, were you no? Ian looked down at the pale, dry grass at their feet. Cormac held Marion's gaze. Aye, I was tripped. He cupped water from the bucket and splashed it over his face, scrubbing with calloused fingertips to remove the mud that had caked and pulled tight at his skin. He used a portion of his plaid to dry his face and slick his hair back. When he straightened, Marion hadn't moved, and her expression was just as stone still as her feet. Cormac sighed. She intended to remain until this was discussed. That much was perfectly clear. He looked at Ian. What I dinna understand, I suppose, is why Simon didna try to trip ye. Ian shrugged. He doesna see me as a threat. You've won the sheaf toss and nearly won the foot race. You're not to be discounted. You also have my father's ear. Marion said plainly. Simon kens your position here, Ian. He kens how well my father respects ye. Ian's scoff was light but unmistakable. I'm no a threat, Marion. I'm a replacement. If Kieran hadn't been promised to Isabel, ye well ken he would have been in the games himself. Silence settled among them. No one willing or able to dispute that. Despite McEwen's claim of wanting a man born of the McEwen name for the next chief... He could have chosen whichever man he wished. He could have asked Kieran to forgo his surname of Buchanan and accept the mantle of McEwen, though he could not have forced it, and Kieran could very well have refused. Simon felt the role was his by rights as the closest kin, so perhaps his actions during the games and his targeted tripping during the race weren't aimed at removing Cormac specifically from the competition. He could have tripped Ian had the man been reachable when they went out of sight to the spectators. If that was the case, then whoever set the rock above Cormac's propped open door had other reasons for doing so. Someone like Hugh, who had been conspicuously missing for more than a day now. 
Have you seen Hugh and Rory today? Cormac asked. Ian shook his head. They rode to Edinburgh, a task for McEwen. That seemed significant. Since Hugh had left, there had been no further attempts in Cormac's life. Tripping a man during a race didn't kill him, so Cormac wasn't considering that related to the rock. Have you practised for the stone put? Cormac asked. He wanted to be alone with Marion to speak of the things he'd learned and discuss the best course of action. He wanted to tell her how wonderful she was in the Clarsac the evening before and slip his hands around her waist if she let him. He glanced up and found her watching him, her head tilting to the side slightly in question. His ears went warm and he looked away, certain his entire face was burning. Drat his copper hair and translucent cheeks. I need to practice throwing, but McEwen doesn't want us out here for long. Ah, so that was why Ian had followed Cormac to the well. He was acting as a faithful watchdog, not a friend. It stung, though Cormac didn't want to admit that even to himself. He was struggling to decipher which of the men he had come to count as friends were merely playing a role and which were authentic. At that moment, he could not discern friend from foe. Shall we return to Moreg? Marion asked. I suppose so. Cormac splashed the remaining dirtied water into the grass and refilled the bucket to carry inside. What business takes Hugh and Rory to Edinburgh? Ian pushed off from the well and shrugged. I canna see. Because he was privy to the information and not meant to share it, or because he didn't know. Cormac assumed it was the previous, but he didn't wish to paint Ian as a villain when the man was only doing his job. The trouble was Cormac didn't know what Ian's job consisted of. He wished the man would speak plainly with him, but matters of a political nature never seemed to be so easily discussed or managed. It would be far simpler if everyone could speak honestly and be forthright. Cormac held the door, and Marion and Ian preceded him into Morag. Ian moved toward the stairs, undoubtedly toward McEwen's study, and Marion slowed her steps until he was out of sight. She leaned toward Cormac and whispered, Follow me, but if we are seen, then go straight to your bedchamber. He did not have a chance to nod before she turned down the corridor to the other set of stairs and slipped through the doorway. Her footsteps were silent, her movements fluid and graceful. They rounded the steps, continuing upward without crossing paths with another soul. The placement of this staircase likely had something to do with that since the location was on the far side of the castle, near mostly unused rooms. Marion led him past the floor to their bedchambers and continued up. It wasn't until they reached a door that Cormac realised where she was taking him. She pushed the door open and Cormac's breath fled, his stomach dropping in a swoop like a diving swallow. He stepped onto the small, narrow lookout and could see far out in every direction facing south from the castle. The golden hills rolled upwards and out, dotted with clusters of trees as the woods grew denser in the distance. The sky was close and damp, the low-hanging clouds shifting nearer to the ground, and the sweet scent of impending rain tainting the air. A storm was coming. Delnane sat on the other side of the calm loch, awkward and innocent like a passing acquaintance Cormac was unsure whether or not to greet. The small, narrow lookout they stood upon was hardly the length of a prostrated man and half the width. The roof tipped up behind them and out in both directions, and they could not see the allure on the other side of the roof where most of the men took watch. They were essentially alone. Does anyone come up here? No, Vera, often, Marion said. Father places men on the other walkway. They can see in most directions from there. They never come out on this side. If they do, she smiled. We shall say that I was giving you a tour of the grounds. You havena been up here yet, aye? If you're to be the next chief, you'll need to be familiar with the property. I am educating ye. It was a flimsy, translucent explanation, but he would take it. Marion closed the door behind him, and they felt utterly alone, the world at their feet. He could have stood at her side all day. We didn't have much time if we didn't want them to notice our absence, she said. Please tell me what happened. 
Her concern was endearing. Cormac told her of finding the rock wedged above his door and how he noticed it before it could harm him. Her hand fluttered to her chest. You could have been killed, she whispered. How did they open the door? Do you know secure it before you sleep? I do. They must have found a way to retrieve the string to pull it open. Her raven eyebrows drew together. Simon isn't smart enough to do that. He chuckled. I wouldn't discount the man entirely. I would. You've seen him. He has tried to win the games by cheating and relying on his strength. He doesn't have the intelligence to contrive a win in a way that would protect his identity. Perhaps, but he's no the only man who could try to hurt me. You believe there could have been someone else? I, Hugh, but only because your father warned me to look for rocks for the stone put, and he'd also asked the same of Hugh. The man could have used one of the stones he found to place on my door. That is no a strong reason to believe he is at fault for trying to end your life. Aye, but it is all I have. I have nae enemies. I ken nae one who wants me out of the competition except Simon. She leaned against the parapet and looked out over the land. He is the obvious choice. We'll need to watch him closely. She drew in a quick breath. Wait, what of Ian? I trust Ian. She swallowed hard. I saw Ian come from your bedroom yesterday after the caber toss. Did you send him there? Cormac narrowed his eyes and shook his head. Nay, I didna. I suppose we ought to consider him a possibility as well. Though it pains me to say so. I like the man. I like him too. I canna believe he would. Marion shook her head. I do think the benefit of the games is that they canna hurt you in clear sight of the others. The race proved that. Simon waited until we were alone to trip me. He will not harm me if the chief can see. Then remain in sight of the chief. He shook his head. Aye, he'll like that. Marion straightened. Or you can remain in sight of me. His mouth went dry. Aye, you'll like that. Her eyes sparkled, their icy blue depths sincere. I would. Cormac stepped softly toward her and slid the rough tips of his fingers over her smooth cheek. You dinna want me, lass. I'm a poor farmer's son, and I dinna have aspirations for success. You're considered good enough by my father, or you wouldna be here. I was brought here because my father fought by his side and proved himself. I'm here on another's merits, and I dinna ken if I've proved myself at all. I'm no even sure I have what it takes to be a leader. I think you do. You care for your sister. You made friends here right away. You have integrity. You didn't try to disqualify Simon for cheating. You didn't make a public scene. I've seen you playing with the young boys and scratching the filthy mongrels behind the ears when you think no one is watching. You have a good heart, Cormac, and it is clear to those who ken you that you would make a great leader. His heart warmed at her praise, and the wind beat against his back, urging him forward. Or were her fairies here? Were they pushing him toward her? He spoke low, afraid of giving voice to his insecurities. What if I've already fallen in love with you, but your father doesn't choose me? Her blue eyes shone, and she leaned into his touch. Then we run away together, because I canna lose you, Cormac. I've already lost my heart to you. An enormous wave of heat rolled through Cormac, and he dropped his hands to her waist. He used all the control he possessed not to crush her against him, and instead gently pushed her back against the wall, holding her gaze. Her wide blue eyes watched him, and he dipped his head down and pressed his lips to hers. Heat blew through him like the roar of an overly large fire, sweeping over his limbs and settling in his chest. He could not imagine a warmer way to stand in the frigid air. Despite the icy winter chill, he was on fire. Cormac kissed Marion as though it was his only opportunity, and he was absolutely certain of two things. She was sweeter than plum cake, and he loved her. Chapter 25 Kissing Cormac was the single most enjoyable thing Marion had ever before done. Her back dug into the rough stone behind her, 
but she hardly noticed or cared while Cormac's lips pressed against hers. Flashes of heat swept through her like the bolts of lightning brightening the distant sky. Cormac pulled away from her, but his fingers remained curled around her neck and lost in her hair. She gripped the rough fabric of his jacket and reached up to kiss him again, taking him by surprise. He did not reject her forward behaviour, but pressed himself against her, covering her from the onslaught of wind. If she had not been completely decided before, she certainly was now. She intended to fight for Cormac. There was no other course ahead she would accept. She had no choice but to acquiesce to her father's demands. But she could certainly make demands of her own. Her father asked her to trust him. Could he not do the same for her? Cormac pulled away again and rested his forehead against hers, his breath coming in rapid spurts. You'll drive a man mad, Marion. You're the only man I wish to do that to. His hand slid over her waist and squeezed. You're doing a fine job of it. It is like you're possessed of magic. The fairies must follow ye around. My grandmother believed the same thing. He paused, growing serious. Did people believe your grandmother was mad? Aye, but I dunna ken if she truly was. The connection she felt. I felt the same. The actions she took against the tree, she did for me. What do you mean? She believed she was making a sacrifice. She had a dream where I was visited by the fairies and led to the tree, where I went into their world to join them there. She knew I could do it, that I would be capable of such great things, in her opinion, and it frightened her. She said she was protecting the fairies by closing the door, but she was protecting me. Marion drew in a shaky breath, doing her best to stand despite her legs feeling weak beneath her. Your grandmother must have loved you dearly. Aye, she did that. Marion gazed into his green eyes. I dreamed often of letting the fairies take me after that, to escape the future planned out for me by my father and required of me by my position. But now that I have ye, I don't want to escape any more. He leaned down and kissed her again. Marion smiled, content, but the darkness looming ahead of them clouded her good mood. Now, what should we do about Simon? I tried to speak to my father, but he wasn't any help in the matter. He only told me to trust him. Can you not? How can I place trust in the man who included Simon in the competition for chief? He looked away. Perhaps you dunna ken his whole plan. Marion shot him a wry smile. Of course I dinna ken his whole plan. I'm not certain he even kens at all. Marion, your father has many secrets, he swallowed. He is a ja a Jacobite, aye. He nodded once, but his face was serious, his green eyes bright. I fear that something big is coming. He was desperate to fix relations between the Duncans and the McEwans, and I canna think he wishes to do so simply for the peace. Nay, he has other motives, I'm certain of it. When I spoke to my father, he mentioned the games would be over soon. We are running out of time. You need to prove you're the man he should choose for chief. How, lass? How can I convince others I am the right man for the position when I dunna quite ken myself? My sister hasn't smiled in a year. She hasn't laughed or been happy, and that is my failure. I needed to restore peace in her life, to bring back the sister I kenned for twenty years. If I canna help my own sister, how can I manage an entire clan? Marion stood on tiptoe to direct his face back to her. She laid her palms over his cool, ruddy cheeks. Ye dinna need to make her happy. It isna your responsibility, and you canna put the burden of another person's feelings on your shoulders. You should do the best to support Elin and be there for her, but nay more than that. She slid her hands down his shoulders and rested them on his arms. His green eyes regarded her, his attention wrapped in her as if he longed to find truth in her words. I used to feel similarly about Isabel, I felt I overshadowed her, that I would be in the way of her finding happiness. 
But it did not matter what I did to try and start conversations between her and Kieran. Nathan occurred between them until Isabel made the choice to step forward and speak to the man herself. She is a quiet lass, Marion nodded. She is shy, and I wanted to change that about her, to make her appealing to Kieran in a way I thought would help her. She'd loved him for so long. But changing Isabel wasn't my place. It was my role to support her. Kieran didn't fall in love with her until a step back and allowed her to accomplish it her own way. She had to leave me and find herself, become her own person away from me and my mother wing's protection. Does Isabel ken you felt this way? Nay, but I did support her. When she left to travel to Bongari Spring, I gave her my horse and I did my best to distract the men my father sent to follow her in order to give her more time. I supported her in the wee ways I could. But it is her life and her choice what she does with it. Mary instilled her life and her choice. Exactly like Elan's choice not to remain at Morag forever. If Cormac didn't know this about his sister, Marion could not be the one to share it with him. She didn't want to break Elan's confidence. She released his arms and pressed herself back against the wall. She needed a moment to clear her head. Was she only hoping to keep Elan's secret because she didn't want Cormac to know what his sister planned? Because she feared that the information would cause Cormac to return to Gilmuir with Elan and cease fighting for the role of chief? He watched her with confusion. What is it, Marion? I need to tell you something, but I am afraid it will be breaking Elan's confidence. He grew still, all levity fleeing from his eyes. Marion was uncertain if her advice had reached his heart, if he truly understood that Elan's happiness was not his responsibility. Please tell me, he said hoarsely. Marion looked beyond his shoulder to the beautiful landscape that stretched forth for many miles. A motion caught her eye, and she gently pushed away from Cormac to see better at the parapet's edge. A handful of men on horseback were approaching the house across the narrow loch. Look, she said, pointing. Riders. Could it be Hugh and Rory? he asked, turning to find where she pointed. Nay, it canna be them. These men are heading toward Dalnane. She looked up and held Cormac's eyes. Their coats are red. Catherine had been the wife of Alexander McEwen for nearly 30 years, and in all that time she had come close to losing him a handful of times to the cause. The fight for a Scottish king felt like a never-ending exhausting battle. She'd agreed with Alexander in her youth, her Scottish heart blazing with injustice over the Hanoverian king and the need to return a Stuart to the throne. But age and time had taught her not all battles were worth fighting. Too many of their friends and family had died from a broadsword in an Englishman's hands. Too many of their dear men had perished fighting to bring the rightful king back from France. It was too much to hope they would reach success during Catherine's lifetime and she feared the future she was leaving for her daughter. Though admittedly she understood how Alexander feared the future he was leaving for his kin as well, which was why he would fight until the day he died for the rightful Stuart heir to be restored to the British throne, for the good of Scotland and future McEwen generations. Catherine slipped down to the kitchens and passed the bustle of women preparing the evening meal. Mrs Crabbe, I need a word with ye. Is there a problem with dinner? Agnes Crabbe asked, brushing her hands down her apron. Nay, it is more personal than that. Agnes nodded to the doorway at the far end of the room. The cellar then, madam. Aye, tis not to do with dinner, she said loudly for the benefit of listening ears. I hope to speak to ye about the wedding feast. Catherine led the way down the slippery, worn steps into the belly of the kitchens. The small room was void of air, damp and muffled from the sound above stairs. Agnes carried a candle and held it up, her grey eyebrows pinched. She lowered her voice, though they knew they would not be overheard down here. Hugh and Rory have yet to return. Alexander would not tell me the purpose of their journey. 
only that he could not trust his correspondence in any other hands. He sent them to Edinburgh with a letter, but that is all I can. It'll be on its way to the Bonnie Prince, I reckon. Catherine pinched her hands together, and her stomach tightened anxiously. War is closer than we hope, I fear, and there is naught we can do to stop it. The rising tide will sweep away all those in its path. We must remove ourselves from its path. Catherine knew this well. She had seen it time and again with each new attempt to bring the Stuarts to England. What can we do, Agnes? We've tried everything. Not everything. Agnes grew serious. Your husband has not chosen a victor of the games. They're all Jacobites. No, all of them. Ian certainly is, but Simon can be swayed. The man cares more for cards than he does the bonny prince. There is a reason he nearly lost Kilgannon and the chief had to step in and save their estate. Catherine shook her head. I canna submit my daughter to a life with him. She does not need to remain with him. She could live at Kilgannon if Simon lives here. Many married people of their stations dinna stay together. I dinna want that for my daughter. Do you want all your McEwen sons to die for a prince who canna come fight his own battles? Catherine's heart was ripping in two. She understood Agnes's meaning, but she loved her daughter more than anything, and Marion cared for another man. What of Cormac? We dinna ken his political beliefs. Nay, but we kenned his father. Alistair was as devoted to the cause as your husband. We can he expect less from his son? Nay, I suppose no. Catherine closed her eyes and wished away the oncoming tide of impending danger. The effort made her hands shake, and she failed to steady her fingers. She could plainly see the way Marion looked at Cormac, and his longing was unmistakable. But would it be worth sacrificing a love match if it would save so many of their men? Oh, heavens, she was beginning to sound like her husband. Agnes drew her plump arms around Catherine and pulled her in for a warm embrace. We must all sacrifice for the greater good. It is an honour and a blessing to serve our people. And if you explain so to Marion, surely she will feel the same. On the contrary, Marion would fight it. Catherine swallowed. I'll see what I can do. The door opened at the top of the stairs and light slipped down the wall. Mrs Crabbe, Mrs Crabbe, are you down there? A young voice called frantic. Agnes stepped back and held her candle toward the steps. Yes, child, what is it? There's a fire in the sheep pen. A jolt of fear ran through Catherine. Run, tell McEwen, she yelled. The boy ran from the entryway, letting the door close off the light from upstairs, and the women shared a worried glance before springing into action. Catherine lifted her skirts and ran up the steps and through the kitchen, past the bustling, panicked activity of those who didn't know yet what to do. Fire lifted up from the wooden structure that housed the animals, while sheep, cows and chickens ran free over the field unattended. Men on horseback disappeared into the trees before Catherine could gain a secure look at who they were. She faced the animal pens and swallowed. Flames grew from the straw-hewn pens and licked up the side of Moreg. Her heart leapt to her throat and Agnes appeared behind her, chest heaving. Sound the alarm, Agnes. We're under attack. Chapter 26 Acrid smoke seeped into the kitchens and tainted the air, hitting Cormac's nose before he reached the door. He ran past confused women standing about the room and sucked in smoke-tinged air through his heaving lungs. Cormac had heard the shout warning of a fire from the lookout balcony and ran down the stairs so fast that he could not determine whether Marion followed him, though he knew she would. He pushed the door and stormed outside, running around the corner of Moreg toward where the billowing smoke thickened. Fire engulfed the wooden structure around the sheep pens, and animals littered the grass beyond it. At least the person responsible for the fire had the decency to allow the animals freedom prior to burning their home. He only wondered why they didn't appear to take any of the animals with them. 
Madame McEwen stood in the field, doing her best to coax a sheep toward Morag, but a quick sweep of the area proved that no one else was with her. Men ran from the castle, gasping at the sight of the heavy flames, but lost for direction, and Cormac took action when no one else stepped forward. Buckets! he yelled. We need buckets and we need to form a line from the loch. Not the well! Someone shouted, Nay, that will cost far too much time. Run for buckets, form a line. He repeated the direction as more people filed from the castle. Men and women alike gathered what they could to hold water and formed a line to pass the water from the loch to the animal pens. Cormac ran toward Madame McEwen and her disobedient sheep. You need to get inside. The sheep? It isn't safe out here and your husband would want you inside, I believe. She looked up at him, her cheeks ruddy and raven hair loosened from the wind and cold, but she was still beautiful. Cormac had always seen the resemblance between mother and daughter in appearance, but the stubborn set of her jaw highlighted the similarities in character as well. I will na hide away while my people protect my home. Nay, ya dinna need to hide, but perhaps you can help in a safer location than this until we ken who is responsible and where they are now. Madame McEwen glanced behind her at the open field, the tree line not much further. She gestured toward the woods. I saw two riders escape through there. Do you ken who they were? Nay, I didn't get a good look at them. I do believe they're gone now. Cormac nodded. Still, I think ye better come this way. She nodded and lifted her skirts to return to the castle. Cormac searched the line of people passing buckets. Rupert and Kieran stood at the end, splashing the water in the ever-growing fire. He found McEwen watching him from near the fire, but turned his attention to gathering the animals. He didn't have time to notice whether the chief was angry with him for telling his wife what to do. Cormac ran toward the scattered animals and tried to steer them back toward the castle, but they wouldn't obey. He didn't entirely blame them, for he would not choose to move toward a fire either if he could help it. But his years on his father's farm were not entirely useless, and he managed to group most of the sheep together by the time Kieran rode over on horseback. I can manage this, Kieran called to Cormac's relief. He was never exceptionally good with animals. Where do you plan to put them? Cormac shouted. In the stables. It hasn't been damaged yet. Cormac looked to the line of people trailing from the castle to the loch, but despite the constant water, the fire had not dimmed. It only appeared to have stretched further toward the next pen, rising higher against the castle wall. A faint raindrop fell on Cormac's forehead, and he looked up. The rain that had threatened over the course of the day was here, weak as it seemed to feel. Any rain would help to wet the structures and staunch the fire. Oh, what blessed timing! Rain! Kieran yelled, turning his horse around a group of sheep who wanted to run for the vale. Cormac jogged back toward Morag. The line of buckets had slowed and people looked up, watching the rain increase in density over the castle. It pinged against the surface of the loch and drenched the ground, but the fire was slow to be extinguished. It raged beneath the rain, though the growth had stunted. Pass the buckets! Cormac yelled, racing toward the people. He saw Elin in the line and pride swelled his chest that she joined the fight. Keep the water coming! Dinna stop! With help from the rain, they could utilise this reprieve and put the fire out, but they would need to act now. If the rain slowed too much, it would cease to moderate the flames as well. The line moved into motion again and the buckets were filled and passed. The rain lingered, though the strength of its fall weakened somewhat and urgency lit Cormac's motions. He joined the line and splashed the full buckets over the ebbing flames. The men and women continued to work together while the rain lessened to mist until the pens had sufficiently soaked and the fire disappeared. When the last bucket was thrown over the final lick of hot embers, Cormac stood back, his chest heaving, and surveyed the tired group. No one moved from their place in line, now having a moment to draw a pungent, smoky breath. McEwen stepped forward and clapped Cormac on the back. Ian stood on his other side, hands on his waist and panting for breath. Where was Simon? The women should be inside, 
Cormac said, uneasy. The black marks stretched up the side of the castle, evidence of the malice someone felt toward their people. We didn't ken who did this. I think it was intentional? McEwen asked, his voice measured. Cormac glanced from the destroyed animal pens to the wandering animals. Kieran was doing his best to round them up, but there were many and it was too large a task for one man. Aye, your wife saw men retreating into the woods. Why was nae one guarding the animals? A vera good question, McEwen said quietly, his gaze tracing the parapet that ran the length of Morag's allure. Marion crossed the lawn, sweat and rain slicking the hair at her temples, her cheeks ruddy. The animals need to come into Morag. McEwen shook his head. Nay, they can stay in the stables for now. You think the chickens will lay eggs while they're in with the horses? McEwen looked up at the castle. Aye, we didn't have room in Morag, so they must. Shall I ride into the woods and see what I can find? Ian asked. McEwen nodded once and Ian took off toward the stables. Cormac wanted to go with him, but he needed to tell his chief what he and Marion had seen. It couldn't be a coincidence, surely, that fire was set to Morag at the same time that Redcoats arrived at Dulnane. He shared a look with Marion and could see that she felt the same. He swallowed his apprehension. There are Redcoats at Dulnane. McEwen glanced up sharply. How'd you come by this information? I saw them, he gestured to Marion. We saw them from the lookout on the south side of the castle. McEwen glanced at his daughter and she nodded. They arrived only minutes before we heard the first shouts for the fire. We were outside, so we believe we were among the first to hear the call. I wasna the first out here, Cormac said. But your wife was, and she saw men retreating into the woods. She did not mention them wearing uniforms, though. Duncans, McEwen said darkly. He looked to the house across the loch and spit on the ground. Cormac watched McEwen walk away. I need to help Ian search the woods. Marion took his arm, worry creasing her forehead. What shall we do? We didn't ken if they were Duncans or no. We can try to stem your father's anger and convince him to be rational, I reckon. We didn't ken who started the fire, but we didn't want to attack the Duncans if it wasn't them. Isabel's wedding is tomorrow, Marion said quietly. Miles Duncan was invited. Do you think he will come? Cormac rubbed his chin. I hope he will. The best way to handle this will be through conversation. She looked at her father, who now stood closer to Morag, speaking to Simon. Now we must convince him of that. Chapter 27 Marion had never struggled with sleeping. She had always before had an aptitude for falling asleep quickly and soundly, but last night was a perfect exception. She tossed in her bed all night, unable to settle her mind long enough to relax her body. It was the morning of Isabel's wedding, and Marion was so tired and drawn, she was certain she resembled the spirit she'd threatened Cormac with weeks ago. Had he truly been at Morag so long? It felt like years instead of weeks. Marion walked quietly down the stairs and toward her mother's chamber, slipping inside and hoping to find her alone. Mother sat at her dressing table, securing a pendant around her neck. Blessed relief. Something was going Marion's way. She took in a worried breath and crossed the room. Will the wedding still take place today? Mother glanced over her shoulder. Aye, it shall. We have no choice, really. Mrs Crabbe has been preparing for tonight's feast for weeks. But will Father allow it to proceed as planned? He did not want anyone leaving the castle until we learned who set the fire. He does not have a choice. We cannot make Isabel and Kieran wait any longer. The bands have been read and the kirk is prepared to receive us. Marion's shoulders slumped in relief and she sat on the edge of her mother's bed. Mother's voice softened and she clasped her ruby ear bobs in place. This could soon be ye, Mary. Indeed, she and Cormac. The image of Marion embroidering her own wedding linens rose the tide of warm anticipation in her chest. I hope it soon will be. Father did mention that he wanted to end the game soon. 
mother's hand stilled near her throat, the ruby necklace she'd lent to Marion a few days before dangling over her chest. Did he say why he wished to end them so soon? Nay, only that he wanted me to trust his decision. Mother closed her eyes and drew in a deep breath. She opened them again and proceeded to check the pins in her coiffure. She appeared to be gathering the strength to speak, and that did nothing to relax Marion. Do you no think I should trust him, Mother? I think your father will say and do whatever he must in order to protect his clan. The fire only strengthened that resolve, and it does not help that we dinna ken who started it. Marion swallowed. I love Cormac. Mother glanced away nervously, her eyes and fingers seemingly unable to remain still. Why was she so anxious? Do you love him more than you love your people, Mary? How can I answer that? Marion paused, rising from the bed and taking a step back, fear infiltrating her nerves. Why'd you ask me that? What do you expect of me? Mother closed her eyes. Nathan, I only want ye to consider who the best leader. Cormac will make a fine leader. He stepped in when it became necessary during the fire yesterday. He's proven that he is capable and strong, that the people will listen to his commands in a time of crisis. Mother turned on the seat to face Marion fully. Capable, aye, but does he share your father's beliefs? It hardly matters that he took charge or that people followed his direction. The only way Alexander would ever choose him is if he shares in his beliefs. Did Cormac? Marion didn't know. Panic seized her gut and it was clear now more than ever how little bearing the games had ever had in her father's decision. She scoffed. None of the games mattered, did they? Father would always have chosen a Jacobite. Mother nodded solemnly. Anger sluiced down Marion's spine and she turned away and marched through the adjoining door into her father's study, but it was empty. She crossed to the window and found a group of men gathered on the dry grass before the animal pens, but none of them resembled her father. She closed her eyes and allowed herself to sink into the frustration and anger that clawed at her for five seconds. One, two, three, four... Five. When Marion opened her eyes, she found her mother standing in the doorway with a pearl necklace hanging from her hand. Dinna react too hastily, Marion. You have Isabel's wedding to consider, and she deserves better than for ye to worry and fret all day. Mother was right, but Marion didn't wish to share that opinion while she was still so angry. I dinna want to wear your pearls today. These are no for ye. She held them out. Offer them to Isabel for her wedding. It was a good idea. Marion tempered her anger and took the pearls, sweeping past her mother and into the corridor. She ran upstairs, pumping her legs up the stone circular steps and collided with a man. Marion stepped back, righting herself before she could lose her balance and tumble down the stairs. The fleeting hope she would see Cormac fled, chased away by the hounds of disappointment, It wasn't Cormac she'd run into, it was Simon. His bloodshot eyes followed her away as she backed down another step. Good morning, Simon. She dipped a quick curtsy, her fingers curling around the pearls. Marion moved to pass him, but he slid his hands around her arms and pulled her to a stop, pressing her up against him. She held fast to the pearls, but relaxed her arms. It was best not to struggle until she needed to. She could remove herself from this situation on her own. He opened his mouth to speak, but she cut him off. Have you ever heard me scream, Simon? She asked. I can assure you, I am quite loud. The veins were dark in his eyes. The distant sounds of people preparing to leave for the wedding could be heard. Simon didn't release her, but his grip relaxed a fraction. He held her gaze. Have ye heard the good news? Marion's body flushed cold. Anything good for Simon couldn't be good for her. What is it? I was only just speaking to your father, and he told me the news himself. He intends to announce it tonight at the wedding party. What does he intend to announce? she asked. Tell me now, Simon. He leaned closer, an impish smile curving his lips. 
us, Marion. He has made his decision and he has chosen me. But we knew all along that he intended to choose me, aye? I can further the cause. I can help him restore his prince to the throne. I am willing to do whatever it takes to secure the young pretender's safe arrival in Scottish soil. Disgust rolled through her, but she could not dispute the things Simon said. You bought the position with your politics. Are you even a Jacobite? He shrugged lightly, his voice quiet. I am when it suits me. His whisky-soaked breath washed over her face, and she fought the impulse to gag. I will tell my father you didn't mean it. He laughed, and he will believe ye? Simon was right. Father would never believe her. He knew how distasteful she found Simon, and would surely think she would say anything to be free of the requirement to marry the man. But she would have to try something. Voices filtered into the stairwell from above. The wedding. Marion would try to speak to her father just as soon as the wedding was over. Isabel deserved better than for her day to be ruined by Marion's obsessing over her own future. Release me, Simon, she said through gritted teeth. For now. He waited a beat before letting go of her arms, and she slipped past him and upstairs, her heart racing. She'd gripped the necklace so hard there were pearl-shaped indents lining her palm, and she shook out her hand. She closed her eyes and permitted the residual fear and anger to swim through her body unrestrained. One, two, three, four, five. Marion released a shuddering breath and expelled her concern with it. She could not allow Simon's pronouncement to go uncontested with her father. But first, she needed to celebrate her dearest friend, she pasted a weak smile on her lips and mounted the last few steps until she reached her floor. Isabel stood down the corridor in her deep blue gown, her blonde hair styled simply. Marion inhaled a shaky breath and approached her friend. Come, let us go back inside our room. I want to help ye prepare. Isabel sighed happily. Only if you promise no to make me stand out too much, I will be glad when today is finished. There will be far too much attention on me, I fear. Marion scoffed and pulled Isabel back into their chamber. You yeah, will not even notice the attention. You'll be too busy staring into Kieran's handsome eyes. A soft pink blush bled into Isabel's cheeks. She looked radiant as she was, and Marion heeded her own advice from earlier. She wouldn't try to change her friend. Isabel's beauty didn't need an intricate hairstyle or gaudy jewellery. Mother had selected the perfect necklace for Isabel. Marion led her to the dressing table and dangled the pearls in front of her. Do you want to wear this? Isabel's hand rested on her bare throat. Are you certain? My mother sent them for you. They will be lovely beside the blue of your gown. Isabel watched her fasten the pearls in place through the mirror. I have waited for this moment for years and it has finally come. I had hoped for a beautiful day, perhaps in the midst of summer, and not as wet or cold, but I do not care any longer. I only wish to be married to Kieran. Marion squeezed her shoulders. Do you miss your mother today? I'm sad she is not here, and my father as well, but it has not ruined my day. I have long been alone. You have not been alone. You have had me. Isabel stood and pulled Marion into an embrace. And I will always have ye. Marion squeezed her eyes closed and tightened her arms around her friend. She would not always be here, not if she was forced to run away with Cormac, in which case she would never return to Morag. Marion suppressed the warm tears brimming beneath her eyelids. Perhaps Simon was correct, and she had always expected father would want for him to win, but it wasn't fair to make her flee her home, especially because Simon was the wrong man for the position of chief. Father's Jacobite theologies were strong and unrelenting. She could never make him choose another man, not unless the other man provided something father valued higher than his Jacobite ideals. But did that even exist? I have heard whispers that Miles Duncan will attend the feast tonight, Marion said, stepping back and wiping her eyes. Will that be strange for ye? You were once almost engaged to marry him. Nay, it will na be strange. I like the man. 
He will always be welcome as far as I'm concerned. Marion sighed. Good. Now let us go to the kirk. Kieran is probably waiting. Chapter 28 The great hall brimmed with food and merriment. Isabel and Kieran sat at the head table, paying attention to no one but each other like lovesick fools. It was nauseating in its sweetness. Cormac chuckled softly, certain that he would never look so stricken with love, regardless of how he felt. He had developed strong feelings for Marion, but he liked to think he could control his expression better than Kieran was doing now. Cormac walked the length of the open corridor above the Great Hall so he might go down and join in the festivities. He turned the corner and someone took him by the arm. Gasping, he spun the interloper and locked his elbow around their chest and immediately realised that he held Marion in his arms. His grip slackened at the point of her knife against his hand. Cormac put his hands in the air. You could have taken off my finger. I have more control over the blade than that. Marion stepped back and slid her small knife into her bodice. Undoubtedly, he mumbled. Care to explain why you were wielding a knife? If you would first like to explain why you snatched me out of the corridor like I was a stray redcoat. He circled a hand to indicate the corridor. It is dim and I didna see that it was ye. I canna hear ye walk, lass. He swirled his hand toward the region of her gown that hid her feet. It is blasted strange how quiet ye are. Do the fairies fly ye everywhere ye go? She looked to be hiding a smile. I take soft steps. Ye take silent steps. There is nae spirit hiding in the castle. Is there? Tis only ye. Marion grinned. Nay, there is na spirit. At least know that I can. I fabricated that story to convince ye to leave that room. It did na work. And I have missed a good deal of information because of it. He lowered his voice. That is likely a good thing, Marion. I'm helping ye to be more honest. She glared playfully. You still haven't told me why you were holding a knife. She shrugged softly, her gaze flicking away. In case I needed one. Cormac didn't like the sound of that. Why would you need a weapon inside your own home? What happened to frighten you? I need to ask you something and I need you to be honest with me. Cormac was ready to leap to her honour and defence. He would give this woman anything. What is it? Are ye a Jacobite? That was not what he'd expected. Nay, nee. she narrowed her gaze. Why no? Could you become one? Could you pretend? Or do you support King George? Nay, nee, I canna become a Jacobite, and I canna pretend. Why no? He ran a hand over his face. What was the purpose of this questioning, and how did it relate to her holding a weapon as she walked the corridors of Morag? I canna justify it. Why would I pretend? I want a Stuart back in the throne as much as any man, but I will not sacrifice the lives of those I love for it, no when it seems a fruitless battle. Our fathers and grandfathers have tried time and again to do so, and for what purpose? To restore the rightful king, for honour, for Scotland. He lifted his eyebrows. Or simply to be on the right side of the battle and not end up in the tower but they keep going to the tower and they try again and they fail again. She stepped forward and slid her hands around his waist, leaning forward until her head rested on his chest. The warmth of her against him was soothing and sweet. He wanted the lass and she wasn't fighting fair. You canna pretend for me. Cormac did his best to ignore the warmth that emanated from her touch. Her eyes had been glassy and concerned bloomed in his chest. Why are you pressing this? Her hand tightened around him. Because my father will only choose a Jacobite winner. He has already chosen Simon, but ye could change his mind. Ye could persuade him you're loyal to the cause, and ye do whatever you have to do for Scotland. I canna be so dishonest, lass he said gently. He wanted Marion, but he would have to find another way to make it possible for them to be together. 
His gut flipped at the thought of not marrying this woman. He wouldn't allow that to be his future. I will not tell your father I intend to fight battles I will not fight. Why no? Simon has done exactly that. He only pretends to be a Jacobite when it suits him. After we marry, he'll do whatever he wishes. After we marry? The words were like fiery darts, permeating his chest. Dinna marry him. And run off for ye instead? How's that the more honourable option, Cormac? He was struck by her words, the point driven deeper by the release of her hands. She stepped back and looked wounded, and he wanted to reach for her, but she was correct. He would have been willing to ruin her reputation, but not willing to pretend to support the Jacobites. He would be willing to tear her from her home and her family, to make her destitute as the wife of a failed farmer. If we ran off together, she continued, what would Elin do? She asked the question, but spoke as though she knew the answer already. My sister would come with us. Nay, she wouldna, Marion swallowed. I shouldna say so. But Elin intends to return to Gilmuir after you're settled here. She does not want to stay. I ken she does not want to stay, but I hope to change her mind. She could still do so. She has begun to make friends here. I spoke to her only days ago, and she told me then how she intends to leave. I think she's only waiting for ye to make a decision. Cormac felt like he had been hit in the stomach and robbed of breath. He'd believed things were changing for Elin, that she'd appeared a little happier in recent days than she had in ages. He was certain her change in demeanour had to do with Rupert and Isabel and Marion and the general companionship to be had at Moreg. Castle Moreg was a magical, lovely place. Why would Elin choose to leave it in favour of Gilmuir? Could he allow her to do that? Furthermore, could he force his way into becoming the clan's next chief if it meant not having Elin nearby? That would surely be failing his sister. Cormac's head spun, but he recognised the sound of McEwen's booming voice in the great hall. Your father is speaking. Marion took him by the hand and moved into the corridor to look down on the gathering. Miles Duncan walked into the room, welcomed loudly by McEwen and followed closely by a handful of redcoats. That canna be good, Marion said quietly. You want me to be a Jacobite now? Cormac whispered. She spun, pushing him back until he was out of sight for the people below, and clapped her hand over his mouth. Her chest heaving, Marion slid her hands over his cheeks, tilting his head down so he held her gaze. Dinna say the word aloud, not with them near. You'd be in the noose before sunrise. Forget I said anything about it. It was impossible to deny how she cared for him from the tender way she held his face. We'll find another way. How? Marion's shoulders sank, and he wrapped his arms around her. I dunna ken, but we must. McEwen rose from his seat and stepped forward to welcome the interlopers. After the fire had been set to his animals, he assumed Miles wouldn't have the gumption to attend the wedding feast. Not only was he proven wrong in that assumption, but Miles went a step further, bringing protection with him into Moreg in the form of English officers. A welcome, gentlemen, McEwen said, affecting a polite demeanour while inside he seethed. We are celebrating a wedding. Would you care to join our feast or are you here on a matter of business? Captain Hunt, familiar from his visit last month, gave him a knowing feline smile. Oh, we do not mean to intrude, of course, but we would love to stay for dinner. I cannot speak for my men, but I'm absolutely famished. I did have a wee bit of business to discuss, Miles said, but only if you have a moment. McEwen nodded. Come. He directed his attention to the handful of redcoats. Please eat and drink your fill. We have more than enough for all. Miles looked to Tavish, and his friend followed the Englishmen toward a table where they all sat and began to fill their plates. Conversation died around the redcoats, though the soldiers acted as though they didn't notice it. Or perhaps it wasn't an act, and they truly did not notice it. McEwen's people were uncomfortable in the Englishmen's presence. 
and the resulting thickness in the air was nearly palpable. McEwen walked back toward his table and gestured for Miles to follow him. We have the fortune of having the redcoat sit down Nain, Miles explained, though his tone spoke as though he didn't find it a fortunate occurrence at all. They are staying as my guests for the time being. McEwen glanced back. Tavish sat near Captain Hunt and scowled. Though that wasn't an uncommon expression on the man from what little McEwen had seen of him, they took their seats at the head table, and McEwen gestured to old Rupert that it was time for music. Surely they could speak more freely if the room was filled with the sound of the pipes. What better to dispel the discomfort than to invite dancing? Kieran and Isabel moved down to the centre of the room when Rupert brought out his pipes to begin the dancing, and McEwen was left alone at the table with Miles. I didn't ken you would be bringing guests, McEwen said. Did the man believe he needed protection to enter Morag? Neither did I. McEwen paused. Could he believe Miles? The man hadn't given him reason to distrust him before, but after the fire nothing was certain. McEwen filled his plate and took a swig of wine. How long do they intend to stay? Hunt has not given me any indication of when he plans to leave. I hope they will be gone before my brother-in-law visits. They will not be compatible. McEwen scoffed. Ivor Duncan fears the redcoats. Nay. Miles took a bite of his mutton. It is not fear. Ivor has certain tendencies that dinna suit the redcoats. Did Miles try to imply the Duncan chief was a Jacobite? McEwen's stomach tightened, or was it a trap? Surely if Ivor was a Jacobite, then Blue Bonnet would have discovered it already and passed the information on to McEwen. Regardless, he needed to step carefully. The man did not fight at Glenshiel. Nay, he was not old enough then. If McEwen was properly interpreting the conversation, then Miles wanted him to know the Duncans were led by a Jacobite as well. But if that was the case, why had Blue Bonnet said nothing of it in his correspondence? Surely McEwen could trust his own informant more than the word of this near stranger. The presence of the Redcoats only further led McEwen to believe that they were somehow laying a trap, that they only wanted him to admit his affiliation so they could take him in. Captain Hunt and his men had crossed the threshold into Moreg twice in the last month and they wouldn't have done so if they did not have suspicions. Given the recent developments from France, McEwen was positive that he needed to be more diligent than ever about protecting his people and hiding their affiliations. If he could prove he had nothing to hide, however untrue that was, the Redcoats would leave them be. But until then, surely they would be watching him closely. And where better to do that than in the house across the loch? Cormac entered the Great Hall and looked from the table of officers to McEwen. They held one another's gaze for a moment before Marion entered behind him. She swept past Cormac and crossed the room to sit with Elin. Captain Hunt's gaze snagged on her as she passed and followed her about the room. She moved with grace and poise in a way that reminded McEwen of his wife and his chest surged with the need to protect his daughter from the scum in redcoats, to protect his clan. If Miles spoke the truth, then they could help one another. If he was setting a trap, then all would be over. McEwen had never been fond of gambling and tonight he wouldn't do so until he had no other choice. He lifted his goblet and drank deeply before setting it on the table with a thud. We had a fire yesterday. I saw the smoke, Miles said. What happened? Someone lit our animal pens. They were gracious enough not to burn our animals alive in the process and let them into the field, but it was curious they did not take any with them. They likely left the animals so they would not be caught. Miles paused and faced him. You dinna think it was the work of Duncan men, do you? We were too busy entertaining the redcoats yesterday to lay siege to your animals. He looked away thoughtfully, his eyebrows bunching. What if it was the watch? I have been receiving reports of them harassing the people in the south. My reports state the watch remained in Brillug and the Duncans were harassing my people in the south. Miles leaned back in his seat. 
It would appear that one of us has been receiving false information, or one of them was lying and McEwen wasn't. It would be far easier to be friends and foes, Miles. Agreed, he said immediately. I want to trust ye. If ye had married Isabel, then we could have that trust. He waved a hand toward where Isabel danced with Kieran. Alas, it is too late for that. That would not work anyway, I am no available. So ye said before. They fell silent, and Simon approached the table and took a seat on McEwen's empty side. McEwen didn't like the lad's gumption, though he admitted he had given Simon a bit of a reason to believe he deserved to sit there. He never should have implied he was close to making his decision. He knew very well he was leading Simon to believe he was the victor, but McEwen wanted to see how he would react with that confidence. If McEwen was being honest, Cormac was a perfect choice in every way but one. He located the man and watched him lean over the table to speak to Ian both men laughing at something. He had integrated himself well with the people here and was clearly a man born to lead. But when McEwen spoke to Cormac about his father's involvement in the war, Cormac made it clear that he didn't know about Alistair's Jacobite sympathies and furthermore that he was not a subscriber of those beliefs himself. McEwen had even gone so far as to send Ian to search Cormac's chambers for anything which might indicate what the man believed but he'd found nothing odd or telling except for a large rock in the man's trunk. Peculiar thing, that. Ian would be the best choice if he'd possessed a leader's heart, but he didn't. He had a follower's heart. The chief had to be a man others would follow. Simon's cheating aside, which only proved how far he was willing to go to achieve victory, an admirable trait in war. He was the only man who upheld McEwen's Jacobite beliefs and could lead. Cormac had proved integrity and honour, certainly, but would he be willing to fight for the Bonnie Prince? Catherine stood near the newly married bride and groom and caught McEwen's eye and he questioned himself. Perhaps he had been too abrupt in making his decision, but what other choice did he have? He hated forcing Marion to wed someone she despised, but Simon was the only man who would both lead the clan well and willingly go to Prince Charles's aid a required attribute. He could only see one possible path before him, as much as it pained him to not give his daughter what she wished. McEwen had promised his men to the Stuarts for the fight, and he would not break his oath. That was it. It had to be Simon, and Marion would have to come to terms with that. Chapter 29 Marion looked up at the head table and noticed her father speaking quietly to Miles. Whatever cause Simon had to infiltrate such a private conversation by sitting near them, father did not look pleased by it. She pushed them away from her thoughts and crossed toward where her mother was speaking to Isabel. Marion took Isabel's hand. I am happy for you both. Thank you, Mary. Kieran slid his hand around his wife's waist. I believe we are to dance again. Isabel grinned and allowed him to lead her away. Marion stepped closer to her mother. Is there to be an announcement tonight? Unlikely, mother said quietly. Your father doesn't like when his plans are tampered with, and he certainly will not announce the next clan chief with an English audience present. He planned to do it with Miles here. Mother lifted her eyebrows. Aye, but the Duncans are Scots. Marion looked at the officers across the room and her gaze snagged on the man with a scar running through his eyebrow and down his cheek. His skin was tight, his expression uneven, and his beady eyes trailed over the room as though with nefarious purpose. Cormac still sat with young Rupert and Elin, and he held her gaze with questioning and determination. The long strains of the bagpipes filled the room and others gathered with Kieran and Isabel to form a reel. Old Rupert played the music without restraint, apparently uncaring that the scarred captain winced with each Scottish note. If he wasn't pleased with their pipes, he could leave. Isabel looked radiant in Kieran's arms. Marion would have liked for the wedding to be in the spring and not the winter, so she could have been able to fashion a flower crown, but the pearls at Isabel's throat and the blue of her gown looked well on her. 
she exuded joy and no flowers, however vivid, would have improved upon that. Kieran's clear affection for his wife was both bitter and sweet, clinging to Marion and twisting her stomach between sour to pleasant. She wanted to dance, but singling out Cormac now would be unwise. Marion's gaze found the head table again, and she excused herself from her mother's side to cross the room. Good evening, father, she said, curtsying. He dipped his head in acknowledgement alongside Miles and Simon, though she ignored the latter. Marion turned to Miles. Do you dance, sir? He was silent for a beat of apparent surprise before nodding. He stood, setting his napkin on the table. Would you care to dance, Miss McEwen? Certainly. He stepped out from around the table and led her across the room where others were taking their places. The dance had yet to begin, so Miles and Marion took their places. Old Rupert played his pipes in earnest and the dance began. Strangers and friends alike managed to put aside their differences and dance in the circular motion the reel required. Their exuberance could be easily felt across the room, the joy and entertainment bleeding from the Scots and suffocating the fear and apprehension the Redcoats had brought into the hall with them. Marion had scarcely felt such a release of inhibitions as she did dancing in the centre of the room and celebrating the union of her dearest friends. While she liked Miles, she did wish she could have shared the moment with Cormac instead. When the dance was complete, Miles bowed to Marion, a smile spreading over his ruddy cheeks. That was more enjoyable than I recalled. Thank ye, she said. Marion waited for the Christies to pass before stepping closer. This seemed to gather Miles' attention. I dinna believe that ye set fire to our sheep pen. His eyebrows rose. Oh? But my father does. What can we do to stop the strife before it becomes a deeper problem? Miles regarded her. I think your people need to come to my house. I've visited Moreg twice, so my people can. I trust you enough for that. Now your father needs to show your people that ye trust me the same. You did not trust us enough to bring your mother to dine this evening as you did last time, Marion said. Miles looked at her. My mother has been ill. Oh, forgive me. He waved away her words. We've begun a new tonic and it appears to be helping. I am rather hopeful, in fact, that she will be well soon. But she was not in any condition to travel here this evening. I hope she recovers swiftly. Marion glanced at the soldiers on the other side of the hall, unable to find fault with Miles. Ye expect my father to come to Delnane while Redcoats are in residence? They will not remain forever, but even if they were present, it would show your faith even more so. My brother-in-law will be visiting soon. I will send an invitation when he arrives. Then I will do my best to make certain it is accepted. Miles lifted one sandy brown eyebrow. Even if the redcoats are there. Marion swallowed her reservations. Miles was correct. They would need to trust one another and prove that trust to their people if they ever wished to end the strife between the clans. Aye, even then. Miles looked over her shoulder and froze, his eyes widening slightly. Who is that? Marion followed his gaze to where Elan sat in conversation with her brother and young Rupert. Miles had not specified that he'd asked after a woman but Marion assumed Elan's beauty had caught him by surprise. Her name is Elan McEwen. She's visiting with her brother. Elan, he said quietly. Do you want me to introduce you? Och, nay. He cleared his throat and looked away. I would not wish to bother her. She merely looks like someone I met recently, and it took me by surprise. Where did you meet Elan? Nay, it was not her. He smiled kindly and bowed. It was a pleasure to dance with you. Marion dipped in a curtsy. The pleasure was all mine. Miles walked away and she paused, his words pinging around in her head, hitting on recognition. Something he had said resonated with her, but she couldn't place it. She glanced up and found the scarred officer watching her, his beady eyes dark and his mouth void of a smile. The way he looked at her made her skin crawl, and she immediately knew he was not a man she could trust. Trust, that was it. That was how she would convince her father to choose Cormac. 
she found him speaking to Simon at the head table and turned toward him. If she could convince him Cormac was a choice he could trust, would he value that above his political ideals? Marion reached her father's table and he glanced up from his cup of wine. He looked over her shoulder, his eyebrows pulling together in confusion. What is it? Marion asked, following his line of vision. Rory stumbled through the door into the main hall, his face bloodied and arm hanging limp at his side. His steps were uneven, his clothing dark and stained from mud or blood, or perhaps a mixture of the two. Marion gasped quietly, and Father rose, gathering the attention from the room. Old Rupert's pipes came to an abrupt halt. Oh, Lord, what happened to you? Where is Hugh? Father called. Rory opened his mouth to speak, but he seemed to notice the English officers for the first time, and what little colour his cheeks possessed immediately drained from his dirty face. The scarred captain jumped to his feet. Arrest this man by order of the crown. The redcoats spurred into action, and Rory turned from the room to flee. Someone near the door slammed it closed behind Rory and bolted it, and Father marched out from behind the table toward the redcoats. On what charges? he bellowed, and the strength of his power and authority rang through the room. The Englishman who'd immediately gone to chase Rory paused, hesitating by the door and looking between father striding toward them and their scarred captain. I have welcomed you to my table, Captain Hunt, father continued, and I expect an explanation before you chase down my man in my own home. Captain Hunt pulled his sword from the sheath at his hip and the quiet in the room shifted into complete stillness. You are only attempting to distract us long enough for the prisoner to escape. I will not allow this farce to continue. He swept his sword in the direction of the doors. Unbolt those at once and allow us through. On what charges? Father repeated. Captain Hunt gritted his teeth together. He looked from the door to the chief, clearly discerning that no man in this room would move without approval from their chief. He was taken prisoner on the road two days ago for transporting a Jacobite missive. He will be returned to Fort William promptly. Was he taken alone? Captain Hunt narrowed his eyes. Let us pass. Ye may pass when you've answered me. Was he taken alone? Captain Hunt's face grew red, his eyes dark as coal. Yes, the man was taken alone. Father, apparently satisfied with this answer and comforted in the fact that Hugh had undoubtedly escaped, motioned to the door. It was opened, and the redcoats rushed out of the hall and into the empty corridor. Search every room, Captain Hunt yelled. Father's face was hard as stone, anger emanating from him like the billowing smoke clouds and tainting the air. He glanced over his shoulder and nodded to someone behind Marion. Ian, Cormac and Kieran brushed past her and out the door, following the redcoats. Father seethed. I will allow you a quarter hour to search for your man, and then I expect ye to be gone from my castle, with or without him. Captain Hunt's hand tightened on his sword, his knuckles turning ghostly white in his grip. Need I remind you that you are under British rule? Father did not need to reach for his sword to appear menacing. One quarter hour, he repeated. It was unclear if the captain meant to argue further. He glared a moment longer before leaving to join his men in the hunt. Marion only hoped Rory had found a decent hiding place. Chapter 30 Cormac followed two of the redcoats up the stairs and watched them enter each chamber that remained unlocked. One at a time they tore bedsheets from clearly empty beds and dumped the contents of trunks on the floor that were far too small to contain a person. By the time he watched them ill-treat the third chamber, he turned and ran down the stairs. The hunt for Rory was merely an excuse... They were clearly looking for something in particular, something small that could be hidden anywhere. Cormac came upon McEwen in the corridor outside his study. What is it? McEwen growled softly. They dinna care about Rory, he said softly, hoping to avoid being overheard. They are searching for a wee something. What could they be looking for? And do you need help to hide it? 
McEwen stared at him long and hard. Brian approached before he had a chance to answer and glared at Cormac, then turned his attention to the chief. You shouldn't speak to them so boldly, brother. You're asking for trouble. Nay, I'm protecting my men. Your man is wanted. He will not be a man much longer. McEwen bared his teeth. If they find him. But they weren't looking for Rory, not really. Which McEwen must have guessed at, for he didn't appear surprised by Cormac's announcement. McEwen continued, I thought my fifteen minutes were rather generous. Cormac looked at him sharply, and McEwen shook his head. They'll find Nathan, and in a fash, but when the quarter hour has passed, I want your help herding them outside. I will not allow this to proceed a moment longer than that. Of course, Cormac agreed. He turned to run back upstairs to watch the Englishman ransack so he might know if they took anything. When he reached the next floor up, someone grabbed him on the back of his coat and yanked him backwards on the stairs. He fell down a few steps, knocking his head into the stone wall on his way back. Pain erupted in the side of his head, sending sparkling black to the edges of his vision. Cormac scrambled up, but a blow landed on his side and he fell hard on the stone steps. He looked back in time to see Brian rear back his leg for another kick and roll to the side before it could connect. The stone steps dug into his tender ribs and he pushed himself up. You dinna learn when you're no wanted, eh? Brian, the man who tried to kill him wasn't Simon after all. Or perhaps they'd worked together. Brian landed a punch to Cormac's jaw and his head slammed back into the wall again, dizzying his vision. The chaos occurring above and below them muffled the sound of Brian's attack, so Cormac was certain no one could hear them. He reached into his stocking and pulled out his dirk. Brian attempted another hit and Cormac sliced the knife down over his forearm. He managed to jump onto the landing above him, but Brian followed. Cormac shoved him into the corridor so they might be on more equal footing. You think you're clever, lad, Brian said, his chest heaving and eyes wild. I saw you in the stables. I ken well what you were doing. Cormac shook his head, unclear. It radiated pain and it was difficult to focus on Brian in front of him. When had the man seen him in the stables? He'd never done anything nefarious with the animals. Are you trying to say I started the fire? Nay, I saw you in the stables with Marion. You thought you could woo the chief's daughter, that if you gained her favour you would win. Cormac was so shocked by this pronouncement that he was lost for words. The man had watched him in the stables when they'd nearly kissed. If he'd been paying closer attention, he would have noticed Cormac step back and respect the woman, not attempt to woo her into a false sense of love. Marion's opinion has no bearing on the chief's choice, Cormac said. That does not mean you did not try to sway her. Cormac shook his head, ready to defend himself. When McEwen stepped from the stairwell, he looked between them, Cormac bloodied and holding a knife to his brother. The man is mad, Alexander, Brian said, his wide eyes portraying false fear. I came up to help him monitor the redcoats and he pulled his dirk on me. He cannot bear to lose the games to my son. Cormac's chest heaved, but his hand was perfectly still and he kept the dirk raised. He would not defend himself, not in a case that came down to each man's word against the other. No proof could be had to save him. But surely the chief had more important things to concern himself with at present than this minor quibble. Cormac's head ached and his face throbbed and he wanted to be gone from this corridor. That'll be enough out of you, Brian, McEwen said. Go down and watch the men near the door. I want to be certain every last redcoat is gone. Count for six of them. Brian passed Cormac, his smug smile leaving him sick. McEwen remained quiet until the sound of Brian's footsteps receded. Was Cormac going to be told to leave Moreg? McEwen ran a hand over his grey beard. You'll only have one minute. Tell me what occurred. It was unmistakable from the way McEwen had dismissed his brother and the careful way he watched Cormac that he was testing him in some way. 
Even if Simon had been truthful and McEwen truly had informed him that he'd been chosen, no announcement had yet been made, which meant that Cormac still had a chance. But what would McEwen value most? Was he testing to discern whether or not Cormac would snitch on Brian's behaviour? The oaf had clearly hurt Cormac and walked away nearly unscathed. The cut in his arm was but a scratch. He considered Marion and what he would do for her, then he considered the clan. If Cormac intended to fight for her hand because he loved her, he would also need to lead the McEwans, and despite his reservations, he believed he could do so, but only because of her. I love your daughter, McEwan. I canna help it. Contrary to what your brother thinks, I didna set out with designs to fool her into loving me with trickery. I fell for her because of the incredible woman she is. And the fight? McEwen asked, unmoved by this declaration. Cormac swallowed. This was his one chance and he wouldn't waste it. He was finished trying to decipher what the chief wanted from him. He would show McEwen who he was and if he won his favour, then he did so on his own merit. Cormac ignored the question and slid his dirk into his stocking. Straightening, he held McEwen's gaze. I would make a good chief, sir, not because I am willing to lead my men into battle, to care for the people across McEwen territory, or because of the king I support. I would make a good chief because I would not do so alone. Your daughter is a born leader, and her intellect and cunning and compassion would serve your people well. Alone, nay man would be sufficient, but with Marion by my side, we could be the leaders needed for the upcoming dark times. A crash sounded down the corridor, and the two redcoats vacated one chamber and moved on to the next. McEwen's jaw flexed, and my brother? Your brother does not like me. McEwen nodded. No more was needed. He moved to pass Cormac, but Cormac put up his hand. He lowered his voice, well aware that speaking the way he was about to was dangerous, given the company just down the corridor. If Nathan else consider the point that by choosing me, the only man in your competition who is no an alleged Jacobite, you'll be allaying suspicion from the Redcoats. Another crash in the bedchamber punctuated his point. At present, I dunna think you can smirk at the value in that. McEwen held his gaze, his steely eyes dancing between Cormac's with measured calm. He took a step away and lifted his chin. Your time is up, he yelled, then lowering his voice added, Remove them from my castle. Cormac walked away to do exactly that, his heart racing. He wasn't certain whether or not he'd reached the chief's sympathies with any of his points, but he did his part to lay out the reasons he should be considered. He'd left nothing hidden, despite his reservations about his own capabilities. Marion believed in him, and he did believe in himself, so long as she was at his side. He'd been comfortable giving orders and moving into action the moment he discovered the fire, and it had been a revelatory experience for the inhabitants of the castle to listen to his orders and work together to put the fire out. He knew he could lead with Marion. He strode into Marion's room in time to watch the soldiers tear the top drawer from her dressing table and dump the contents across the floor. A necklace broke and beads scattered over the floorboards. That'll be enough then, Cormac shouted. You heard the chief. He holds now authority over us, one of the soldiers spat. Aye, but you dinna want to incur his wrath while you're on his land, I reckon. You might want to consult your captain before you make moves toward war. That seemed to catch their attention. The soldier holding another drawer dropped it without bothering to dump it over, and the drawer splintered, cracking over the stone hearth. Cormac heard an intake of breath and looked over his shoulder to find Marion standing behind him, a slight frown marring her otherwise plain expression. The soldier swept past Cormac and down the steps. I must follow to be certain they leave. Marion took his hand, the line deepening between her raven eyebrows. My father is at the bottom of the staircase. He will do so. She moved to reach for his cheek, but curled her fingers in before making contact with his skin. Who did this to you? It does not matter now. 
the stubborn set of her mouth argued otherwise. Who, Cormac? He had no reason to keep it from her. Your uncle. Brian? Aye, it was him, not Simon all along. Marion swore, shaking her head in apparent disgust. Cormac's heart was too frightened to hope, contracting in his chest in tight, tense motions. I fought for you, Marion. Her eyes brightened. What about your sister? You're right. Her happiness isn't my responsibility, though I do feel it is acceptable for me to worry about her. I fear I always will. Marion's hand tightened over his. It is perfectly acceptable. Concern about her happiness and responsibility for it isn't the same thing. Now we must pray your father chooses me, he said. Marion nodded and followed him from the room. They went down the stairs and through the corridor toward the door. McEwen stood at the entrance, arms crossed over his chest and flanked by Ian and Brian. Together they made an imposing impression and Captain Hunt, his sword finally sheathed again, approached them with Miles and Tavish on his heels. We shall see you again soon, I imagine, Captain Hunt said, pausing at the door. Do not forget the penalties for escaping the law. No one is exempt from the law. McEwen said nothing, merely waiting silently until Captain Hunt turned and strode through the door. When Miles and Tavish had gone through as well, Ian closed the door and bolted it behind them. Wherever Rory had gone, it was a blessed thing he hadn't been found. Everyone is gathered, brother, Brian said, commanding the attention from the people in the room. It was far from everyone gathered, but clearly Brian had a plan. At least this one did not involve a large rock above Cormac's door, lying in wait to crush him. Brian threw his arms out to indicate Ian and Simon. Flickering torchlight drew shadows over the small room. Who shall it be? Neither, McEwen said, irritation radiating from him in waves. He looked at Cormac, then to Marion. Brian scoffed. You canna mean that. McEwen searched the room until he paused on his wife. Aye, I mean it. The winner of the games granted permission to wed my daughter and fall next in line for Chief McEwen is... Cormac. The floor seemed to fall out from beneath Cormac, his body floating as if by magic. Marion sucked in a breath beside him, and her hand found his, squeezing his fingers briefly before letting go. The veins on Brian's temples bulged in his anger. Simon deserves this. Simon has been training for the role since his infancy. He pointed at Cormac. He's fooled Marion into thinking he loves her. I heard him tell another man myself of his devious plan. That is not true, Cormac said. I dunna ken why I'm being singled out in this way. Because of your father, McEwen said, giving his brother a hard look. Alistair took the woman Brian loved and he's never forgiven him. Simon looked at his father sharply. Is this true? Brian huffed, his chest rising and falling quickly. That has long since been in the past. Then leave it there, McEwen snapped, or ye will be invited to leave Moreg. The room felt thick and heavy with tension. McEwen crossed toward his wife and drew his arm around her back. My decision stands. They left the room and Cormac looked over his shoulder to find his sister in the doorway, a stricken look on her face. She attempted to cover it with a smile, but it became more of a grimace. She turned from him and ran. Cormac leaned close to Marion's ear and whispered, Can we celebrate later? I need to speak to my sister. Of course. She tilted her head to kiss him on the cheek, and he left to follow Elin. Nothing could ruin his happiness in this moment. He'd won Marion's heart and her father's blessing. Mountains loomed ahead that they would need to traverse, but they would do so together. Chapter 31 Elin slipped into her chamber and knelt to gather her things which had been strewn over the floor. She searched the pile of fabrics until she located the rough brown wool, and pressed her fingers over it. The necklace was still there. Sweet, silent relief swept through her, 
and she tucked it into her bodice when she heard Cormac's loud, familiar steps echo in the corridor. He slowed before entering her room, and she felt sorrow that he was so concerned with how she felt. He didn't need the burden she provided in his life. Soon he would no longer be forced to carry it. Cormac swore under his breath, Bloody redcoats. They did not want anything to do with Rory. No, really. They were searching for something. Do you ken what they were looking for? He shook his head. Proof to give them a reason to take the clan chief, most likely. I dunna think they found anything. Blessed relief. Aye. Elin bent to gather her clothing and fold it again, and Cormac knelt beside her, writing the overturned trunk. He put a hand over hers and she stilled and looked into his eyes, his own bright with emotion. "'You love her,' Elan said. Cormac nodded, but he still looked worried. "'I do. I want to marry her, Elan. You dinna believe the lies Brian told, do you?' "'Nay, anyone who kens you wouldna believe it,' she said, and she knew the truth of her own words— Cormac was a good man and an honest one. He was perfect for the role McEwen had chosen him for, and the clan was lucky to have him. I am no sad that you've chosen to remain here and marry Marion. I like her, and I think she suits you well. Then what is it? You must leave. Elan nodded. She shouldn't be surprised he would know. She had told him when they first arrived at Moreg she didn't want to remain long. I canna stay. I want to return to Gilmuir. I ken the Lundies would allow me to stay with them. Anna told me so before she left. But Gregor? He will not be a problem, Cormac. Elin knew her way around a knife. She would protect herself. He sat back on his heels and rested his hands on his thighs. Can you stay a wee bit longer? She stilled. How long? I will not leave before you're married, if that is what concerns you. Nay, I hope to be married as soon as possible, Cormac said, grinning. That would only keep you here another three weeks. There is much ahead of me I need to manage, and I fear I have not had much time to spend with you since we arrived. The competition stole much of my attention. What are you asking, Cormac? It felt as though he was building up to something, and that worried her. Elin struggled to deny her brother anything. She would need to remain strong. We have yet to discover who set the animal pens on fire. The soldiers are across the loch and determined to take McEwen, and there is no peace established between the Duncans and ourselves. I feel the weight of the responsibility for these things, and the mantle has not yet been placed on my shoulders. Elin lowered the stack of clothing in her trunk and sat back on the floor. Come out with it. I want ye to stay forever, but I can, I canna ask it of ye. Can ye give me six months? Only half a year to have ye by my side, and time to make the crossing back to Gilmuir safe, if you still desire to leave. You're hoping to change my mind? Aye, he gave her a boyish grin. After six months, if ye still desire to leave, I will drive ye myself to the Lundy's door. Elin chewed on her lip, looking past Cormac to the dark sky beyond the window. The frigid turn in the air felt like incoming snow, and she wouldn't be surprised if they woke up to a blanket of white the following morning. In six months' time it would be spring, which would make the journey both more comfortable and, hopefully, safer. What was another six months? She could not deny the small amount of excitement she felt for the opportunity to spend more time with Cormac, and to better know her future sister-in-law. After what Elin had done, she certainly didn't deserve this extension of grace, but she would not deny it for the sake of argument. Cormac's reasons were perfectly valid. Very well, I will stay. Cormac whooped and dragged her into an embrace. For six months only, Cormac, she said, her voice muffled by his shoulder. He crushed her to him. Then ye will return me to Gilmuir. I, I am a man of my word, he said quietly, holding her to him. She closed her eyes and imagined his strong arms were those of her father's. It took great effort not to allow the welling tears to fall. Elin inhaled a shaky breath. 
I love you, you daft loon. Cormac squeezed harder. I love you, sister. Marion slipped into Cormac's bedchamber and marvelled at the disarray wrought by the awful soldiers. She gathered the bed hangings and laid them across the bed. They'd been ripped down and would need to be repaired before they would hang again. Cormac was looking ahead to a few cold nights by the time Marion would be able to make it across the entire length of fabric. She sighed and knelt to gather the contents of his trunk for him. She'd spent the better part of the hour since the soldiers left in her own chamber, setting it to rights alongside Isabel, and except for the broken draw and a ruined necklace, her things remained mostly unharmed. Marion's eye snagged on the curled edge of the carpet, and temptation settled briefly on her chest. She didn't know whether or not her father was in his study, but surely it wouldn't hurt to check. Marion crossed to the small table and blew out her candle. She would not make the mistake of being found twice in the same compromising position. She rolled away the carpet and removed the loose board. Lying flat on the floor, Marion pressed her ear to the hole and strained to listen. Father was speaking, though it was unclear who he was speaking to. His voice was soft. Marion closed her eyes and pressed her ear further down. You think it was the soldiers? I saw the men disappearing into the woods and the didna wear uniforms. Mother, why was she speaking to him in the study? Father sighed. No them exactly, but someone hired by the soldiers perhaps. I dunna ken the reasons yet, but they must have had a plan. They didn't come here tonight for Rory. They came for something else, and he provided them with the excuse to search our home. You dinna think they came for ye? Mother asked. Nay, that is precisely what I think, he sighed. That is why it is more important now than ever to choose Marion's husband. They must be married straight away, so Cormac can step in if he needs to. He is in danger as long as Brian remains at Moreg. He canna still be angry at Alistair. That was thirty years ago, and Sarah never loved him. Nay... She didna love any but Alistair. Elan is the picture of her mother. I imagine seeing Elan brought up the old memories for Brian. Mother sighed. And Cormac, you think him capable to lead? There was a pause and Marion leaned closer still. She realised she shouldn't be eavesdropping, but this was what she needed to know. Why had her father changed his mind? I didna realise the importance of a supportive wife when I first married you, Catherine. I thought you were beautiful, aye, but didna care for more than that. The last thirty years have taught me the value of having a strong wife at my side. Ye are vital to this clan. Mother's voice was strained when she spoke again. Why do you say these things now? I didna realise it until Cormac spoke to me. He told me he loves Marion, but he only deserves to win because he kens he will be a good chief with her at his side, that together they will succeed. Wise man, mother said. It helped me to see that I have ye to thank as well. I've always kenned you were an asset, and I want a chief who will see the same in Marion. I have been focused on the right man to lead my people into battle. Cormac can do that, and by choosing him... I might allay some of the suspicion from the redcoats. I didna ken you were possessed of a romantic heart, Alexander. Marion sat up, unsure she wanted to continue to listen. Her chest warmed with love, and she didn't notice the noise outside the door until it swung open and Cormac's candlelight fell over her. She straightened quickly and moved the plank into place, rolling the carpet over it in one smooth motion. Cormac closed the door behind himself, a slow grin spreading over his lips. I thought you'd grown too mature for such antics. I couldn't help it, she said, rising to her feet. I wanted to hear what my father had to say about why he chose you. You couldn't have simply asked him. She could have, but she wasn't sure he would have given her an honest answer. Marion shook her head. I will not do it again. In fact, I will secure the loose board myself tomorrow. Cormac crossed the room and set his candle on the table. I will assist you. Marion stepped into his arms. I need to be getting back to my own chamber. 
Surely you will not be missed for a few moments more. Isabel is in her new chamber now. Aye, I suppose I can spare a few moments. Grand. He tipped her chin up and leaned down. Is Elin Vera upset? Cormac paused just before his lips reached hers and leaned back a little. I dunna want to speak about my sister right now, lass. I have much more enjoyable things in my mind. Cormac, she said in a warning tone. He chuckled. Elin has agreed to stay for six months. She will remain until spring so she might spend more time with us. And then I will take her to Gulmuir to stay with the Lundies. That is kind of you to compromise. Aye, I'm a very kind man. He leaned down again and trailed feather-like kisses along her jaw until he reached her lips and Marion erupted in relief and joy. She knew there was much hardship ahead of them, but it would be manageable with Cormac at her side. Together they could withstand anything England or the Duncans chose to present to them. Cormac pulled away. You better leave before you're discovered missing. Aye, because then my reputation will be ruined. Who will have me then? Cormac shook his head, laughing, and pulled her toward the door. Off we you now. Marion went back for her candle and lit it with Cormac's flame before stepping into the corridor. He followed her out. Where are you going? Until Brian and Simon leave. I don't want to leave you alone. She took his hand and let him lead her to her bedchamber. Once they reached the door, Marion whispered, I love ye. I love ye too. Chapter 32 McEwen waited until the entire castle was asleep before he snuck downstairs and let himself outside. It had been ages since he'd met with Blue Bonnet in the flesh, but after the recent developments, he didn't have a choice. He couldn't trust a letter in the fairy tree any longer. It had been four days since the wedding feast and he was no closer to discovering who had started the fire at Morag. Fortunately, Rory had been concealed and his wounds seemed to and the officers hadn't returned for him quite yet. McEwen trudged through the fresh powdery snow, grateful for the cloud cover that made the dark night darker. He reached the point where they had determined to meet and a shadow moved near the water's edge. A boat rocked gently against the bank, its steady, quiet thump punctuating the still night. McEwen stilled. Blue bonnet? He asked the silence. Aye, a voice said. I wasn't a seen. Good. If they were discovered together, the entire plan could become useless. McEwen moved further into the trees and leaned against a trunk. Blue Bonnet followed him, his eyes glinting softly. The red coats? McEwen prompted. Still at Dulneen. They've given nae reason to believe they intend to leave soon. The watch? Still down in Brilug with the remaining officers, there does not seem to be any sightings of them that would place them near Moreg on the day of the fire. McEwen pressed his lips together. He disliked having so little information, feeling so vulnerable. He was tempted to tell Blue Bonnet that it was time to make his identity known to Ian, perhaps Cormac as well. But no, until it was vital, they needed to keep the code name intact. It protected them all. You're certain it was not the Duncans who set the fire? Aye, it could have been. They were too busy welcoming the Redcoats. He swallowed, afraid he already knew the answer to the next question he asked. And Hugh? Nay word yet. Rory does na ken where he went. Nay, they had Rory tied up and Hugh slipped away. He could be anywhere. There was a beat of silence before Blue Bonnet spoke again. If he escaped before Rory slipped away, why did na Hugh return to Moreg? That was McEwen's question as well. He swallowed his reservations and looked Blue Bonnet in his gleaming eyes. We need to get word to France that we might be compromised. Will you go? Me? Blue Bonnet took a step back. I'll be caught. In his hesitancy and probable fear, the man seemed younger than his thirty years, and that grated on McEwen. Why would you think that? Because they ken my face. Weak excuse. 
Nay, nee, man kens that you're a Jacobite. You're the safest man to send. You only need to travel to Edinburgh. Henry can send the message to France. The man had been unable to make it to the wedding, and McEwen was eager to hear from him. Blue Bonnet closed his eyes. What will I tell my servants? How will I explain my absence in the house? If you dunna have a reason to go to Edinburgh, create one. You need only to form an excuse that will span enough time to make the trip to Edinburgh and return immediately with word from Henry. Why can ye no go? I will na leave my people while redcoats sleep across the loch, no with Rory and Hayden. Could you no take Rory with you? Put him on a ship to France, he'll be safest there, and he could carry your word directly. That was an option McEwen had not yet considered. If Marion and Cormac married, the line of inheritance would be secured, and McEwen wouldn't need to fear leaving his people without a leader that he approved of. It was a surprisingly attractive idea. McEwen hadn't left Moreg in well over a year, feeling the need to remain and protect his people. With the growing feud between the clans and the rising reports of English officers invading homes and suppressing Jacobite unrest, McEwen's hands had been tied. How could he leave when his people were in constant danger? But now he had Cormac. Blue Bonnet must have noticed his idea taking root. He stepped forward and affected a persuasive tone. You could even go as far as taking Rory to France yourself, meet with the Bonnie Prince directly and help from their side of the channel. Perhaps they could benefit from your wisdom and the knowledge ye possess of the state of affairs here. That was exactly the sort of information McEwen had passed on to his contacts in France over the recent years. If he could speak to them directly, maybe he could help them understand the importance of bringing more help from France. The Jacobite rosters delivered to him weeks ago had been littered with markings of deceased. They were proof enough that they simply did not have enough men anymore. Their numbers were too diminished. I will consider it, and we can meet again in a fortnight, McEwen said. But until then, I need to hear of any new developments. Captain Hunt canna intend to remain at Dulnane for long, aye? Blue Bonnet scoffed. He has made himself comfortable for now. I will be surprised if he leaves soon. McEwen swore. Bloody Englishmen, will they never leave us in peace? Aye, they will, when the rightful king is restored and the union nullified. Scotland will govern herself. That day canna come soon enough. McEwen's chest burned with duty and eagerness to fight. Aye, lad, it will be here soon. Our time to fight is now. This has been Through the Fairy Tree, a clean Scottish romance, Myths of Moreg, Trilogy Book 2, written by Casey Stockton, narrated by Diane Brooks, copyright 2022 by Casey Stockton, production copyright by Casey Stockton. Hi, it's Casey Stockton. Thanks for listening to my audiobook. If you enjoyed the story, then please like or comment on the video. And if you'd like to know when more audiobooks are coming, then go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Thanks guys, and happy reading!